Good afternoon, evening, depending on where you are in North America. Welcome to the 7-Eleven Canadian Collegiate Rocket League Championships. I'm Max. With me is the Danger Taco, Danger Taco, Taco, whatever you want to call him. And you are watching the 7-Eleven Collegiate Rocket League Championships featuring eight of the top universities across the country. The schools today, Taco competing for $4,500 in prize pool and the opportunity to be crowned King of the North. We're almost ready to get our first match underway. UBC Gold versus Ryerson. Give us a little preview if you can. A quick one. I mean, UBC is a team with multiple teams, actually. It's one of those programs that has a lot of depth in their collegiate program, something that is enviable because some teams are just begging for that one team to be able to compete with. But Ryerson has been around for a bit. They've shuffled rosters. I've seen them in other charity events and other Canadian competitions. And I think they are always a competitive team. Good friend Seb is a graduate of them in the production world, and I'm sure they're in chat being manic and borderline unhinged towards the Ryerson Rams. And that's exactly the passion that they're going to need because UBC, with all that depth, brings a lot of talent. And, you, I mean, we've seen UBC sort of spread their talent around. In my opinion, no offense to Harry Lakers, this is their best three we're seeing on the field today with Frodo Ski and Fervent, uh, a, 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 three, uh, a team that I have played with and against a number of times. They're all horrifying. And, hey, we're underway. Game one in our first series. This is the best of five in the first round. I'm going to see him be kind of that defensive back line. They're looking past the Rusty to get back. Pushing way up. Rusty hits up half. one nothing already for Ryerson. And that's a good advantage played right there from Krusty. Just playing a patient, understand they don't need to rush anything. They just need to make sure that they are in a good position to then capitalize. And honestly, it didn't make it easy of themselves. And then a double tap, but that finish was sublime. A nice 1-0 after just about 23. It looked it looked open for a second there for UBC Gold. Uh, Ski just a little bit slow on the uh, on the shot attempt, allowing Krusty to get back. That was kind of a one-man offense. Shout out to Folly in the, uh, the full Fortnite car. You'd love to see it. Tulane. 50 in the corner, but Irvin is there. See what see what UBC has. I haven't seen these three play together in a competitive environment for quite some time. Normally it's uh, normally Ski, Frodo, and Harry Lakers as Ski puts that on net and ties it up. Under a minute in, two goals. Teams kind of feel each other out. I really do like that challenge from Ski. But again, it's a difficult a job. Even though you just have to put it in on the open net, you have to drive across it from the middle into the outside and be able to convert. But Ski, they're all warmed up. They played in a CCA Open, having actually taken that one previously. So they're really putting in the work, and they're already warmed up, and it shows. These guys, UBC Gold, not the speediest team, but they are all intelligent players. Fervent's kind of the, uh, kind of the monkey brain of the three of them. I'm sure he would not mind me saying this. Is Julian looking for something? Had an opportunity. Fervent missing off the backboard. Roto has to get up quick for it. Not a lot of, not a lot of neutral field play in this one. We're going back and forth here early for a pass for Frodo. I have to give up on this. You know, a little uh, little small ball in the corner here. Now we start to settle in. Usually you see teams uh, feel each other out, Taco, and it's a lot of defense. We've been just scoring early here, and now it's starting to settle in. Yeah, and, and that's the thing that you want to be able to see is both teams, of course, getting comfortable with the play style that they want to operate under, and half the time when you're trying to play, you're trying to bend the other team to your will, but it also helps them. There's a double commit in the midfield. Folly will read that pass, maybe to Telegraph, so I'm going to go right back out to the corner, but this is the point where the game starts to become more like a chess match rather than just chasing the ball around playing off pure speed because you're gonna have to outsmart your opponent if they're starting to play better defense we put this we put this series on stream first because we suspect that it would be a competitive one and it is uh you know two two minutes and 20 seconds in looking like it is going to be that way as frodo will bang it off the backboard a little 2016 rocket league meta there he does like to pepper the backboard just ask questions see if you've got the answer Oh, unfortunate. That was a great pass from him. Landed on Irvin. Not a, not, a ton of, not a ton of passing going on. Not a, not a ton of successful passing going on. A lot of, the bim-bam seems to be with working. And, of course, that's going to have to 
go to the wayside at a certain point is that you're able to ask questions, as you mentioned, by putting it onto the backboard. But ultimately, both these teams are organized enough and they're spaced out well enough that really nothing is dangerous enough. It's really just come on breakaways and misses. Krusty, last second save. Julian and Folly going to combine for a partial clear. And another team bump inadvertent as oh, it might it. be from UBC will open the gate. It's Krusty for number two and the lead. Krusty with five shots and two goals already, and that save was the was the true MVP of this play. Dodging a demo or a bump, able to get up and over that UBC car and make the save into a goal. Just Herculean effort here from Krusty in game one. Stuff like that is really important to see, but also it comes at the back end of a mistake. It's a couple players bumping each other, last player diving in on a play instead of opting for shadow defense, which is, I would say, a suspect decision, but I guess if you trust your instinct, sometimes it lets you down, and sometimes it will lead you to success. And right now, it seems like Ryerson, they're just trusting their instinct when it comes to rushing through these challenges. They're finding a decent amount of success, but certainly a lot to play for still with 80 seconds still remaining and only being a one goal game. UBC's got to got to mitigate those those kind of opportunities to punish because they've been giving them they've been giving them away, you know, just that little a little uh, a little too much from the third man, a little too far up. That's how both these goals have happened. That third man decision making that is the crux of competitive rock most times. What's that third man doing? Proto plays it up and over folly. Get around one, he'll have an opportunity to look for a pass, but he can't do it. UBC has their offense. Output cut out there. Playing possession game, just trying to keep the ball. Krusty cuts that off before the pass can even materialize. Krusty is reading this game so well to start this theory. Because you have a point man just to be able to move forward, get your 50s, get your goals through. That's really all you need. And you don't want to have a top heavy team. So we'll see if Krusty's going to be able to be a consistent thorn in the side of this UBC team throughout this game, because at least in game number one, they don't really have an answer, and honestly, they need to find something quick, because they only have three shots, and they have 10 seconds to do something about it. Fervin gonna get beat to that one, and that is not gonna help their chances at all, especially because Folly has a wide open red carpet lined path to the goal. You can't really do much about that if you're UBC. You, I mean, you probably don't want to double commit, but you gotta push up with, uh, with under 10 seconds to go, and you need a goal. You see so many goal, too many one goal leads late in Rocket League games turn into two goal leads. And you, you don't want to beat yourself up too badly about that. This game more or less done, and uh, the math is against them. This one will be over as soon as it hits. Fires to add their numbers here. That'll do it. Game one, Taco in the book, 3 1. Ryerson the dub, 1 0 on the series. And this is a best of five, so that means. That means every game is important, but game two becomes basically a must win here. Goal. It's a tough thing to adjust to, especially because when you look at the side of UBC, it's not necessarily them doing many things wrong. It's just that occasionally when they do have a slight mistake, it is fully capitalized on from the Ryerson Rams. They're just incredibly competent in that midfield, getting those quality 50s. And of course, when they have an open net, like a good team should, they're going to put it away. So game number one felt a little slippery down the slope. So I would like to see them put on the snow tires, really get to work on the side of UBC. Because like I said, they're warmed up, but it's not looking like it right now. Eight shots to three. That was a, I mean, I talked about the game being even halfway through. That was as well controlled of a game from uh, from Ryerson, I think as you could expect in a game one, where there's, where there's feeling out period. You hate to see it if you're UBC, a game that was a lot of crusty and not a lot and not a ton of his two teammates. There's room, there's headroom here for Ryerson to improve on that performance while UBC has to kind of catch up to that. Absolutely. And that's the thing that I said that crusty popped off. Can we see that again? I don't really know. I mean, that is a player that just one of three, but you have a hard carry, then why not keep feeding that player? So <laughs> look to see if Krusty's going to be able to be set up again and again by their teammates. Looks like William's trying to solo play this, but it will be stopped short. Fervent uh, follow through, not going to find it past the defense. And despite them trying to slow it down, try something new, UBC will be turned away. I fully believe in the hot hand theory in Rocket League. I'm feed if I'm if I'm Ryerson, I'm feeding Krusty until it stops working, basically. Krusty calls you off, just let him take it until, again, until it stops working. Big demo from Folly. is able to get back up and off the backboard for that one in time. That could be a, 
That can be a deter an equaling factor. If UBC can start bringing in some demos, and I know, I know they like you. Nothing makes Fervent giggle more than just killing you over and over again. It's Folly up. Decides for the double touch. No air dribble. Put it down. Julian can't find the shot. Gets beat to the shot by the shot opportunity by the defender, but a big whip from Ski. They're going to pass it around Frodo. That is money right there from Folly to Julian. And there you go, Taco. The two other players getting involved here. one nothing for Ryerson. It is money, and they're going to certainly cash that through. I uh, love this from Folly, recognizing that even though they're bumped, they can still stay competitive in the play, and it really just threw UBC for a loop. They did not anticipate that. You can see the pre-jump, the shot, and then watch just feeling like, like almost dropping the controller, hands in the head, <laughs> and just be able to say, man, we're really just going to watch that one dance right through us. But that's what happens when you have those connections and that communication. Ryerson going to continue to roll, and they got a lead again in game two. Frodo had to jump for that. He had no choice. If he didn't jump, the shot was 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 a pretty easy one for Folly. If he did jump, the pass is there. You force the defender to make the decision before you do. When you have the ball, you are in great shape. And there's a little lesson to any uh, any Rocket League player looking to rank up. If if there's a goalie, just pass it. If there's a goalie and a passing opportunity, just pass it. Make that goalie make the right decision. He has to get an awkward 50-50. Julian's just going to shoot it. Roto is there. UBC defense, they need to shore it up. Less less 2v1, better. Roto challenged. Double commit on the goal line. Won't kill you. Won't kill you if you get that third man back in rotation. Look at the way Ryerson's passing out of defense. They are just extremely organized early in this. Did they also play in that tournament earlier today? I don't believe Ryerson was playing in it, from what I could see. That was a top eight from a day one competition, which they might have played in that one, but at least for this one, BC was just playing, and they were able to take that in the grand final against Long Beach, California team. But unfortunately, this is the Canadian side, and apparently the Great White North has <laughs> some great defense from the Ryerson because they are really holding down the fort, not allowing much of anything. Despite the shots being even, it's still very oh. much so one-way traffic. and. Although Fervent will try, it looks like Krusty has yet another response to it. It's staying in the half, but not much else. Folly getting that out to the sideline again, and it's probably the most extended pressure they've had in a while. But of course, right as I say that, that massive deflection is going to take it back into the orange side. You, some, you want to pass it out of defense a lot, but sometimes one touch is all you need, and that'll do it. Julian puts it in. Just that big clear, and UBC back-footed, low boost, and a demo. These things pile up. They generally will mean a goal eventually. And it's a nice follow there as we're seeing Julian actually dive all the way through that and then be able to just get the touch because it doesn't have to be pretty. You know it's an open goal. And so being positionally aware enough to be able to immediately get on that rebound is crucial for so many teams because you don't need to style on your opponents. You just need to outspeed them with the ball. We're going to do a Ryerson listen in as Skis puts it in 2-1. It's like just so incredible to actually be able to listen in and see that see those comms go. But uh, as we really get into uh, I got one on, segment, one on, one on. Like, what's up? Fifteen, if I can't, no, 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 I got, I got. What's up? Watch I'm pass. Still back. You can make it back. He's on though. Miss. Nice. I'm zero forcing. I'm behind you, Polly. Okay, I took the hundred. I took the hundred. Watch the pass. Watch the pass. Got pass. Two I'm committed. I'm zero. One up. One up. One up. That's I'm it. Play back. You. That's awkward. I can't read that. Hold uh -huh. on. Don't worry about it. Leave it. I, I got. See. Fifty. Oh. It's fast. Get a touch. Get a touch. Get a touch. I, I'm just. It's awkward. Just chaos. Yeah. Pinching. Yeah. How often does that happen? You go to a listen into a team and they give up a goal. It's. I don't even know if they're aware of it. It just seems it's like the it's like the caster's curse on steroids. Yeah, it, it can be tough, and of course you don't want to. Uh, I, I mean, in a way, we weren't talking, so I feel like we can't be blamed too much. But unfortunately, defense can take a little bit of blame on this one. Willie had just gonna power through themselves and get the gentlest of flicks over ski. Sometimes that's all you need. Off the crossbar and down. This is the Julian game. Maybe they're just going to rotate. Who's going to carry each game? Julian now with five shots and three goals. That's the hat trick. All the, uh, well, that's, I mean, that's easy math. 100% goal participation for Julian in this one. Tough touch. Oh, Folly the double save before landing. 
defense for the Spryerson team. It was it's organized, but also there's some, the desperation saves are working out for them when they need to do it. Almost scored from the back the other way. Irvin will take it over one. He's got two to beat though. He's gonna have to look for a pass for fate. You see, just trying to figure something out here. See them go for bumps and demos. We've seen them go for passes. The good old fashioned backboard read from Ski makes it 3 3. And it's a lot better there to be able to keep it competitive. But what a touch by Frodo, completely bamboozling Julian. They had to dodge a demo, but then they're thinking, it's fine. I can have the rebound. They did not anticipate the pre flip into the pinch pass, that back post, but still need three players to beat that type of pass. And exactly what was provided 3 3. And Ryerson, for the first time, is looking fairly uncertain in the back on some of these approaches. I mean, we talked about UBC being already being warm to start. It did. It looked the opposite. UBC is now starting to warm up. It feels like we know better. Maybe they're just starting to feel this opponent out a little bit better, read them a little bit better. We, this game started, the series rather started with, you know, with Krusty just reading everything perfectly. Now UBC is starting to do the same thing. They're taking advantage of their opportunities, as we will see over time in game two. So it's really going to come down to the team can actually start to execute better. Uh, I even say, say we've seen mistakes, but there has been play that has been less than optimal. And so cleaning that up is going to be first priority. The last thing you want to do is lose because you just goofed. You want to be able to outplay that opponent. And passing plays like this are what you're looking for. Folly, good 50, though, and went back out to midfield. So Ryerson not going to be cracked that easily. Maybe on this one, though. Krusty was hesitant. Furbit was not onto the back post. Just not going to get it to go. Furbit's been key with these little back passes just to keep his team with possession. Still, all, They're going to have to retreat, all of them. Everybody on UBC looking to get boost there. Furbit off the ceiling, can't find it. Gets the shot off, but it gets met at the point of attack. Now Ski will put that in top right. 4-3 the final score. UBC ties the series up. That's a rough deflection. However, Frodo still does so well with extending these plays out. They got it off the corner the first time, and then this time they used the sky as a weapon right off the ceiling, and still a lot to do, and boy, did they do it well. Finished off a nice win for them, and it's not going to be such a gently caressed series into a defeat. They are going to fight and rage against Ryerson until every last breath. We're evolving through the Rocket League meta in this series. You know, we saw a lot of just backboard reads in game one. Now we're seeing plays where, you, where we've seen two plays for UBC there where, where Frodo's just banging it off the ceiling to get it down quicker. That's a relatively new development, the, the old ceiling pass. Soon we'll start, I'm, I, I, I believe, we'll start seeing some, some resets, some, uh, some ceiling double taps. My favorite new little meta, just banging up the ceiling to yourself. Frodo, though, you know, doing work in these corners. Both of those goals that Frodo created were just weird little pinches out of the corner that his team re read better because they had a slightly better angle, a little further removed from the ball. It's really tough to read when you're kind of sitting under the play. And I'm a huge fan of just being able to throw it back into the blender. Great offensive rotation is really good at making sure, obviously, you're getting your shots off. But once they get parried away, because inevitably not everything's going to go through, how do you reincorporate it back in the middle to make sure that boost starf stays up, the defense is frantic, and you're able to actually set up your next teammate? Sometimes using the side walls, using the ceiling, everything at your disposal is really the method. And so good job from UBC, but you got to replicate that at least two more times if you want to take the series. That is, that is ultimately, as metas evolve, one thing never changes. The key is rotation and keeping your team, all three of you, as relevant as possible all the time, on both ends. That will probably never change. That is the core of Rocket League, as Folly beats that ball to the backboard. Ski was looking for, I don't think he could decide between a shot or a pass there. UBC starting to, was starting to find that, that rotational flow. Krusty wants to demo. He'll miss on both chances. Challenge there from Folly. It's up. Frodo's there. Rusty's doing a good job. Just stealing boost. Even if you have the ball on your defensive end, if you're Ryerson, you still kind of are in control of this game. The way, that, the, the way they were able to steal the back boosts there from UBC Gold. Frodo trying to make them back off. Julian stays in, looking for a pass. Gets a double commit. That means that shot is... Nearly elementary. What a save by Ski coming down off the backboard. This team in this one, tied in this one, is the first game we've seen the first minute go by with no offense, but 
I spoke too soon. Big whiff from Frodo means a goal from Folly. I'm trying to dissect what happened here. Ski doesn't have the read. Fervent looks like they have a clear, but it's almost like they see a player from the Ryers inside already ready. Krusty was lurking in the midfield. They didn't want to just clear it to them. And then they decided to wait. And then they realized they can't wait. They don't have the boost to get it. So it just it was a lofted ball. And it's kind of like going down on strikes, just looking. That's a tough way to give up <laughs> a goal, specifically because they were playing just so well coming into this match. That's a, I love that metaphor. Going down on strikes looking. You never want to do it. Apologies, by the way, to Frodo. It was fervent with the big miss. I don't want to put you on blast for no reason, Frodo. Folly with the midfield challenge. Julian is up immediately. It's the speed starting to pick up in this one. It's another thing you'll see happen as series wear on. They feel more comfortable against one another. The general pace will pick up. Folly looking for a flick challenge by Fervent early. Frodo is able to get up that before the shot can even happen. That is, uh, that's my favorite kind of rocket. Be there before the shot exists. It's certainly something that you want to aspire to because <laughs> nothing's more frustrating than getting a perfect passing play or trying to set up that hook shot and then the defense is somehow already there. It's like the read in your mind and yep. there's some mind reading required there. I'm sure for Ryerson, that ball pinballed around the post and will rattle off of it. Now back into the corner we go. Ryerson keeping it high, but necessarily dangerous. Looks like UBC has a, a good read on the situation. They need something Banger. on that long clear. Fervin is playing <laughs> almost prevent defense at that point, but shows that sometimes that is exactly what's required. Play that rumble defense. Just 20 feet further back than you think you need to be because you never know what power up is happening. That's what those back wall half volley clears produce. Oh, that's a lovely touch, but Frodo was right there. Demoed for his troubles. Volley's just going to center it. UBC doesn't have an answer on the backboard. Julian, a little low on boost to capitalize. Game of creating chances and actually executing on them. Create all you want. If you don't have the boost to execute, it doesn't matter. Pop center. Krusty's there. Frodo is there as well, but both UBC players miss. That allows Julian and Ryerson to come right back into it. Game's starting to feel like game one. Ryerson sort of reading everything before it happens. Julian get up and over Frodo, but he doesn't have much left in the tank after that. Now we get this midfield play. That was the one thing the series was, was lacking, was the back and forth midfield play. Irvin could have put that on goal. Ski was looking for a bump. A little bit of lack of communication there. Irvin gets a bump, can't find the shot. Polly, a little backflip into that touch after the bump. Pass out. Irvin's there, but he's going to put that... High, wasn't able to find the shooting angle. This team's just trading control, but we're under a minute in. This game has just has just melted away on UBC Gold. They need to start to find some serious offense. They've had control, no real threatening chances. Talk. It's it's a weird one to witness, mainly because UBC has been trapped in their half, and then they finally break out, and it's like, all right, let's see what you had to do with it. And they just kind of slap it off the sidewall, then exit, and it's like, well, that <laughs> took a lot of buildup, and we didn't actually see anything <laughs> have a payoff. So I want them to be able to play more patient, play for some 50s, or get back to those interesting passing plays. I suppose they're going to work for some 50s instead. All three players in the same corner, and actually they're going to have to rotate out. They need to give themselves a bit more space, but maybe not too much patience, because attack or the next is really all they have remaining 10 seconds still need one could that be it julian just getting in the way ski on the follow frodo is following it again but it's just gonna roll high maybe one more pass that is not gonna do it it looks like julian has that clear out and a deep deflection to crusty will just be left to the corner bounces down into the turf and that will be another win for ryerson but close one one goal margin yet again as Ryerson goes up 2-1, I think I may have diagnosed the uh, the offensive problem in that game, at least, for UBC. Those first touches as they were trying to set up in the offensive zone were just a little bit too heavy. You know, you're, you're go you, you either want to put a shot on net or you want to keep control of the ball. And we saw a lot of just a little bit too heavy. You want to be the next one to the ball after you touch it, ideally. And back to back to back, all three UBC players getting touches there in the offensive third of Ryerson giving the ball back to Ryerson. You know, they were able to get it back from Ryerson, but that first touch was just a little too strong towards the end of that game. Let's see if they can clean that up here as we head into game four. 
Yeah, especially especially because Ryerson, I mean, they're packing their goal. They have a player on the backboard, they have two players in net, and they kept trying on the side of UBC to throw it into the corners, roll it around, to try to play these slower plays, but you need to force the defense out and keep them guessing, bait them into a challenge, and then put it over the top. And until UBC starts doing that, I don't think Ryerson has much of a reason to change their strategy because it's not broken, so there's no need to fix anything. Frodo trying to break out on the counterattack, and he catches Folly on low boost to make it one nothing here early. This series of early goals continues. Game three was a uh, was the exception that proves the rule. Folly just with 12 boost really didn't have much to say about that one. Yeah, and they don't have much to say about that one. However, UBC has a lot to say. We have a listen in for them to see how the comms are faring. One more. Nice. Ooh, oh, God, that's so laggy. <laughs> yeah. Holy oh, crap. Scared me. Yeah, I like backed off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just in case. It was good that you backed off. Just in case yeah. it did go out. I'm already up. Yeah. One in our Yeah. Basically. Yeah, I'm yeah. Three. Going back with the boost. In the first. Good one. Nice. Gonna hit hard, probably. I can. Yeah. Yeah. That might be the most reserved, relaxed version of Fervent I have ever heard. And it's probably because I don't play, like, serious competitively with him. Uh, a high energy guy usually. That was just a nice, nice. There, uh, that's NRG comms right there. Just a lot of nices. <laughs> and and they, they don't need to say much as long as they're taking care of business. But they need to make sure they score soon, as they are always going to be fighting off Ryerson here. They get number one and to make sure they keep them at bay because this is what Ryerson does with space and an ability to break out. I was just going to talk about how UBC became the first team ever to score during a live look-in, I'm pretty sure. I've only ever seen teams give up goals when that happens, but Folly, Folly with the one-man show on the other end. Counter-attack game, game four, the counter-attack game. There's a big demo, can Fervent find the shot he does? It's 3-1. UBC looking to send us to a winner-take-all here in game five. They can finish it off in game four. Plenty of time left. Prescience from Fervent on that. I have no idea how you read that. Frodo comes in with a fairly powerful shot. It gets deflected straight onto the post, and then Fervent just happens to be perfectly situated. They didn't have to side roll. That was just a straight front forward flip to be able to put that into the net. And honestly, if you're the goalie, what are you supposed to do about that one? That had no idea that was going to land right at the front bumper of your opponent. So now with a 3 1. Looks like we're in a store for a perspective game five, but. Doesn't mean that there's not more than enough time for a comeback, especially how the Ryerson seems to be being matched in speed as Fervent will knock that one over and under. Now trying to go for bumps, but Rotor not able to do anything with it in the corner. Comeback wise, three goal a three goal lead seems to generally be the the statistical point of no return in Rocket League. So as long as it's just a two goal lead, it's all there's always a chance. I mean there's always a chance, period. But you don't love your chances down to three. It's Ryerson. Still looking to test that backboard. UBC seems to have found an answer to that more often than not. Folly, tough, tough touch into the corner. A little heavier than he would have wanted. Rusty. Have to follow that ball all the way back down to the ground. Get a little bim bam here. Just going back and forth. Not a lot of control from either team. He looking to change that. Challenge early. Proto can't find it on the pass. For a screamer that's that that's that spot you want to be as a shooter just the ball coming at you at a million miles an hour just, all you got to do is deflect it but julian oh he missed the open net that i think you're expecting a defender there at some point julian it never developed for him just flicked it the athena flick off the corner yeah that is incredibly unfortunate and it, sometimes that's it's psychologically the hardest shot to hit when you know that there's no one obstructing you all you got to do is just wrap around it put it between the sticks and sometimes that can be a taller obstacle than many expect it to be to clear so i would say i'm going to give the benefit of the doubt to Julia. that was probably just overthinking it but you know 
have uh, too much time to make up for that one. 90 seconds, two goals, and that would have made it at least a bit closer within striking distance, and Bali's not going to help that out. Another change of possession. UBC's defense being a lot sturdier as the series goes on. Julian looking for the center. That's why That's why I always say Rocket League is the closest video game we have to a real sport. The, the, the more you think, the less you muscle memory and the less good you play, basically. You ask any basketball player, the word, the hardest shots, the wide open shot, get in your own head. You got a defender on you. It's all muscle memory. You don't have to think. That's always the goal in, in traditional sports. Is think the least and just do. It's always true in Rocket League as well. The more you're thinking, probably the worse you're playing. We talk about big brain players, but it's really more game sense than it is thought process. It just becomes inherent to certain players. Julian doesn't have enough boost to really do anything here but pop it center. Frodo knows that and is up quickly as we enter the final half minute of play here. Big challenge from Presti. They need to score on this attack to really have any chance. Frodo's just going to play the ball control game. Loses it though. Runs out of boost. Loses it to Folly. Folly was probably thinking about a dish there but Fervent able to take the ball back for UBC briefly. Still a little heavy on the first touches. UBC, you'd like to see them clean that up as we head into game five as this clock is against Ryerson. That will hit the ground on zero, and that will do it for game four. We got a winner take all game five, Taco, in our first match of the day. You love it. Of, co of course, we do like to see it. it really, this is, uh, L uh, I would say, par for the course, at least in my experience. I feel like I can never get an easy day when it comes to these. <laughs> Players always got to stretch it out. They always got to make it interesting. But, you know, that's what we're here for. We're here to see good Rocket League, the best that Canada has to offer. And apparently that's what we're going to be getting because, as you said, it was very shaky in the beginning. I was not confident in UBC's chances. It looked unstable. It looked, more importantly, unsure. They didn't know how they wanted to approach it. But now they're starting to find their footing and their pacing uh, pacing that I think Ryerson is really struggling to figure out and un learn how to adapt on their own half. And it, I mean, in that game specifically, Fervin really stepped up. I thought Fervin looked a little bit shaky to start this series, which is strange to me because I, I, I just happen to know he's been really grinding Rocket League of late. You know, the, you play a game for, for five, six years, it ebbs and flows how much you want to play it, but Fervin's really been grinding in, the re in recent days as he assists a goal from Frodo there. The 50-50 from both of them. That was a 50 right into the net. But never mind, Fervin 50 ski there. Just just big car from Frodo. Just a big chunky car to get that into, into the goal. Yeah, it's an unfortunate one. Folly was there for the save, and I think they were trying to get that to the corner. They could only tap it forward. You know, a Krusty coming from the near post is thinking they can chase pretty much anything except for the ball that's directly at them. They just had to watch as uh, Fervin came through, or Frodo rather, came through and dunked that play away. So. Not something you want to start your game with, particularly with a ball sitting in front of your net, but you have oh. some time to adjust. Not much, because it seems like UBC is back for more already. Frodo going to put it into the side. They just love that one post. <laughs> the left post. UBC versus the left post. And a tale as old as time. As this is some serious control of the run of play here for UBC to start this game. A killer instinct coming out as they can clearly smell blood here in game five. Sending two at these offensive challenges, just trusting Fervent as the third player. Wall dash is not working out. I did not know he had that in his bag. Of these three UBC players, I would say frodo has got the deepest bag, but Fervent's showing us a little something. Mechanically, Julian can't quite get a clear at the touch, but only as far as ski, and that's a, the dueling whiffs, the cascade of whiffs, as Fervent can put that on net. And it's only a matter of time when you get a couple whiffs on your own backboard like that, as Ryerson did, before the goal finds, before the, before the opponent finds the goal. That is the bleach and detergent on the floor clean right there from the side of UBC. I love the backboard play, and you still need an immediate challenge. Before the defender can really even react, there was an aerial made by that third defender, and they tucked it home with a frozen rope right down into the open net. So this is the start you want to see from UBC and Ryerson. I have to think, you'd have to be kind of shell-shocked. It felt like a series in which they were cruising, they were able to control everything, but now, when we're applauding how well their offense is playing, they barely they've been able to escape their half. If not for that save from Krusty, we might have been looking at 3-0 right now. UBC will not leave them alone. Six shots to nothing here, two minutes into this one. At this point, Ryerson just needs to get something going. 
Get a little moral victory. They're going to give it away again. Ski is right there. How quickly Fervent is up. He's, he's going to back off wisely. Let Frodo take control. Fervent up off the backboard. Can't find. Can't go back up to get it. But it'll, it's hoping for that, that little joint where the backboard meets the wall or the ceiling. Didn't find it. That joint right there. Rusty with the challenge. Who will be the player or players to step up here for Ryerson? Somebody's got to do it. Or, or this is not looking well for them. In a series that it felt like they had all the control you mentioned, Taco, UBC has really grabbed it back here, latter half. Well, and I guess it's somewhat emblematic of how they like to play within that uh, CCA Open that I was just referring to earlier that UBC came out of. They actually had to bracket reset their team in the Grand Finals, so apparently they're fine with a late start because they know they can execute down the stretch, a demo into a pass, and Folly was required to be the savior there. Job not done yet. Frodo has to reach for this. They're keeping it interesting. Krusty, even with a 50, it's still going on to their back wall. These challengers from UBC, what did they eat for lunch? Wheaties. <laughs> Wheaties and taquitos from 7-Eleven. That's what they've been eating. That's, I've got that on good authority. You'll never be able to prove me wrong. Frodo looking for the tight angle. Can't find it. And these 50s, all three of these dudes, I, I mean, I didn't say anything early, but all, all three of these dudes, I can tell you from experience playing against them, are absolute monsters in the 50-50 game. And and that has been what's his, what, what's carrying this game five for them. They're just winning challenge after challenge. You don't need fancy mechanics or crazy passing plays if you just win every challenge you go in for. Even their misses are working. Fervent does not get any <laughs> contact on this, and it's gonna perfectly back pass to Frodo, who just spawned dead. I mean, that one, it seems coincidental, but to be honest at this point, how much they're gelled on these 50s, all these challenges, oh. I wouldn't put it past them to calculate that through Ski off of the post and get to put home their teammate shot 3-0, and guys, I just don't see a way back if you're Ryerson. A minute left, yeah, I mean, feasible. Not, you wouldn't expect it. The math is, it's its possible. It's probably not going to happen. The way UBC is playing, though, with a clean 10 shots to two, they have absolutely dominated the first four minutes of this game five. And it does not look like it's changing. They are feeling themselves. You can tell the way they're dipping around the field, just diving in for challenges. They're confidently taking them. Confidently going in for these passes. Krusty actually went to the side and it was open for a pass, but then decided to peel out right as the pass came through. It's opportunities like that that are not going to come around all the time, whereas in games, let's say one through three mostly, it was Ryerson being a, a lot more, let's say, forward thinking and assertive on these touches, chasing down passes, making this UBC team adjust to them. But ever since then, it's almost like they don't want to get burnt, so they just don't even take a chance. You got to put yourself out there, make sure. You're open to a little bit of hurt, but kind of like that. The half rotation and attack, and it will get him at least one back, but you're gonna need nothing short of a miracle to end some help on kickoffs to come back here. Do we see a Spanish? Do we see a fake kick, uh, you know, like a fake kickoff type set play? These are the only set plays in Rocket League. We'll see what Ryerson's got. They need a goal basically immediately off the kickoff. There's a fake and a demo. This is the Spanish kickoff that I referred to, but can they convert? It's a lot easier to convert on them in twos than it is threes. You see. Clear that, not uh, kind of, halfway clear it, but all they got to do is kind of play the clock here. Just keep getting touches. This one essentially over. UBC storming back to win this, the first series in our 7-Eleven Canadian Collegiate Rocket League Championships. Taco in the book. It's UBC 3-2 to two over Ryerson. And re really really well done by them. I don't want to undersell just how impressive that was, particularly because I was not impressed. I was very worried. I'm thinking Ryerson, they just came in better prepared. This does not look ugly, and I'm kind of mentally preparing myself, you know, in those series where you're commentating them through, and you're thinking, this is already kind of done. I, I just am not impressed by what I'm seeing. But then, out of nowhere, they're able to then pull together and say, hey guys, maybe we should turn on the monitors. Maybe we should charge the controllers, and then go from there, because ever since then, it felt like Ryerson was on the back foot, and they must have been wondering, wait, who's been playing this whole time then? Yeah, maybe they turned their monitors on. Maybe they... This is a fun replay. We got bots on a, a Tokyo a Tokyo underpass. I feel like this was uh, not the right replay, as Raja puts that in. You know, it, it did really feel like, you know, maybe give, your, maybe give your older brother the controller type of moment. Midway through that series, they just cranked it up, BC Gold did, and got the dub. It was those 50s, Taco, like, it, it, it's really simple to say, you know, you win 50s, you win the game, but 
it not only helps you create offense, but it's absolutely backbreaking if it's happening against you. If you just can't win a 50, it's demoralizing. It is, and it's especially frustrating because half of the play when you think of a competitive game is you're going back and forth, you're hitting the ball left and right and exchanging possession, but it can be especially frustrating when you finally get it clear and the moment you're about to hit it, someone just flies in from your blind side, hits it to the side, steals your boost, and then gets out, and you're thinking, back to square one, rotate back through, and then you're just stuck there for what seems like a minute and a half, two minutes, three minutes, and you're just wondering, how do you get out of it? The answer is you really don't until you start winning those 50s, and as you mentioned, if that's just not happening, then... You're going to be spending a lot of time kind of setting up the bus in front of the net. And specifically Frodo and Ski, I've, like, I've known that as their strong suit for ye of like well over two years at this point. I, I used to joke, you know, back when we would have uh, weekly gaming stadium tournaments that I was playing in, that Frodo is our fireburn. It's just, it just feels impossible to win a 50 against the guy. Um, I have a lot less experience playing against Ski. I've played a couple of tournaments with him. Uh, on my team, which is lovely because you don't have to worry about this, uh, you know, 50-50 zooming into your net. You can sort of start to cheat up. It just cascades from there. We didn't see anything crazy beyond those kind of corner pinch passes from Frodo. It was just solid rotational Rocket League winning your 50s, staying relevant. And, and, and saying relevant is a great way to put it because that is the way you have to really frame it when you're thinking through, okay, how am I actually going to be able to impact play? Well, if you're rotating all the way back, that's actually a chronic issue. I feel like with a lot of collegiate teams as they're learning to play with each other is that you want to make sure you get that boost. But sometimes just grabbing a couple pads and then turning back in, getting annoying touch, getting a few more pads, all of that is just going to burn the other team. And it allows your team be able to spread out eventually you will need to go for those hundreds and when you do you want to make sure you're not just abandoning the play leaving one player alone so i think that was definitely a strength of ubc being able to continue those attacks and so we saw a couple times that even though ryerson's playing fantastic defense no defense can last forever on limited abuse they're gonna get broken through it. i think it's that perseverance that is ultimately going to give you a lot of dividends yeah i mean we mentioned a bunch of uh, you know the first three games how organized the ryerson defense was but they were giving up after that game one where they where they kind of i think they outshot them 11 to 3 or something like that they were giving up shots that is just not sustainable rocket league in the long term you want you want to attack the ball before the shot happens essentially that's the platonic ideal of rocket league defense is no shots allowed you don't want to be making saves and uh that just kind of fell away they were they remained relatively organized throughout that series on defense but you, you only get so many so, so many kicks of the can before it's just a goal against and I, we're gonna get ready for here for our second series winners semi a st Clair saints who have yet to lose a game on the gaming stadium stream across i think this is their fifth tournament that i've done with them haven't seen them lose they're up against ubc okanagan quad burger and the boys i believe it is um before we get onto that, before we preview that, we gotta wait for the lobby to go up and stuff. I feel like was it your stream? Were you streaming Danger Taco and ranting about how annoying it is to play against UBC? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yeah. it was. But I, uh, UBC, <laughs> I gotta say, they are one of the most annoying teams, only because one, they take really good fifties, but sometimes they just won't leave you alone. You're thinking, okay, they're on defense now, and then someone will just kind of slam by you and just gotta bump you to the sideline and then w walk away, and then you're thinking, okay. Oh, haha, ha, ha. nice little bump. And then you <laughs> recover, and then some other guy just comes up just to bump you. Not like They're not challenging you. They're just going for bumps, just playing annoying. And it works, which is the most annoying, because it's one thing to play like that and just say, okay, well, we're still playing fine. No, it actually works. So, yes, a very annoying team to play against. It was, I it, respect them for it. It was a clip. What does Rance might portray? <laughs> it, was a, it was a clip that Fervent sent around on the UBC, uh, on the UBC gaming, uh, gaming yes, Discord. Yes, I, I remember that exact <laughs> moment because I was getting very ticked off. I was having a good night and then I ran into them and I'm like, no, please, I beg of you. You're so annoying to play against. That was what was in my head when I, when I referred to Fervent as kind of being the monkey brain guy of the three of them. All three of them can do that, but Fervent will sometimes really turn that up to 11 on you. As we get ready for St. Clair Saints up against UBCO St. Clair, Taco, the uh, I think the um, the kind of the pole position for best Canadian collegiate rocket league team at the moment. Like I said, we haven't I have not seen them lose a game all year. I mean, this is a short year, but this goes back to uh, to midway through kind of 2021 when when I started commentating St. Clair games. It it just hasn't been close in these tournaments. And, and we were joking before the before the stream started. Will we see St. Clair finally drop a game? 
in the uh, in the 7-Eleven Canadian Canadian Collegiate Rocket League Championship. Did you see the lovely new barbecue bacon chicken sandwich? The crispy chicken sandwich from 7-Eleven. 100% Canadian chicken. Dose strips of bacon. Top with their signature barbecue sauce. Made fresh in-store daily. And you can get it delivered. You can get it delivered with the seven with the seven uh, the seven now app. You can get it delivered with the code seven now at tgs.gg slash seven now plus enter seven off eleven. Seven off eleven to score seven bucks off your order of eleven dollars or more. One time use only in Canada. Download the seven now app right now. There it is. There's the code. It's on your screen. You can't misspell it. You have to spell it right. Seven off eleven. I think we're gonna be getting some snacks here eventually. Maybe I get maybe maybe I get a uh, barbecue bacon crispy chicken sandwich. Maybe I don't know. That, that's I, the I, ideal I, way of living. That, that's, <laughs> that, that, the ideal day is to be able to commentate Rocket League and then immediately get delivered a bacon sandwich. I don't really know <laughs> if anything peaks past that. <laughs> that's the way I'd write it up. You might the, get to see me munch here on screen. That's I mean that's <laughs> honestly I will be incredibly frustrated if at one point. I'm not like, great shot. What is your thoughts on that? And I just hear just mumbling through chews. Like, please have some restraint, man. You have I'm ready. built in. <laughs> I'm ready with the napkins. <laughs> so, uh, okay, good, good, good. Because I got, a, I got a beard and barbecue sandwiches. Sandwiches with sa saucy sandwiches. They get, you know, they get kind of stuck up in here. As we get ready for this, uh, this UBCO St. Clair game, let's do a little previewing. Comp, J Spoods, they're in the lobby. They're raring to go. I assume they were through their first round matchup quickly. I'm not even going to check that. That's how confident I am in this team. For, for UBC Okanagan, you know, they 3-2 they three -two, three -two dub over Carlton. That's a big win for them. Quad Fisher and Krabs. Quad Burger, kind of the emotional leader of this squad. Will they have anything to, uh, to offer the St. Clair Saints? I think the biggest issue of teams running up against St. Clair is that St. Clair, they they have improved since last season. They had a very tough time within Collegiate Rocket League against the rest of the Eastern Conference, but I don't think there's any question that in Canada, they are the super team. They are the epitome of the Northwoods in the traditional North American United States-centric colleges. So St. Clair Saints, certainly the team to beat. And I think any team that has to stand up against them, UBC, O, or really any other squad in this tournament, they have to play a flawless five minutes because the most moment you have a gap in your armor, St. Clair is going to plunge a sword right through it. So you really need to be at the top of your game because they're always at the top of theirs. And they're, I mean, they have this in their bag, but they're not necessarily a team that's going to like hit a double, triple flip reset, kind of make you look silly with amazing mechanics. They can. But like any good, successful, competitive Rocket League team, they play solid. The way we were talking about UBC Gold at the end of that series, winning 50, being in the right spot, staying relevant, rotating out, grabbing boost, coming right back in, not letting the opponent breathe. That's always what you want to see out of a competitive team. Then you kind of sprinkle those mechanics on top of that, and it becomes a formula that, so far, nobody in Canada has been able to crack. And it is really tough because typically when you do play in these tournaments, you're thinking, well, I mean, the way that collegiate programs usually work is you probably have one maybe two like really good players. And then you need right. like a third to plug in. You need to make sure that they have a complete set because oftentimes you don't choose your teammates. It's just who's at your college. Hey, uh, let's play Rocket League together. And if you're lucky enough, scramble together a couple of high grand champions, maybe some supersonic legends. But St. Clair Saints, instead, they just built a team that they knew this is going to be the team. This is going to be a competitor at every event. And I think it's really paying off so that it's not about, hey, who's the third man? Who's the weak link? There is no weak link. There's always just three <laughs> players that are playing fantastically. Jay even getting uh, up into uh, signed territory with some professional teams challenging for RLCS. Yeah. Uh, they, they themselves have been incredibly impressive to me on that front. At least for me, if you had to choose a player to watch out for, for me, it's Jay. They're always just such an annoying player in your attacking third, causing you chaos. That's where you start to get into rarefied air in Collegiate Rocket League when you when you when you've got a player or two on your team that pro squads are looking at. This is where you start to get into kind of that Akron Zips territory, that Northwoods territory, or or, or even I think it's LSU with Ajax existing kind of pro level players, where you start to get. It almost feels like a it almost feels like an, an inevitability, as we do have UBCO in the lobby. They just got off come off a three two. 
St. Clair Saints coming off a of 3-0, so they were ready to go. UBC, UBCO maybe grabbing some water, taking a quick break, maybe having a coffee from 7-Eleven. As uh, we are underway, it's Fisher, Crabs, Quad Burger, Comp, Spoos, and Jay on the, uh, not that, different Spoos, before you even ask, uh, <laughs> chat. I, I've, I've been through with him before. He tried to trick me. It's not the real, it's not, you know, he's the real Spoos, not Spooda. As there's Spoos <laughs> off the sidewall. And just real quick, before we get too deep into this, upset watch on the other side of the bracket, Taco. University of Alberta, 3-2 over Waterloo. That was our, I mean, that, that was, besides St. Clair, the team we predicted to go deep into this tournament was Waterloo. They're going to have to play from the loser's bracket, the lower bracket. Sorry, let's put a cherry on top of that one. <laughs> this is worth 30 seconds in. St. Clair, they don't mind. They do not mind playing 0-0 zero, zero for a while just to kind of feel you out. What's your first chess move? They'll even, they don't even really mind giving up that first goal. I've seen them go down 2 nothing early in a game, early in the game, mostly against the St. Clair Saints. Uh, gold squad, they're kind of their their B team, so to speak, has been the team we've seen them play the closest uh, in, in these Canadian tournaments. It's, it's, it ends to be St. Clair versus St. Clair in the finals because, Taco, they fund an esports program. There. St. Clair is one of the rare schools, at least in Canada, that truly funds an esports program. Which attracts, not only that. Which attracts good talent. Yeah, not only that, but they're doing a good job of leaving uh, Keanu and Selectively, I know uh, some of the Sejep universities in Quebec are thinking about it, but ultimately, not a lot of uh, universities actually pull that trigger and then succeed with it. Because it's one thing to throw money at the problem, but you need to be able to recruit well. Like St. Clair is a great example of doing exactly that. And I think right now, I am uh, fairly impressed because, of course, we're talking about the exploits of St. Clair, but you see, they're very much in this first game. The shots are fairly even. In fact, they've tested St. Clair on their back end, at least amount, and so. We will continue on in this game one after two minutes of waiting. Let's see who's gonna strike first. Could it be Spoods? No, it's Cop on the half rotation, and Jay tried another half, but it's not going to go through, and Crabs in a bucket. Getting a nice dunk there all the way back. Down. <laughs> that's a that's his full name. Crabs for short. Went with the full the family name. Crabs in a bucket. Oh, what a touch. What a touch by Jay to make it one nothing here. 243 to go. Just just a little we call this a doink? I think Crabs could not respond right off the post and in. It's one of those exact things I was talking about. Jay is one of the best players. And just finding that seam. Hey, that ball is not going to be a perfect pass, but I'm going to make sure this is going to be really annoying to deal with. Spoods is not annoyed by that flick at all. They read that from the beginning. Fisher tries. They might off the kickoff. It would have been a nice way to galvanize some motivation. Just say, hey, don't worry. You got it off kickoff, but... Apparently, even those are not going to be easy goals against St. Clair. So how about something more intricate? Crab's not going to get it to go. A bunch of deflections. There's a sitter on net, and even then, Comp comes in play savior. This uh, this St. Clair team, you know, generally are in control of the run of play in their games, but when forced to to actually show it, they are incredibly well organized on defense. It almost takes, you know, a quick counterattack, like this nearly was from, from Crab, or just a straight-up god level mechanical play to score on them sometimes it feels like it's not possible to score on them when they're truly when they're truly going all out you know we've seen them get up four or five nothing in a game and give up a goal or two but we call that garbage time it, it, in serious in the serious run of play it almost feels impossible to score on this team sometimes that's something actually that was a preview in uh, really the first ever showing of the st Clair team was in the summer series of the past year in CCA, which is kind of the in-between off-season type of league that is run uh, between CRL seasons. And honestly, they came in, we're playing an incredibly defensive game. They're playing some of the best teams in all of the nation, or in all of the continent, really. And they were holding in there mainly just because their defense was that good. So I 100% yeah. believe on that, that that's always still a staple of their play. Um, the problem is for the other teams is, is not, they're not just parking the bus. They have the ability to break out and Cause you a lot of headaches. Jay trying to prove that right now with some flicks. It's going to be two, maybe even three, but pinch across. Only going to keep it competitive for comp, but nothing they can really sink their teeth into. Spooz just takes it right back though at the midfield. UBCO was is hanging in this game, but not with a ton of control as the double tap from Jay. We highlighted Jay before the game started, and he's making us look real smart, Taco. 
it, it's going to look like it's not going to be too much of a danger. I mean, it's a low tap. I mean, what can they really do with it? A lot, because he got a man mark that. Jay setting it up for themselves and following it through sublimely, getting that on up and above the defender and inside the post. And that is why Jay always kind of been my player to watch on this team. But, you know, comp. He's not going to be outdone. Off the kickoff, double tap, and now the scoreline, despite being close for about two minutes, is now wide as ever. I was just going to say how a two-goal lead because of the defense for St. Clair feels like a three-goal lead. Well, a three-goal lead feels impossible if you're playing against this squad. UBCO probably just looking for, you know, a moral victory here at this point. Get a goal, prove to yourselves that you can score on this team going into game two. So I think definitely a goal back is always a good thing. Just remind yourself, like, hey, we can do it. <laughs> just yeah. be able to then carry through that. And granted, I think it just name recognition alone is going to inspire a lot of fear from these teams. So maybe Krabs could do something about this. Tom says no. This little delayed flick, and that's going to go all the way down to Jay to extend. Jay looking for another one. Krabs is up quick. You really have to have that answer on the backboard against the squad. You let the, if you let the ball hit the backboard unmolested, they will score. And they will score in bunches. As when this ball touches, it will be one nothing for St. Clair. As advertised, Taco. Holding it down on defense. And it, it, it just individual plays. They, they haven't even had to show off their passing game, which is money when they need it to be. But like most Rocket League players, they are happy to just take an air dribble, look for their own double tap, until you kind of force them into something more complex on the team game side of things. They will do that until the cows come home. And UBCO needs to force them out of that. They need to force them into making more complex plays. Yeah, and, and that's the problem is that not only are St. Clair capable of that, but because they are so good at just playing incredibly quick, incredibly high pressure, and when needing to, you need to be able to either demo them out of the way or do something that they're not expecting. As you mentioned, an incredibly mechanical play to get through or just some flawless passing play that they cannot react to. And honestly, that's asking a lot of most teams, much less uh, really anyone going up against the pressure of facing off against St. Clair. And so game number two, now that we're ripping into this one, I think that's really the main storyline for me. If UBCO can actually find that source of inspiration, that ability to actually break down this defense, then I think we might have a series, but until then, it's going to be a St. Clair waiting game until they're able to break through. What a save by Spoods. Thought it was over him for a second, just plays it off his own backboard. The squad burger's got to try to read the corner touch. There's a there's an attempt there, at least, at a, at a relatively newish slash emerging meta in Rocket League, the corner double tap. The defense there, those are incredible. Real hard to read, real tough to defend as Tom just keeps it in. These half rotations on offense for uh, for St. Clair are are just are just back breaking. I think you've got a big clear and they're just there off the half ball to put it right back in on your back. Another double tap, Comp, that one saved away by Fisher. Crap, over one, but there's Comp right there, right place, right time. Demo on to Quadburger from Jay, the aerial demo. Fisher's got some control here, but I think two touches is going to be it. What a touch, though, on the follow from Crab. There's that unexpected play. I think everybody, myself included, was expecting a, a third touch from Fisher, but he just backed right off. Crab's the goal. And that's uh, sometimes, I would say it's a brilliant mechanical play, but I am curious to see how St. Clair's reacting to that. We do have a listen in to see what it's like in the comms. Yo, <laughs> Ben, score this. Right now. Right now, score it. Score it. You won't. You won't. Jay, mid, 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 mid. Wait, I'm peeking. It's over. I'm peeking. No, I gotta, I gotta leave it. Leave it. You're so cringe! You are so cringe! I was peeking! Peek! What? Bro, this guy is peeking. Oh my. I'm a passer. all good. Oh my god. Peek! Never again. Never, bro. <laughs> oh my goodness. This is, this. I was like, I cannot wait for our first St. Clair listening. I mean, in the, we, we went in with them down one nothing. My expectation was we'd go hear them, you know, up two, three, four, nothing, and just hear them joking around. They were losing this game. Remember how I said they felt confident down a goal or two? No better example. 
Yeah, I mean, it just it just shows that you're having fun, and there's a lot of merit to that because the rotations are still in lock. They're they're still able to get all the touches through, but uh, just being able to be friends with each other. I mean, that's also half uh, the battle sometimes of building esports programs. Sometimes you throw some players together and they don't get along, but clearly that is not a problem with the Saint Clair team. This is the the true Rocket League meta is the friends we made along the way. It's the have fun meta. We've like I I remember talking to Leafex about this on my on my uh, radio show like a year ago, and he was like, I, you know, I think it was coming off of uh, an NRG series where they made a, a, a reverse sweep, I think in a best of seven, as Quadburger makes it 2-1 here. And they just started having fun, and all of a sudden they started storming back. That's the true Rocket League meta. This team that's having fun seems to win more often than not. And it's really impressive to see, however, there is a time to get serious, I feel like, and maybe <laughs> yeah. it's right here because UBC is getting not only a first goal, but a second goal. And this one, just off of a dunk, just playing it cleanly through. Granted, St. Clair always has the capacity to answer back. Comp trying to prove that right here by going to the ceiling. Fisher trying to clear and end some with that pinch. Spoods actually put it off their own backboard. Jay needs to respond to this one. It is wide open in the midfield, but Comp is able to sneak it from the blind side and feels like they probably robbed Crabs of a shot. This UBC Okanagan squad. Shout out to Kelowna, BC, the uh, the Northern California of British Columbia. I always feel really at home when I go there, especially in the summer. Just it's just wine country. I just love being up there. Is Fisher looking to make it three one? But Spoods the save. Oh, Quadburger had a shot there. Just that one off the near post. Fisher, BC, trying to become the first team I think in Canada to take a game off of Saint Clair. Might be right, Taco. This might be time to get real serious. I don't know. We jump back into their comms if we hear so much cringe, so many shouts of cringe as they as they're passing to each other. Spoods, set it up for comp. Just at moving back. Crabs keeps it in. Quad thought, of, thought about the crazy redirect. Just opts for ball control. You can play the clock a little bit here with one minute to go. Do not want to get complacent. This. St. Clair team can just score on a dime. Quad has the answer on the back wall. That's a pass. Comp missing what was essentially an open net as both goaltenders had flown across. Gets a second shot at it, and the second time's the charm. It's 2-2. That's a good job being able to tuck that one in because this is not the cleanest pass, but Comp knows it's not really a matter of banging it past the defender. It's just putting it in a weird spot, and exactly what it is. Everybody is sitting down and trying to get into that from the near post, and all of them are going to miss. So, turns out St. Clair doesn't have to sweat too much, but we have to pay attention. UBC is not going to go down quietly. So, St. Clair trying to bust out all the tricks in up their sleeve and can actually get beat out and demoed away. Spoods actually needs to handle this one because they're getting interfered with. My goodness, UBC. I, I do like the trickery of this varied play. It is certainly throwing Let's say St. Clair throw a loop, if not entirely beating them through their defense. Quadburger can try to follow his clear, but he can't find the touch. He had the boost to do it. Comp kind of doing the same thing, looking to self-pass. It's Crabs. That's a little heavy. It's going to give Spood possession. We'll need to challenge. He gets the challenge, and Comp will just play this to the floor. They'll play for overtime instead of testing UBCO's offense. Going for a Spanish kickoff right off the bat as Quadberger dodges that demo. That still means ball control for St. Clair. Short live. Get it back to the top. Up quick demo onto Fisher. That means Krabs 2v1. Makes a nice play. Gets a bump and the touch on the ball to clear that away. Look at, look at St. Clair just dedicating for demos here early in this overtime. They don't want to spend six minutes here. They want to get out of here quick. Just going to send that one deep. Jay will chase it. And you can almost see the hesitation on UBCO. They're just waiting for some of these touches. I don't know if that's the strategy because at a certain point, no. you're playing reactive. Jay is trying to be proactive. Really pre jumping that read. Not going to go through. Bunch of deflections. And Fisher will take that over for Crabs. It's back in the corner and a roller straight down. That is not the power clear they were hoping for. You do not want to play reactive defense against, against St. Clair. It'll hold up for 30 seconds, maybe. As they do hold up for that for that rush, but here's Spoods on the pass. That shot is off target. That was going to be posting out. That will drop it down off the ceiling. Fisher is there. 
HPC holding up in this game too. Really kind of forcing the St. Clair to go into that bag we talked about as that shot's on for Jay. And that's the winner, 123 into OT. They do end it relatively quickly. St. Clair will go up 2-0 here. And that really does look like just a bit of over-trusting your teammate. Quadburger in the midfield, probably playing that clear out. It's a higher than they think. They flip on that, and then suddenly you find Fisher in a no-man's land. They're looking at the shot. They're looking at the goal. They realize that there is something that doesn't add up, and Jay's not going to miss from there. Puts on target, perfectly back post. And despite their best efforts, even getting to the point where they are out shooting their opponents, they're still not able to get it done, UBCO. They got one more shot, though. I mean, that's the backbone of St. Clair, is that is that incredible defense. It's organized, and it can be desperate, and they feel pretty comfortable doing either one. They don't mind. They really don't mind starting a game off down one nothing, 2-1 in the final minute. They're confident. These, these guys, they, they are a squad. They're a real, actual team. It's not a pickup team. They know where they... they we heard their comps. It's friendly. It's joking. It's not even really particularly tactical. Because it, it, I've always said this about them, it almost feels like they just have a sixth sense as to where the other two teammates are. And hearing their comms for the first time, I feel confirmed in that. That they just know. They play with each other enough. They just know where they are at all times. And it's the ideal team chemistry is when you don't have yeah. to have to overthink where each other are. You know each other's tendencies, and that gets to the point where you start to gel. And even if you don't even have your camera looking in the middle of the field, you know they're there for the pass because that's exactly where they should be. It's exactly what they always have been like when you play with them. And so even if they're joking around, they're still able to then get take care of business. And it's not really until, let's say, they have really high-level matches where they are pushed to their absolute brink where they really have to focus up. But apparently BC. Not quite meeting that threshold, but I'm sure this might have gotten somewhat nervy down the stretch of that game as it kept it close. Game number three, let's see what's in store for us now. Oh my word, Comp! The, the touch to himself off the ceiling into a backboard double tap. And look at this, he had no boost left after that touch right there. The, the vector was just pixel perfect to make it one nothing. So we'll be seeing Really, uh, what's next in this game? Because, of course, I'm saying, hey, what are we going to see from St. Clair? Well, we're showing you. You're allowing Comp to be able to air dribble at your goal uncontested. Big mistake, because that's going to go in your own net. Maybe that deflection might go in that. It's off the bar, and Jay gets the save. And that is the margin. You have one look at that goal, and if you don't convert, St. Clair's going to swap that away. We're going to head into a listen in here for UBCO's comms right now. Let's do it. I'm, I'm middle, I'm middle. Let's go, yes. dude. Nice. Nice. A good pass. Good pass it. Good call. We take those, dude. <clears throat> no, we don't take those. We make them happen. Yeah, literally. <laughs> good stuff. Okay, back left. Yeah. I'll cheat. I'm zero. I'm up. Over me. I got that hook. Thank you, Kenny. Funny. Sorry. I, I literally just had no boost to like deal with it. That's my fault. I need to gun. Oh, get oh. Did I hear a keyboard there? Sounds like we have a KBM warrior over there. Oh. Definitely uh, typing up a storm, or at the very <laughs> least trying to, to desperately do that. Now I was saying, I was actually about before we actually pulled out of those comms. I was about to say, Max, I was like thinking, oh man. Look, they had another goal scored. Look at him go. And then within the same call, they're unfortunately able to get answered back from St. Clair. So you can't win them all. No, but I think we've officially broken the, like, impossible to do well while, while the listening is happening curse in this tournament. We've seen a couple goals happen during a listen in as Jay wants another double tap. Look at the placement. He had to actually place that perfectly top left because there was a goalie reading this touch. Craps was there. Well, never mind. He was on the back of the... I had a little optical illusion. He was still in the back of the goal. I came in from Jay's POV, and it looked like he was floating there on the goal line, but it's better to have good placement and not need it than need good placement and not have it. Yeah, I, I can 100% hop on board with that, but I think the main issue that it seems like UBC is still oh, dealing boy. with is that St. Clair is so unexpected with what they do, and they're at the upper echelon of high-level players, where sometimes 
Players go for a double tap, and you're thinking, nah, you're probably hitting that. And then you can kind of just like trust that they're most likely not going to nail it. But St. Clair is at a level where every time they go for it, you're like, that's probably it. <laughs> you have to really yeah. pay attention to it. St. Clair, it's incredible how consistent they are with these setups. Almost getting pre-jumped at this point with Cub. It cascades from there, too, as you start to, you know, you feel like, oh, he's scoring that as soon as a double tap is set up. As Fisher can't find the shot, saved by Comp. That on the counterattack, Spoods is going to be the first one there to make it 4-1. to one. This is the St. Clair Saints team from that game one we expected to see all tournament long, just absolutely pouring it on. As you were saying, though, you start to expect those double taps to go in, Taco, and it, it cascades from there, because then you got to, as a defender, get up for that challenge so much quicker. And as soon as that double tap becomes a pass instead of a shot, or is missed, you're not there. You're not there to save that kind of second opportunity. And that still leads to that just that threat of the double tap. And I think uh, the, the big issue that a lot of teams deal with when you're playing a team of St. Clair's caliber, who is just in, in that upper echelon of collegiate teams in general, is that they are always threatened. It's not that, oh, they're, you know, when they get set up on offense, they can be advantaged. No, that was started with Fisher getting a hit off the crossbar, and you're thinking, okay, that's probably fine to follow. Who's going to be up for that? It's Jay. And then he just flicks it onward, and Spoots has an immediate counter. It's just so quick. It's lightning quick how much they can just punish you off of barely any starter up. Fisher's got to hit it off his own backboard. It does work out for the time being. Quad will land on this one. Couldn't find the net on the ground pinch. See UBCO starting to kind of chase demos a little bit just to shake things up as we enter the final 100 seconds of play here in a moment. In this game, they need it. They don't want to be swept. Somebody, Somebody's going to eventually have to take a game off of St. Clair. But in the meantime, props to UBCO for at least making St. Clair dig deep into that bag of tricks that they have. You know, it, it was not a straight up, it, this has not been a straight up series as Jay, it's another double tap. We've seen, we've seen St. Clair go to those mechanics that they have. They have actually needed to do it. At this point. And that is exactly why Jay has a scholarship to St. Clair and why they're getting paid from their org because my goodness, they are so incredibly good. And it's, it's that level of skill that even among all these great players, Comp, Jay, and Spoods, they're able to just pull off the most mechanically complex plays with ease. And that's why, really, it's hard to really bat, uh, batten down the hatches and just lock down your half and say, OK, we're just going to really park the bus and hope for the best, because at a certain point, they will always find a way through. You need to be creative. You need to keep them on their back heels. And I would say very few teams, uh, if any in Canada, can really manage that. Parking the bus just hasn't worked since kind of season one of RLCS. At the at the advent of the double tap ended that, essentially. You just, against against the best players in the world, you have to have the ball to be secure in defense, essentially. Fisher looking for the shot, just didn't, did not have the momentum to put that, put on that ball. This game all but over, Taco. This series all but over, is Comp looking for another one? for the road, played back. I think they're really going to all of it. Ceiling pinches, we haven't seen it. We haven't seen them going for a lot of flip resets, but it's just been double tap city. Diva would be proud. I'm coming off the ceiling. They're, they're looking for clips now. We've hit the looking for clips portion of game, of game three here. Well, you don't really have to worry about a comeback, so <laughs> might as well get something for the stream. Tweet out, put on your Discord, just something to flex on your homies. That's always best way to do it and I think that's the way that they're trying to amount it all to is just be able to put a bow on it move on in this bracket and be able to continue <laughs> yeah. to be the player that we all know they want and to be honest sometimes what it takes to score on St. Clair is them scoring on themselves. <laughs> she grabs with the thanks immediately after that there's the uh the 5-2 final in game three St. Clair Saints as expected they move on into our winner's finals? That would, yeah, that seems right. Yeah, and they will face the winner of UBC Gold versus the University of Alberta. Taco, as U of A with the upset over, over Waterloo. As we will, we will see that game next. We will see that match next after our break. Uh, St. Clair though, Taco, just looking, looking like absolute stud. That, that, is, that is a good way to phrase it. I would say that is exactly what they are because they are terrifying. They are not a fun team to play against, and I think that is a perfect series. Why? As you started off, and we're saying, okay, that's a good game one. Then game two, we're thinking, oh, 
okay, never mind. This is this is where they start to. Oh, never mind. They're good. And then game three <laughs> was just the same thing. It was just every time you think this could be the end, it never really is, and it's gonna take quite a lot. I still think Waterloo bounces back, but who knows? Maybe Alberta's got what it takes. That that game two there in that series we just watched was as close as I've seen Saint Clair played in the Canadian collegiate scene. They've been played closer. They've been beaten in CRL. Um, but big huge props to UBCO for the showing they put on there. You know, once you go down 2-0, it can be a moral a, a moral thing, a mental thing. Um, they were even 1-1 in that game before St. Clair turned it on. As, as, as well as I've seen a Canadian collegiate team play against St. Clair Saints here at the 7-11 Rocket League Canadian Collegiate Championships. Danger Taco, I'm Max. And guess what? I just got a note that said my order from 7-Eleven is here. So you might see me munching when we come back from this break, Taco. You might get your wish. And uh, during the Canadian Collegiate Championship, 7-Eleven is offering a huge discount on all seven now deliveries over $11. Download seven, the 7 Now app, enter the code 7 off 11 score $7 off your order. There you see it right there. I got the benefit of it's just being delivered to me. It's part of, it's part of the deal that, that I have with, with, with PGS. I love to see it. Taco, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to be back shortly with the other winner's semis. That will be UBC Gold up against the University of Alberta when we come back after this break. Just when you thought our crispy classic chicken couldn't get any better. We created the new barbecue bacon chicken sandwich, a crave-worthy sandwich made fresh in select stores daily. Chicken worth crossing the road for. Visit 7-Eleven.ca to find a crispy classic chicken store near you.
Welcome back. The 7-Eleven Canadian Collegiate Rocket League Championships here at the Gaming Stadium. I'm Max. With me is Danger Taco. And uh, I'm excited for this event that we got coming up, March 25th to 27th, here in, uh, here in BC. 7-Eleven's taken over the Gaming Stadium to, uh, to deliver the ultimate in-person gaming experience. I'm going to be there. I, I, I'm, unfortunately, you can't be there, Taco. I just won't be allowed. It's, it's too much immigration. But the event <laughs> will feature Rocket League free play for all the people who want to go. Arcade games, live giveaways, 7-Eleven snacks, goodies, and also a lot. So, obviously, if you don't want to miss that, you can go to and capitalize your chance on tgs.gg slash 7-Eleven Gamers Lounge. So that URL is definitely something you're going to want to check out if you want to sign up, get all of that goodness, and just bond. Nothing better than in-person gaming. And I, I think... I, I could be misremembering. I was reading about it. I think there's like legitimate RC Rocket League set up at this, like RC Car Rocket League. I'm super curious to see how that's going to work out. As we get ready for our uh, our third series of the day, UBC Gold, fresh off their win against Ryerson, against U of A, fresh off their big upset against Waterloo, as we are into this in game one. And it's uh, we've seen UBC Gold, so I'm going to introduce everybody on stream to U of A. It's Ketchup, Specknon, and Jarl. I think the same team we saw in the last, in the last Canadian Collegiate series that uh, that Thunder and I did in November. It's been a while, but I mean, we talked about it pre-game taco. We were expecting to see Waterloo versus Saint Clair in the uh, in the in the winners' finals. That's not happening. It's going to be one of these teams up against Saint Clair. We saw UBC Gold really take over against Ryerson. This U of A team, though. We'll have something to say about it. I've seen this U of A team beat UBC Gold. It's happened. This should be a close one. And then, so this is certainly what I'm looking forward to. We've uh, seen the preview of the UBC side, so we know what they're capable of. But apparently, Alberta also capable of some nice saves. Uh, I've run into Jarl a fair amount in my time throughout Rocket League, but not as familiar with their teammates. They're doing a lot to 
make sure their mark known though. The defense is holding and getting not only nice clears, but being able to follow them up with some promise. Specknot off the sidewall, off the backboard, catch up lurking, but not able to get that goal to go. And it was, if I recall correctly, in the last tournament that I called for Canadian Rocket League, Collegiate Rocket League specifically, it was Specknot doing a lot of the work on offense as Frodo bangs it off the sidewall. So we'll keep an eye out for both Jarl and Specknot. Ketchup's going to have to make his name in this game. Because <laughs> I have not run into him. And I've not run into Ketchup, Frank. I, I don't think you have either. If you didn't mention it. It's Jarl with the big challenge. Just to Jarl. Great, great gamer tag on Jarl, by the way. Giving me Skyrim vibes. Right? Skyrim <laughs> or just like general Norse vibes. As Ski's got an open net, Ski will put it in to make it one to nothing. This battle of Western Canada. You see Alberta rivalry strong always. Always strong. Yeah, that 50 could have been a bit stronger, though, on the back end for the side of U of A, because unfortunately they're going to aerial for that the best they can, but it's going to get dunked right into the ceiling and into an open shot. Speaking of, Specknon trying to make their mark on this game, but that's going to go well over the bar. Able to get the follow, but only that. It's going to go right back out to mid. Catch up. That's a giveaway. Frodo infield pass. Ski with the solo play, trying to dunk it down. Not going to find that pay dirt. Back out to midfield we go. We'll see if UBC can maintain this hot start. We talked about how slow to start they can be at times and how just annoying and they can wear on you over, over the course of a series they are, but getting up one nothing here in game one, a little bit abnormal for them. <laughs> you know, we see this team go down quite often and have to make comebacks. I feel like they'd probably agree. They'd love to, they'd love to see like an like easy win because it just doesn't happen so often. They come back squad team that, like I said, they just like to wear on you as the series wears on with that you called it that UBC play style, Taco. Just just irritating. It's very irritating to play against. Depending on how you view Rocket League historically, something kind of irritating is happening on front of <laughs> the U of A goal. We have a rule one, or potentially rule zero, or rule two, or whatever you guys want to call it. It is two players who are completely locked, so we have functionally become a 2v2, and that can work in the advantage of UA. They do have an attack as stealing all the boosts on the field, but not getting any of the possession. Frodo. Nice cut into Jarl, and it will stand still. And to be honest, respect to these players, they're they are playing in a cash prize tournament, and they are still respecting it. It is it is a modified rule one. Catch up on on Fervent's hood a little bit here. I'm just staying on this on on Fervent's player cam or on Ketchup's player cam rather, I'm just watching from this perspective as Ski makes the save. I this is this is how I rectify the what's rule one of Rocket. This is rule one. Keeping the ball up at zero seconds is the first rule of practice. Those are two different things. It is, without a doubt, keeping the ball up on zero is the first rule that ever happened. But yes. you, can't not, you can't not call this rule one. They have been, this is a, we're almost on two minutes now as Specknot will break it up with a goal, and it's 1-1. One, one. That's really well done, and you got to feel for Frodo. They're trying their best to get that pinch, and they do it flawlessly. However, Jarl, I can see into your mind that psychic link that they have with you. They read that pinch perfectly and then gets a pass right out to their teammate. So very well done, Alberta. Tie game, a minute to go. Who's going to step up as a hero? You love to see you love to see the memes in a money game, but you hate to see it if you're UBC leading to a goal. Both teams made the same kind of sacrifice. It's not like you're trading a great player for a bad player in the one in the, the rule one they're, they're both quite good for ketchup and Fervin. we saw Fervin really take over the series in round one so maybe you don't love to see it if you're ubc in that regard but there's a pass to frodo who's just gonna pop it ski's gonna have to back off go get some boost to the corner now ketchup big clear we head into the final 20 seconds in game one frodo gets hard or dunked by ketchup Ball played all the way back to the way of Jarl. Midfield action here. He's going to have to be careful because that's a center, and Specknot can't capitalize. Ball still hanging out in front, though. Demos from U of A have been prevalent throughout this game one as we see overtime. Yeah, and you had mentioned sometimes it's not like trading a player. I would love to see a team somehow organize a strategy of saying, I need to take out this player, and then they just try to rule one of them. Just try, <laughs> just try to lock them down in place. I don't know how successful that'll be. And same with waiting for the shot. That was almost punished by Ski as they'll put that over the bar. And 
as we uh, end this overtime. This is in lockstep, uh, and this is a great way to open up this series. It is neck and neck, and honestly, I have no predictions about how this one's gonna end. No, I, I, I mean, we've, we've, I've seen both of these teams beat each other. I don't know, I know, you know, UBC and UBCO play each other really close in, in scrims. I don't know the scrims, I don't have the scrims intel in this particular matchup, but I'll tell you something. It's been Demo City in game one. Somewhere, somewhere Arsenal is shedding a single tear watching this game happen. Love it. It is a nice thing to see. It's a play style people hate, but honestly, I'm a huge fan of it because yeah. sometimes there have been plenty of games that are decided by demos simply just because the rotations are too good. Everyone is way too good at the game where it's just you can't break oh, no. through. There's nothing to do about it. So you have to send someone to the graveyard because otherwise you're never going to be able to actually bust through. And I think that's really the strategy that maybe they're taking up on themselves, though. It's starting to open up a bit as these late reads, almost burning up Alberta, but actually going to result in anything too bad. Fervent, nice infield pass, but gonna send that well wide, and Roto, try as they might, and only just lob that for Specnon to follow. Both teams kind of trying to figure out a way to take control of this overtime. A lot of midfield play, but that's a big clear off the backboard. Garl is there, and the finish as U of A win game one. And it was uh, just like that, blink of an eye, a big clear by Specnon. And l thanks for look making me look smart, smart Specnon. I highlighted Specnon to start the game, 100% goal participation, and three save. Yeah, and the nice. MVP. Yeah, it's, 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 you're getting all the accolades, Max. <laughs> Honestly, they're just, <laughs> they're just racking up, making you look extra smart because that uh, five out of seven shots is something, like, something to speak of if you have one player popping off, and that's a really good thing to see. But I really want to also pay attention to Jarl. They're getting that first goal, uh, that last goal, rather, of that game. First goal overtime. Obviously, only one goal. Only but goal. it still required a lot of concentration because they had to drive across from far post to near to be able to wrap around that, put it in, and it might be an open net, but it's... Not shot. unsurprising to see that go wide because you overthink it, or maybe you don't get the read you need to. So good to see them clutch up when they need to because, as we said, rotations were tight from both teams. So when you do have that golden opportunity, you have to make sure that goes in. I didn't mention it because it didn't it didn't seem to matter, but as it headed to overtime, UBC, UBC or not UBC rather, U of A left goals on the table in that game. There were a couple open net misses early in that game. You know, off the backboard where it could have been on target, off the post where it could have been on target. There's, I mean, there's obviously headroom for both these teams, but if you replayed game one, I feel like, you know, maybe two and ten would it go to overtime. And I think U of A wins that, you know, two to one, three to one more often than not the way that game went. Another ball off the backboard. Specton's there, but a save by Fervent. <laughs> Only, oh my word, nearly the booty pinch. The team bump might have opened this up for Ski if he can just put this on target quickly. And he does. It's one nothing UBC. What? After all of that, you're thinking, what's the worst that can happen? Then they bump each other. The worst possible outcome in Ski. I mean, more or less, I wouldn't be surprised if the comms are just don't mind if I do, as that ball is just perfectly skirted in front of them. I have, it's been a while since I've seen a defensive stand like that. I felt like it was sure to be an Alberta goal, and somehow it turns into the other direction. Maybe for number two, but no. For a shot, just too slow. Speaking of the comms, let's hear the U UBC comms right now. Let's do it. Again. Here. Ah, uh, it's okay. Ah. So quiet. I didn't expect myself to be live, man, there. Yeah, it's tough one. Actually, he's back. Cool. Here you go. Yeah, I'll go. Come up. Yeah. Topper game strong from UBC. I just noticed that as we just had a chance to just watch for a minute as Frodo scores with the pixel shades on to make it 2-1. 
really like this touch because not only are you passing it in a weird position, but you're then passing it straight back down. So the defense is to panic as it's going to the backboard, then immediately back down at a weird angle. And honestly, can't even blame Specknot. Their ball cam is probably going crazy. They just had to jump at it, hope for the best. And that's not going to be the optimal outcome. It's going straight down into the defender. And now it looks like UBC is starting to roll. And I would say well-deserved from it. They've thrown a lot of different swings at Alberta, and I don't think they really have wherewithal to stand up to it quite yet. I don't think you can blame the defense on that one at all. Did you see the catch from Frodo as he was falling after his touch? Right into a catch. That is that is next level ball control there. For a player who I think I think has gotten as high as like 17, 1800 in ones. Just a very controlled, that's, I mean, that might be the best play of ball control I've seen from Frodo. And I've, I've been watching this guy play for two and a half years, I think. As the shot from Specknot is saved by Fervent on the desperation save. You want as little of that as possible if you're a UBC fan. Just desperation in general. Fervent pinches that towards the front of the net. Doesn't make it there. Nice pass though for Frodo. The save. Ketchup is right there, taking away all the angles. And a save, a save before the shot really truly materialized. That time it'll be a statistical shot and save. Carl, gonna pass it down for Specton. Ski is there to redirect it. Another desperation save though. UBC up one, but having to make a lot of these kind of what's the word I'm looking for? Desperation by the skin of their teeth. That's the one. That's the idiom I was trying to find. I think the part of the issue as well is trying to look at UAB in that honestly really happy with how often they're trying to find each other with these cute little passes. The problem is, is that they're just telegraphed enough and slow enough that UBC is able to jump in and then once they're pickpocketed, <laughs> they can take the reward. That's goal number three and no one back for U of A. It's never good when, when, when the uh, if you're U of A, when the opponents are fighting over who gets the goal, as Frodo and Ski were there, net as open as open can be. And it's 3-1 here. UBC down one nothing in the series, like we saw them in their first round matchup. Trying to rest control back from U of A. Frodo, there's a good first touch. Able to get the second and third touch after his first one. This is what UBC was failing to do in their first round matchup against Ryerson for a lot of the time was just control. They were given the possession away. This time, not so much. When their first touch is heavy, it's to their teammates. Yeah, I think at least for right now, their the goal line clear UBC. It's just that they got to make sure they pay attention because 60 seconds is a long time to defend. So make sure that they lock everything down and. Make sure they're marking these players, because Specknot, they are completely unmarked, and they're going to take advantage. We see party time emerge from the goal. Specknot, another incredible play all, all by himself, just in the air with, with the car control. Didn't All, all it was going to take once Fervent jumped was any touch towards the net, essentially, that didn't go right into Fervent's car. Specknot was in a good spot there to read the defender and make the right touch, puts it down off the ceiling. Nobody's there, though, for U of A. Specknum plays this back to his teammates, but Fervent will win the race. Start to see that quality and Fervent that annoyed annoyed my compatriots so much come out here in game two. Just the ability to make plays where you don't expect him to even get a touch. Uh, well, I don't think Ketchup expected Jarl to get that touch. I think Ketchup actually had the better approach on that, but I suppose we'll never really know as right back into their corner way. Uh, continue with this out with a solid 50, but Fervent actually just gonna nail one on target. Yarl had to back with the save and ultimately going to try as the hardest as they can to get this forward, but that is a firm midfield defense coming through from UBC and it looks like they might just have enough <laughs> to weather the storm. They do. We got a tie series. I think Ketchup's gonna want that one back because after his whiff, both UBC players whiffed. Maybe just a, maybe just a you know a situation of them reading the touch and when the touch doesn't happen it leads to whiffs but that pass in that last second that pass was there that pass down to Ketchup Yarl found him Ketchup couldn't find the shot it's one one in this series and with these two teams who are so familiar with each other I'm not gonna be surprised if we go to game five with they're playing 
but saw it last, we saw it in round one the way UBC took over. Once they started to kind of get their sea legs going in a series, they can snowball to mix my metaphor my metaphors. It's hard. It's hard to stop this team once they get momentum. I think that's the biggest thing to watch out for if you are on the side of U of A, because I think the passing plays, that's a good quality to have. You always want to be able to look for your teammate because the ball moves faster than you can individually. So if you're able to connect with those passing plays, you can really mix things up, throw the defense some curveballs, be able to nail one right into the top shelf. However, since that's not working, they need to implement a different approach. Maybe it's just playing a bit more solid in the backfield, making sure they're consolidating possession first. But either way, it's going to be hard because UBC, they do not leave you alone. They are an annoying team. I'm going to stick by that, and I think they're living up to that because they are really hounding the U of A half with uh, very consistent challenges and quite a lot of irritating uh, movements through. And as we saw from their previous series, they know how oh. to take a challenge and they know how to defend as well. That one just barely going off the bar and Fervent able to carry it out just enough. Such a good job to just stay behind his first touch from Fervin. Needed two to get that ball clear as U of A trying to maintain offensive control. I'm sure that they're proud of that annoying, uh, that annoying label you've given them. Because as somebody who pr I pride myself on just, hey, what are you good at in Rocket League? That's eh, not mechanics, definitely for me. I just pride myself on being irritating. You know, I'll demo you. I'll be there where you don't expect me to be. I'll be in weird spots. I'm annoying to play against. I've been I've been told I'm not always the most fun to play with as well. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, a double-edged sword. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is a razor's edge when you're talking about playing that way. But these guys, specifically these three, have been playing together for so long, you can see the synergy there as Fervent with the drop pass for Ski. And that's a real tough one, but I was applauding U of A's looking at these passes. Sometimes it shows that UBC has that awareness as well, so... Anyway, down by one. They still got four minutes. Nothing too worried about, but I'm curious to see what the headspace is like, so we'll be able to listen in on their comms. Isaza. One up. Nice. Beat him. Stall out. Taking the corner. Back. No one's okay. up. Well, Frodo's up, sorry. Got right mid. Roof should come down. I don't have it on how. Nice try. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. <laughs> I hit that cross three times! Nice try. Oh, good. Just padding stats, easy. Bro, I swear, I'm just trying to like blast it. I should just aim more. Nice shot. I'm afraid they're gonna save everything. I'm back right. You can hear Taco how, I mean, I, I mentioned Spec not hitting crossbar a couple times in game one. I didn't point it out in game two, but you can hear him getting frustrated with it there in that in that, in that live listening. Yeah, and, and sometimes that can be the most frustrating thing is, uh, we had mentioned, I mean, a player that had popped off in the past and in previous games of this very series, but it can be one of the most frustrating experiences when you're trying to produce for your team and you can't just keep meeting a fourth defender, but the three already in goal are such a handful. Irvin, Able to prove that with yet another hit and the air dribble all the way through. <laughs> Bunch of deflections. Frodo might leave it to Ski, but instead Jarl gets teed up for the long clear. And we'll say as we're approaching half time, I'm waiting for the kind of twist of something new. Jarl nearly provided with a pass and a demo, but we will go all the way back down for Specton together. This is really our has been our first kind of demo meta series that we've seen both teams not dedicating to it, not chasing it, but getting them. Ski, the risky back pass. He's going to get bumped. Fervent's got to keep ball control. He does just long enough for Ski to recover. Of these three, Ski, I think, the most likely to, uh, to just retreat and, and be willing to be that third man. Another crossbar for Becknon. That one not even going to register as a shot. That was a, a nigh-impossible angle. I don't think he's going to beat himself up too badly about that one. I have different ideas about that touch as that's going to go down the middle. Double commit, actually, between Ketchum and Jarl, though. Irvin take their time anyway. It's over Ski. Not past Frodo. They're going to rotate, and they ought to be careful because they got a couple of UA players waiting for it. Jarl, look at the prediction. Look at the mechanics trying to take it to the back wall. It will be denied. Ketchup is not going to be able to beat Fervent. And it seems like the UBC defense will continue to hold as Ski's going to send that one deep, but only the waiting bumper. Spekdon off the bar again, but that one was a pass, and luckily for UBC, they're not going to allow that one to be a double. Spekdon cuts that off midfield. 
right back to him from Jarl. Spec not looking for the three touch goal. No good. Again, talk about that fourth defender. It's feeling like fourth, fifth, and sixth with Spec not off the crossbar and off of both posts here in this game. That is a, you, you cannot rely on that if you're UBC. Spec not will start putting these away eventually. As Jarl, your post for Spec not who whiffs, but a demo happens and a bump. Woo! What a play there. That's up catch up for the goal. Who was that? Was that Specknon with all the demos and the bumps? Specknon with the demo. Garl with the bump, dedicating three to that. Leaving catch up to just gotta put it on target, bro. And then there was a player trying to get to it from UBC, but that demo was so perfectly timed right in the middle of the goal that you're really just getting completely smoke bombed. You have no idea where that next shot is gonna come, where direction it's heading, and that can be really the end of any defensive stand. But 25 seconds remaining, and with the only two shots on, shots have come at a premium all day long for UBC. They were able to carve out chance by chance, but it's really going to take something special like we saw in the previous game, the backboard setup plays, because I don't know what it is. As this pendulum of a series continues to swing back and forth, it's just UAB really waking up and just taking it. 13 shots to the two of UAB to UBC. Impressive stuff. It, it, it felt really felt like UBC had figured it out in game two, but in this pivotal game three, U of A said, "Nah, you, you haven't figured out nothing." Because we're gonna. This is their best game of this series by a mile. And if UBC doesn't score right here, which they very well might, as Specknon plays it off the backboard, catch up just the touch ahead, and that will do it for game three. U of A had the answer. This is, I mean, this is starting to feel like one of those series where, you know, game one lays the blueprint, game two sees an adjustment, and then the team that loses game two adjusts to that adjustment. Does UBC have anything left to adjust with? Is there anything left in their toolkit from what U of A just showed us? 13 to 3 in the final shot tally. That is a controlled game. And their ability to continuously wrap back around, I mean, we had saw a goal in another in, in earlier on where essentially there was just hounding the goal and then they got countered on so that is the danger of playing a play style like alberta is playing where if you're pushing everyone forward and you're really trying to get the aggro a play style and make sure that you're overwhelming the defense you have to be aware that if something goes wrong if one screw pops loose into that machine you're trying to build it all just falls apart so that is something to be wary of it's always a double-edged sword when you're trying to play as quickly as possible but so far until UBC shows that they can keep up with you, and more importantly, is able to knock away those chances and create their own. It's just going to continue to be a downfall of goals. Specknon finally not hitting that crossbar and tucking one in right down the middle. Like I said, you cannot rely on a player like Specknon missing the net throughout a series. You just can't. He's going to start scoring, and if you're already down 2-1 in a series, you're kind of playing with fire with the way Specknon's been shooting. I mean, we talked about headroom in this match that, that U of A was leaving goals on the table. If they stop doing that, Specknon already with a goal in this one, if they stop doing that, they've looked like flat out the better team in this series. Yeah, they really have. And I think right now, this is a great opportunity to try and turn things around because ultimately, series are won one game at a time, so you just have to make sure you're focusing up on what comes next. Yes, you lost the game. Yes, you're under a lot of pressure, but to be honest, that doesn't mean anything about how you're performing this game. And Seems like they're going back to a cut and dry, just longer hits forward into safe positions that they can chase. The issue is there's no second player. There's no follow through. And I think that is something Alberta has succeeded on down the stretch, whereas UBC has kept it to solo plays and tried to adjust from there. As Frodo will bang it into the corner. Now Jarl, soft touch. Did not want to give that ball up, but did anyway. Specked on the control, looking to dribble ski. That sounds like I just made up a word, a little dribble ski. Ah, uh, yes, a dribble ski, yes. <laughs> Speck not the pinch to himself. We'll have to leave that, but Jarl is there. It's been the two players we highlighted. Catch up, getting in where he fits in. Has had a couple goals. Jarl and Speck not complete. The engine and the fuel, if you will, for this UA team, U of A team. We head into the as we're sitting here in game four rather one nothing lead for u of a and ubc needs to find something and they they need to do it pretty quickly here i mean it's one nothing 
you don't want to you don't want to play from behind when you're already behind in the series. Just from yeah. a mental standpoint, that tie game is so much nicer to play during. And that's actually kind of the risk taking I like to see. Ski had players rotating back. They're not all the way back, but he still dove for it to make sure it stays in. Ski. Another one, that's gonna be a dunk straight through. Frodo is required on this one, but they recognize there were two players lurking for Alberta. They cut it past the first and the second rotated out. So now Frodo, a play of their own making. The air dribble, it's generating a double commit well covered by U of A. So not gonna be that easy from UBC. They will keep on looking as Jarl sends a deep one downfield. Frodo is there on the backboard, but the answer's coming quickly from U of A. It just feels like UBC can't get really anything going, even coming out of their defensive end. I mean, it has been a low sh a low shooting game for both teams, just two to one. I wouldn't say the uh, the, sh the shot charts really indicate who's had control of this game. It felt like U of A all, all the way. It's still been fairly close. Honestly, incredibly low scoring game. And I mean that in game score as well. It's actually a lot of players sitting yeah. uh, still below 100 points. In fact, four out of the six are doing that simply just to show how much this ball has been kind of ricocheting around, gentle touches, and not much actual statistical beef to a lot of these plays. So you know, still kind of waiting for that breakthrough moment. Eventually, someone's going to have to take a there risk. Is. is that it from UBC? They're all the way up, and no one is back. It's spec not again, cherry picking up field. Yeah, I mean, there's a it, quick math. Under 800 points combined in this lobby with 98 seconds left to go in the game. This is feeling like feeling like one of the old school New Jersey Devils games, late 90s, early 2000s. The, the infamous neutral zone trap where just nobody, nobody can really get it going on offense, but still two goals. Two goals from from three goals from U of A as Ketchup makes it three nothing. It's gotta feel like six in a game like this. Back down. What an X factor. Look at this touch. It goes for the musty setup. And what I love about plays like that, it's a perfect example of a mechanic that in the beginning, everyone thinks, yeah, that looks cool, but is that actually useful? And then once you know how to implement it, it's such a weird thing to look at from a defender's perspective. Oh, they're backflipping. They don't have a re. Oh, suddenly it's higher. I can't read that. And then it turns out to be a goal. It's just such a cool thing about Rocket League. And also such a cool thing about this U of A team. They've gone from passing to solo plays to trying to work in bumps and demos. I mean, they're trying everything. And it seems like they finally found that working strategy. They're really putting a stranglehold on that game. <laughs> talking of Ketchup, just the gentle roller for four. Ketchup heard us talking about Specknon and Jarl and said, you know what, let me just pop off here in the elimination game. Two goals, he's got his brace. And I, I would argue these two goals, the third and fourth, have been the backbreakers. A minute eight to go. And, uh, you're, you're, you're playing against four now if you're UBC. You're playing against all three U of A players and the clock. They've got to score pretty much every time down the field. They want a reasonable chance at making a comeback. You know, it's always mathematically possible until there's, uh, I mean, 40 seconds left. But this one, they look for the demo Fervin does. It's pretty much it. Taco is U of A. I don't know if I would have called them the underdog in this one. This is a this is an even matchup in my mind. Maybe even a slight favorite, but U of A heading to the winners finals. Playing some of their best Rocket League of the day at the end of this series. Can they carry it over? Can they carry it over against St. Clair? Is the question. That's the question everybody's going to be asking themselves today. You talk about name wreck. Everybody in Canada knows St. Clair is the team to beat. Literally, like nobody's taking a game off them. I will reiterate that until it happens. I'm keeping track of it. In this, uh, let's call it this CRL kind of season cycle. This will do it. UBC will head to the lowers. U of A will move on to the winner's finals. We didn't even expect to see them here in, in semifinal B, Taco. They're headed to the winner's final. It's so what you like to see. I wouldn't call it a Cinderella story because that implies that they were never in contention to <laughs> begin with. I definitely think all these teams definitely have a shot. It's whether or not you can actually show up is really what is the yeah. X factor typically for what team can move on and what team will be held back. So that is going to be UBC going down into lower. So they're still alive. They can make a run if they so choose. But 
I definitely really impressed by a UA. I was not convinced. I was not sold on the idea of this team going forward up until those final couple games where it felt like they really clicked together. The offense was essentially just buckling <laughs> the uh, UBC defense under its sheer weight. And so uh, I'm certainly a fan of them now. And I think if St. Clair needs a challenge, then I think they found at least their first real one. You're watching the 7-Eleven Canadian Collegiate Rocket League Championships here at the Gaming Stadium. Rocket League at 7-Eleven is returning in a huge way, April 30th to May 1st. Join us for the 7-Eleven Rocket League Open, featuring an $8,000 prize pool. Sign up now. Not too late. But sign up before it is too late. TGS.GG slash 7 11 RL Open. Or you can just go to TGS.GG, navigate the website. It's a pretty easy one to navigate. We're going to take a quick break before the winner's finals. That's coming up next. St. Clair, U of A. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the 7-Eleven Canadian Rocket League Championships. Top eight of the top universities across Canada competing for $4,500 in a prize pool. Round King of the North. Taco, we got the winner's finals coming up. It's all sponsored by 7-Eleven. And you do like that. And specifically, that is important to know because 7-Eleven is giving away a lot. And so and from now until May 3rd, 7-Eleven is actually going to be giving away $2,500 in gaming gear packages every single week. So you can purchase products and scan your 7-Eleven app to enter. The more you scan, the more entries you get, and then the more likely you are to actually win through. So you also can enter those in and get five extra entries every time you scan a participating product and 10 extra entries every time you order delivery through the 7Now app or make a mobile checkout purchase. So for more details, you can visit tgs.gg slash 7-11 contest, something you don't want to miss out on because getting those bonus entries, getting all that gamer swag is great because you're only as good as your peripherals on your PC. Speaking of peripherals, shout out to the mute button on my headphones, allowing me to take a big old bite of pizza and not chew in everybody's ear. Clutch. Not gonna not gonna not gonna plug the brand name, because they are not a sponsor, but clutch <laughs> clutch with the mute button on the headset. It's right here. As we get ready, Paco, for this uh winner's finals, U of A 
coming in hot, coming in real freaking hot with the way they've been playing up against the St. Clair Saints team. Still, still haven't lost a game. It, it's incredible to see. It, it's and it's I, I, of course we have said that a, a while, but it's very rare that you see teams that you could kind of say dynasty level <laughs> type dominance. And I think St. Clair, at least in the uh, Canadian scene, is certainly a team that can live up to that one because, my goodness, look at them go. Yet another game under their belt that they're trying to really master. And I think U of A, the way that they're playing, I'm excited to see if they can hang in, but it's going to be a battle, as we all know. And again, I think, uh, as always with St. Clair, the player, the, if you're going to pick one player to watch, you know, and sit on their player cam. If you have the opportunity to spectate a lobby like we do today, that player is Jay in the, in the, what is that decal? In the orange, is that a Nerf Works? I don't even know anymore. There's so many items in Rocket League, including items from 7-Eleven that are just lovely. We saw, I want to say Fervent was rocking one of the decals in their last series. I don't even, but the orange car on the orange team, that's the guy to watch. Jay has real pop off potential Spec not on the other hand, the pop-off potential for U of A, and we saw it in the last series, with like 80% goal, goal participation. Yeah, and that's why you gotta watch them, because they're opportunistic. Look at that ball, it's just lingering in the midfield, and you think that plays over, you think that there's nothing left to do, and then out of nowhere, that's where Spec strikes, and that shows that even St. Clair, and maybe get too lackadaisical, too laid back on that play, and they actually be on the back foot yet again, that shot will be safe through, and Granted, I can't imagine that they're too stressed about it as we've no. seen what through their comms because no. they can do stuff like that. Spoods right down to Jay. You talk about the back foot. I feel like Sinclair loves being on the back foot. They seem to play better when forced to play better. Not that they play down to their opponents necessarily, but you get a goal lead on them, you see a different a different side of the St. Clair Saints. Because it is one nothing here a minute in. Scoring early. I like the follow there from Yarl. A lot of teams don't want to take that risk, and uh, sometimes that is why, fire. because Speknon yeah. try to fake challenge. JC's right through that, and they see the avenue to the goal. Just as you said it, what's the opposite of a caster's curse? Caster Just, blessing, I suppose. Yeah, the caster <laughs> has to... Bless. Bless. I mean, Speknon's been making me look like a genius all tournament. This game, both teams combined to make you look extremely appreciative of that. <laughs> It's uh, something that is appreciated from these players. They're, you know, they're people pleasers, I'm sure. <laughs> but I think they are most concerned with trying to use their athletic programs here for the esports <laughs> at their university because they still have a lot of money to play for. And they are oh so close, being that this is our winner's finals. And go through St. Clair is an upward battle. But we're just putting up a heck of a fight so far. That's a first save. How about a second? Cobb dunking it through the defender, but not through the post. Up. Looking to control it out of defense. U of A has done a really good job passing out of D throughout this throughout this tournament. Which, you know, barring a big solo clear, it's kind of what you got to do. Look for look transition right into offense with one or two touches. Create offense seemingly out of nothing. Speaking of creating offense, comp going for the flip reset. They might have heard us talking about how we didn't see any in that first win of theirs. Specton nearly gets the goal. Put enough mustard on it. U of A. U of A knows. You know, to get this second goal, they're gonna need they're gonna need something special. On the other hand, Jay just taking a straight shot has to be saved by Jarl. Seeing these close challenges from St. Clair that you don't think are dangerous, like Jay is just winding up with nothing and is able to get it saved, and then Jay just has to sit back and watch as Jarl will pound that one into the open net. What a setup by Ketchup. Look at the air roll, getting underneath it and keeping all the power. Jay really had no no chance on a well-placed shot there, and Yarl coming through with very much one of those. Stuck on the ground before the, like, as the touch is happening. Car is only so big. But, <laughs> oh, back breaking off of the kickoff there. You tie it up, get the, that's the kickoff of doom right there if you're, if you're the if you're the player going for boost. With, Catch up was not a lot you can do about that either. Back to back, kind of almost unsavable goals. And 3 2 here for St. Clair. Yeah, and I can't really uh, blame that play from Catch Up. They have the boost. I think they might have been able to jump off that wall, just try to, try to lean back, try to 
reach as far as possible in the middle to hit that, but I also understand that sometimes you think that's too risky, and then you back down, and then just the sheer velocity of that ball makes you realize this was not the correct decision. Very unfortunate to see, and of course, Jay, they're going to be on the tail end of that one, getting that lead right on back, and as UAB is learning, as so many others have, very hard to stay close or even tied with St. Clair for long. Very much like UBCO did in a couple of the games, though, you know, run of play wise, U of A is very much in this, but comp looking to go under, couldn't find the last touch. You know, shots wise, control wise, doesn't feel like St. Clair is running away with this, but what it does feel like is U of A's got to work so hard for every goal as a bump comes out and Specknon ties it up. It's a two player effort. Just like I said, they got to throw a lot at the wall and see what sticks. Whereas St. Clair's goals seem to be a little bit easier to come by. That's a heads-up play, though, for yeah. Ketchup. They're waiting in the middle. That pass from Yarrow goes up and over. Ketchup is about to jump, realizes Jay just fell off of the sidewall as they weren't ready for that roll, and then just goes through the bump. They don't even pay attention to the ball because they know Specknon's third, and they're going to be able to bury that one. They do, and 75 seconds remaining. We're looking at yet another tied game. But for how much longer? Who's going to be able to break that deadlock is still up for debate. Obviously, UAB wants it to be them, but seen so many teams do this and then falter out. It's so hard to play a consistent five minutes at this level. Specknon seems to have uh, finished his argument with the crossbar today. And that is good news for U of A and U of A fans. Because Specknon scoring generally spells good news in general for U, for U of A. Specknon will get that clear off the backboard, but it only goes as far as Jay, whose shot is on ketchup got a touch but not enough and get it just goes afk after that one probably just sighing they felt like they had the save but they might have overthought it they double jumped on a play where they probably fine with just a single and a flip but ultimately that's what happens when you're fumbling for a quick save when a shot comes before you're ready for it 33 seconds remaining and quality kickoff can maybe amend for that the air dribble over comp but could be spanked to the ceiling now a double tap we know what they can do with these. Specknon knows as well. They're going to hit that one well to the side. Spoots and Comp will be able to gather it through. At this point, it's just all time management. Four goals for Jay. Plenty of plenty of game score from Comp and Spoods, but the offense has been all Jay in this one. With five seconds left, and Jay can air dribble out the clock. If he had enough boost, he did not. Comp is up quickly for this one. And just sets it down. 1-0 St. Clair, closer than maybe they would have wanted, but we did, we, again, we're seeing teams, we're seeing the, uh, oh boy, <laughs> we're seeing teams uh, start to, you know, the tide's rising to meet St. Clair here in Canada over time. You get enough hours in against a team like this, you are going to get better. You know, when yeah. we started doing these Canadian collegiate tournaments in July or June of 2021, oh. It was not close. You know, St. Clair was just absolutely curb stomping their way through these tournaments. Little by little, we're starting to see, you know, I still haven't seen them drop a game. I will mention again, but we're starting to see close games. We're starting to see games where they fall behind, or where it's tied up late, and they need, they need that silver goal, that golden goal to win it. We saw UBCO take them to overtime. That might have been, I, can't, I couldn't tell you for sure, that might have been a first. The rest of Canada starting to meet them where they are. But again, it feels like St. Clair has has more in the tank. If they if 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 they were to drop a game here, I feel like they could they could really kind of ratchet it up. And I think that's the uh, a lot of times when I talk about collegiate programs, I think it's a lot easier to refer to them in tiers. There's tier three universities where you're just getting some buds together, you're playing fairly well. There's tier two where you might be able to challenge for CRL, you might be able to get into that level. But the tier one universities, those are the St. Clairs, uh, those are the Northwoods, those are the Akrons, those are the Stocktons, all those very classic powerhouse teams that are just so good at being able to consistently pull out these games. And even though they might struggle in series more than times than often, uh, they will be able to come out on top just because even when you seem like you turn it up to 10, they somehow have an 11. And then when you meet them there, they can go up to 12. It just never stops. They're always able to adapt. They're always able to find that inspiration. And it's what makes St. Clair such a dubious dragon, or I suppose in their case, a griffin, to be able to slay. <laughs> I like that. I like that reference. As comp, maybe got a reset off that. 
touch was a little bit too strong for us to really ever know. Look at the pre-flips. This is when you know St. Clair's... Even though that game was close, you can tell they're feeling themselves. They pre-flip at everything. They're, they're a firm adherence to the pre-flip game ethos. It can be a very weird thing to read because mm -hmm. you can see someone take an approach and even if they don't even have a good line on it, it just gets a touch that you're not expecting whatsoever and it makes you hesitate just that little bit, especially if they flip before you're even ready. You're thinking, ah, that probably is fine. That'll probably get a 50 and then nope, a bumper uh, pokes in and picks them before you get to it and then suddenly the entire landscape of the play is different. I'm a huge fan of players who are comfortable enough that they can bust it out whenever they need to. I'm comfortable enough to do it. I don't know. I feel like I've hit it like... 60% of the time. <laughs> Comfortable and execution are two different things as Spoons gets it off the wall. Jay is right there looking to set himself up for a, for a double tap. Spectron had to be there for U of A. I realize I've been meaning to ask you this during a break off mic. Let's just do it. Let's just do it on camera. Who cares? Who? I must have missed it. Who signed Jay? Where did Jay sign? Jay is currently playing with Prestige Esports, which ah. is a very new organization that at first signed a different squad and then it was like nah you're not doing that well and then they signed jay along with a few other friends and from there they're actually been kind of challenging through they've been entering a lot of bubble scene tournaments in rlcs level and just below and they've been doing better and better every time i see them so certainly jay's getting that top level experience in and comp and spoon they're hopeful for the high levels of rocket league as well so they're just natural companions and that shows why comp that predator instinct lurking in the six yard box the connections. It wasn't even really a pass, but Spoon's just wreaking havoc on the back line there for U of A. Just being there, just threatening, just standing there threateningly, driving at the ball, forcing a bad touch. Oh boy. one nothing here. We saw, we saw St. Clair comfortably coming back. Last series coming back in game one, but St. Clair with a lead is another animal altogether. They are one of the few teams that you'll see at this level who truly can Park the bus with relative success. I mean, when you have that complete chemistry that we were talking about and all that faith in each other, I think it makes locking down the defense a lot more, I would say, manageable for most teams. I think a lot of teams, when they get desperate, when they get low on boost, they start double committing on the back line, even though they have multiple people that could go for it, just because they're not 100% sure. They get a little in their heads. And St. Clair, you notice that, yes, they might be crowding the goal line, but there's always a cohesive plan for getting it out. And the person who goes for it is oftentimes going to be the one to succeed in getting it clear without really any ill effects. And I think it's what makes this team so elite, even when they're sitting back. You mentioned they like playing on the back foot because it's just as comfortable as them dictating the rest of the flow of the play. Specknot with a dunk, but Spoods is right there. The intelligence oh. in the third man role of Spoods to create a scoring opportunity for himself. Right place, right time, and then just watch this place. Oh. Place mint with an eye. Oh. <laughs> it's flawless. You can't. You actually cannot place an A better based on how that defender was trailing from the back post. When, uh, you know, we talk about the connection between Comp and Jay, when Spoods is scoring, this team is untouchable in Canada as Jay makes it 3 up. This is a tough one, and I feel for it, but ultimately Jay knows they don't have to get it on target, just put it somewhere weird. But you know what's really weird? When you're stationary and the ball's coming right at you on your goal line, sometimes all you gotta do is just watch it go in and sigh. Yeah, I mean, I can't even... I've played against UBC. I've played against that whole team. I can't... It's demoralizing. I cannot imagine how demoralizing it is to play against things there. The way you have to just kind of push everything and play a little bit faster than you want to, and as soon as you make a single mistake, Somehow it's 3-0 off one mistake, even though that doesn't make any sense. It just, I don't I don't envy it. I really just don't. Uh, there's, there's a certain element of teams that snowball and play with momentum, but I 100% understand where you're coming from. There's certain squads that you play against, and it's not even a snowball, it's just a straight avalanche. You just get buried, it seems, at the first sight of goal. Yeah. You're just wondering, how did you get in this perspective? We were so close not a minute ago. This is where I'd be in quick chat, like, I dare you to switch to keyboard and mouse. <laughs> just, just try to bait him in. Over time, to, you won't. Yeah. <laughs> game, game five, you won't. They, <laughs> they might take the bait because they're that confident playing with each other is, is St. Clair. This game two has looked like borderline free play at times for this squad. They do not seem concerned. Ball's going off their backboard with nobody up there. They don't really mind. 
Beknon and U of A need to, they, they need this moral goal. They need something here, I feel, to going into game three. Something to prove to themselves that, that game one wasn't a fluke. That this is the fluke. This this game three beat game two beatdown is the fluke. And, and, and you know that that really really razor thin close game one was the tr is the true nature of this matchup. And so we'll see how they close this game out and prepare themselves for the next one as we'll be able to actually listen in to the UBC comms. I smell a reverse sweep. You smell it? I smell it. I smell something. I smell, I smell the reverse. <laughs> I yeah, smell yeah. it. I can back right. They kind of do have to back right. Bump them. Pass. Bump them. That's a bold fake. <laughs> Called him UBC. Maybe I'm just mixing teams because at this point it's all the same. It's just St. Clair continuing to win. And uh, UAB, I mean, uh, a team of few words on this, but I mean, not much to say other than GG go next. Game did not go the way that they were planning, and they only got one more shot, one more loss in the life column to give before they were sent down to lowers. Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, I'm not going to take much away from those comms. I'm not going to be like, oh, they're just not talking enough. They still seem like they're having fun. At the end of the day, you're playing games for money. It's tough not to have fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, down four nothing there. The way that the way that they the way that St. Clair can play, winning a game with uh, with Jay at the bottom of the scoreboard. What do you even have to say? At that point, you just start kind of laughing at yourselves and on to the next one. And this next one, this next one's the series here for U of A. It's not their tournament. They still have a life, a full life, even if they lose this one. Drop down to the, they drop down right to the losers finals, right? That's how it works. So they're very much still in this one as a tournament, but you gotta find something. You gotta find some kind of sauce to put on this game if you're U of A here in game. game. And, and, and this is the tough thing to be able to do when you have teams and you're trying to create the internal logic in your mind where we're saying, well, UAB, I would say played better than the team St. Clair beat earlier so that means they should play St. Clair better than the other team I think that works out logically and then you watch it and play and it still just doesn't really happen it feels like they should be playing better but every team matches up with each other differently and I think St. Clair is the trump card for right now it's gonna have to take something real special I think they want that replication of game number one again keep it as close as possible just make sure the defense is tight the offense is efficient and I think there's definitely light at the end of this tunnel but hopefully it's not something they're heading into <laughs> in terms of the <laughs> end of series life. The transitive property of Rocket League rarely works out. That's a math thing as Ketchup hits the sidebar, the side, the, the, the post. That's the word I'm looking for. Was it, I think it was CRL recently where they, somebody posted, was it, they called it the circle of suck where like everybody beat <laughs> everybody? That was a CRL thing, I think, as Cop makes it one nothing. That is the opposite of the transitive property in math. If, if this, then this. Just doesn't always make sense. Matchups, styles, they make they make all the difference in the game. Yes, that was uh, submitted by Pulch, a longtime member of the CCA Discord and admin team. Shout out to Pulch. As, uh, yes, the circle of suck is a wonderful thing found in nature where every single team has been beaten by a different team, and which is yeah. why you can't really apply, as you mentioned, that transit property, because it doesn't often work like that. Specnon, it's not going to work like that either. Try to cross up the defense and go for the back post, but ultimately only going to find Spoods on the save. Um, she's slowing that down to the kind of weird touch and gonna get a demo. Might as well take someone with you if your shot's not gonna find its net. Right now, to stay with math, St. Clair looking more like a, looking more like a geometric proof, something that's just always true. St. Clair Saints in a Canadian collegiate tournament look like the best team in the field. One nothing here. Catch up looking to tie it up. The placement was perfect, the save was better. Comp getting up there to get it out. And that was a pre-jump save from Comp. They knew that was probably the only place they could put it from that angle where it would be competitive, so they took their gamble and paid off. Jay trying to gamble their own to the pre-jump, and looks like Specton is actually quickly on this one. They're probably going to beat Speeds too. Again, the next defender 
answer the call. Comp will say yes to that and, and extend it to Jay. My goodness, we know what he oh, can do boy. with all that space. Flip reset under the back post. Comp was chasing, but not able to nip at the heels of the defender to make him quake. I think they're controlling this and we talk a lot about organization on defense. It was a perfect example a few moments ago as the goal is scored. Forget what I'm saying. Jay's made it 2 nothing. Another perfectly placed power shot from Jay. He's so good, but look at the oh. setup here. Not only clearing this forward, but hits it, and as soon as that contact is made, side flips to get on the outside so they can run straight into the read. They don't have to angle it around. They don't have to fuss too much with how they want to approach it. Just everything works out so cleanly. It's efficient, and ultimately, it is so deadly. You saw Jarl take a half second to try to get that read, and by then, Jay already picked their spot. There's no time for reading against St. Clair. You just have to play. You just have to let your muscle memory take over and kind of hope just kind of hope you're right. Because the second you start thinking and reading, the back of your net. Here's Jarl. Has control. Oh, missed the flick. Didn't have as much control as I thought, clearly. Smooths now. Oh, oh. Fake City. Spectron couldn't do much with that. That one is on target. And Smooths won't get their Spectron just uh throws himself in front of the bus there <laughs> <laughs> to make sure that ball goes in. I would uh, I would say this is kind of like a get down, Mr. President, diving in front of the <laughs> bullet, but I guess it's if it's Canada, I guess it's get down prime minister, I suppose, because that is exactly what they just did. They realized they couldn't get it, but they're like, hey, if I can slow out this defender, I've done my job, and they really threw themselves in front, but that's only part of the sacrifice they're going to have to make. They're going to have to sacrifice a lot of probably mental comfort to be able to break through and play well enough to beat down the St. Clair team. How about this one? It's a roller. It is a sitter for a catch up. And there you go. Quick as you like the full comeback. Tough little miscommunication between Jay and Spoods. And just what I was about to say, they somehow got away with it. They didn't. Catch up was there. The pressure was too much. It's tough to come back from the, uh, the old double commit into team bump play on defense. Oh my goodness, off the kick Excuse up, me? it's Jarl! That's three goals in the space of, what, 15, 20 seconds? Yeah. I think there was some miscommunication. That's a, that, that's a fake by Com. I don't think he just missed that. And I don't I know think, if he, I don't I, know if I he think called it that was, out. I'm assuming it's both players, they thought each other were going to sit back for the fake, but instead they both went to the corner and really just parted the seas, so to speak, for that goal to go through. And my goodness, what a weird way to lose a lead, but... Can't be saying I'm too worried about St. Clair's chances. They got a minute 45 still to go. Uh, if I had to bet, I would imagine comms for U of A there say, somebody said, we take those. Because you, you will take anything St. Clair gives you. And it becomes, they'll make mistakes. As another one, Ketchup makes it 4-2. As Spoos misses on the save, they will make mistakes. The issue is, can you capitalize every time? That's what, that's what I think Taco means when he says you got to play perfectly against... St. Clair, they'll give you chances. You just have to literally finish every single one. Oh, 100%. And, and, that's a, and that is really what it is. You don't have to score every single time, but there are moments where it's your best opportunity you've seen, and if you don't take those, those are the ones that are going to cost you. Specknon, I love that play, but Comp is too smart for that. They're going to intercept and a two-goal lead out of nowhere off of some fantastically efficient striking. Is it going to continue because Scoots and Comp don't have that in... How the demo play really throwing a wrench in the gear of all these rotations from St. Clair. Jay was demoed as the third man, and to be honest, this is the first time that I've seen St. Clair really, in terms of just sheer energy on the back foot, they do not look like they have a clear answer for this. They're trying to answer back and still getting shut down. Two goal lead with 60 seconds. This is the best case anyone has made for a victory against St. Clair. The perfect time for a listen in, I think. Oh my god! Oh my god! Lucky, actually. Yeah, yeah. That's the luckiest play of your life right there, I'm not gonna lie. Got pinned. I'm not gonna keep a buck at you with you, bro. Like, that's the best play. I'll stay back. Go left, go left. Okay, someone stay net this time. Okay, this is in. Score that. You're nervous. Be ready. Be ready. Oh, I got bombed. Oh, he's gonna give it to me. Yeah. Oh fuck! I got oh, I got it. Take a bit, right? I'm on it. Nice. 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 N
Nice. All good. Yeah, yeah I'll go. Nice. Oh, nice. I'm, going. Uh, I'm gonna free. I'm going to you. Down. Cannot. I got it. Wait, flip. Yeah. Nice. He's got 50. Oh my. That's us. Nice. Mid right. Good job. 50, I think. Yeah. So I got it. Okay. You read it, Ben? Okay. He's got, he's got, oh, game oh, four, good. game four. Oh my goodness. Well, 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 Max, what do we have here? Oof, this is, a, that's a tough one. That's a tough one to see, but wow. honestly, for all of Canada, I think we can all rally right behind how U of A must be feeling right now, taking a game off St. Clair. You don't see that every day. No, and it was a matter of capitalizing on those mistakes. I just want to say, before we move on, the proliferation of the word sus these days is so weird because that's what, like, <laughs> that was my nickname in, like, sports growing up. That My last name is Sussman. People would always call me sus. Before that was, like, a thing. Just, you know, I, I just, I kept wanting to, like, respond. They said that during their, during, during that listen-in. Which would be, uh, awkward. Because I'm not 100% sure they can't hear me. I don't know. I don't know what's going on in the back end of things. I mean, yeah, like we said going in, you got to play perfect to even take a game off this team. And that was, you know, they gave up three goals. I wouldn't call it a perfect, perfect game for U of A, but they took the chances that St. Clair presented to them and they turned them into five goals. Catch up with the with the double race, the four goal game on eight shots. And they, they controlled the pace of play for the most part in this one. You love to hear those St. Clair clearly feeling confident. Even until that, basically until that sec, that 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 fifth goal went in. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure how much they were paying attention to the idea of how often have they actually gotten three O's and how infrequently they're going to be taken farther than that. But you can hear him at the end. That goal went in from Ketchup to seal the deal, and I believe it was Cobb who just said, "Well, well, well, game four. <laughs> Here we go. Something somewhat refreshing. Let's see if it's going to be something equally refreshing for UAB. They got a little bit of momentum, some confidence, as we mentioned." Not necessarily shooting 100% of their shots in, but enough to be able to break through that tough St. Clair D. Another fake. I mean, we also got confirmation, by the way, that you were exactly correct about what happened on that uh, on that kickoff goal. Hey, somebody stay in net this time. <laughs> yeah, th that's normally what happens is both players are like, okay, you got it. Nah, you got it. And then suddenly you realize that you are in a heap of trouble. And now if you're St. Clair, you're dealing with a U of A team that's kind of starting to feel themselves after a win in game three. They still have to get, they have to reverse sweep, but you did hear them call it when we listened into them during game two. A little reverse sweep coming on. I don't know who said it. They're starting to really feel it. As Jay will just put a shot on, ask a question. Ketchup's got the answer. If from comp means. U of A can break out, kind of. Catch up, wants to pass. Specknon wisely probably backs off that one. Pitch down in the corner. We haven't seen the. This to me is a sign of a uh, of good clean team play when you just don't see a lot of balls in the corner sitting there for a long time. If you're offense or defense, you just don't want the ball there generally. Pop out in front of the net, and it can also just like stall out an offensive rush if the team with the ball. I haven't seen a lot of that. I just kind of noticed that because we did see it for a few seconds there. Uh, but we are starting to see some frantic play, namely Ketchup. They were the really, the uh, quarterback kind of in the pocket, just picking out their shots, picking out all their touches. And honestly, played very well last game. However, they've had a couple touches where I feel like they had space maybe to work with and said they're just trying to throw it across, go for a pass, try to extend it. The, the play, the issue is, is that St. Clair's not always there to actually defend it. So you want to make sure you keep possession. You're not just throwing things away, kind of like you are right there, but I was able actually to read that oh, touch around pass. and dish it to Jay. Jay just denied. So UAB playing well on offense and still holding down pretty well on defense as well. We have it. It's been a couple. I, I want to say not since last series have we seen a true Jay pop off. No time like a, like a, an elimination game coming off their first loss in at least six months against Canadian Collegiate Championship Tournament like level play. Jarl puts that off the crossbar. Jarl's starting to wrestle with that fourth defender. Um, pass it up ahead. Wants Spoods, who wants the double tap. Couldn't find the shooting angle. Somehow got locked onto a top player game after he got that one. Tough to call that one. As there's a shot, that's an easy call to make. 
Spoons has scored, and it's one nothing. And look at Comp using the play so effectively, just getting a free flip. And honestly, I feel Jarl is trying to get onto that, and the flip reset is completely taking them out of the play. You want to pressure quickly. You want to force them to do something with it. The problem is when they play the perfect touch with the ball immediately, then you kind of already used your move. If, you're, if you jump and then the player gets the reset, you're done. All they have to do is execute. There's not a lot of adjustment you can make if you've already jumped. That is what happened there. It's one nothing. St. Clair, will they park the bus? Will they pour it on? We've seen them pour it on in these elimination games. Oh, comp for, I don't even know. Is that called an, in, is that called an insane tap? What's the word? Uh, a psycho? A psycho tap. That's not really. You got to go hit it off your own backboard for that. Spoods wants a pass. Jay is there. The hook shot is money. It's two nothing. Yeah, and it's not much to write home about. It's really just a simple play of Spoots, understanding the gap in the field and playing it past Ketchup, who almost feels like they read that one, but they're going to watch that just so tantalizingly creep past their back bumper and going to be the easiest putback of the game so far from Jay. We haven't seen pop off, but they're still where they need to be. And granted, I think they'll take that right now. Under two minutes now, a full two-minute push. Gonna have to go in from Alberta, which is tough because St. Clair, they're really getting experimental. That one, nearly a doomsday dish off the pass from Spoots from Comp. Specknon with a flip reset, some interference on the goalie, and yet Jay standing firm in the backfield, getting the touch and this clear. That backboard, they've kept it clean pretty much every time I've ever seen them play. Spoots is looking for it again. Couldn't find it, but he's gonna get a second kick at the can. Comp with the save. Oh my goodness. I wish we were in comms right now. That was a phenomenal team save by Tom there. I would clip that if I were him. It was like, that's almost uh, something. You're just trolling him. It's like, oh, I'm going to steal yeah. this from you. And then you save it, and you're like, man, I really hope we don't lose this game by one or something. <laughs> Got to make sure that close that game out, because that sometimes can't happen if you're trying mm -hmm. to play around too much. But I think they can afford themselves a little bit of lightheartedness. I've seen some comebacks here. I have not seen a two goal against them, so. Right now, they are just pressing this ball as quickly as possible, and of course, stealing all the boost. Comp going all the way across and getting the back pass. 35 seconds left. Catch up. Misses the touch. Jarl demoed in the backfield. That pretty much spells doom. As Comp scores the third goal of the game, and frankly, they probably didn't even need it because they had time on their side. St. Clair all but punching their ticket to the grand finals here. I think this series has proved that gods can bleed, but they're still gods. They're very hard to defeat because of that. So it's going to be looking like a 3-1 victory for them, cashing their way into a grand finals. Honestly, would not have seen this coming. St. Clair in a grand finals in a Canadian-only tournament? I, I don't, honestly, I bet a lot of people are, are shocked even. I'm not going to say I called it, but also I called it when the bracket was posted before. Back <laughs> on with the team save. As Jay, just play out the string here. Finally, as you said, somebody has made St. Clair bleed. And it wasn't the St. Clair Saints gold squad, their, their, their B team, so to speak. It was U of A playing, in my opinion, the best Rocket League I've ever seen U of A play. There was a little bit of luck involved. You always need a little bit of luck. You need the other team to make, at this level, you need to play well. You need the other team to make mistakes. That's just kind of how it goes. And it becomes a game of who makes the fewest mistakes. St. Clair plays incredibly clean Rocket League. They really do. And I think the biggest thing for me is just that every single player is a complete, I would say, game-changing level of player. If you put them on any other roster, they'd probably be the best player on that roster. And I think that really shows in it, all these intermittent passing plays or breakout moments where it's just a one-on-one, -on -one, they have an open air dribble. Sometimes you're thinking, ah, I don't think that player has uh, really the ability to get past me. But no, if you leave any of them alone, they're going to get an air dribble. It's going to cause chaos. And I think that due to everyone being a weapon, you can't take any days off. And I think during that victory, Alberta was able to capture that exact moment of challenging when they need to, getting quality 50s, overwhelming offense, and not over committing. And sometimes you don't know how to replicate that. And it's just so difficult to do. So congrats getting that first game win, but not going to uh, sweet up the bitter feeling of having to now go to lowers. In the lower side of the bracket, UBC Gold has defeated Carlton. Waterloo has defeated UBCO. So our loser's semis is going to be UBC Gold 
for the third time on stream. We'll see the Waterloo Warriors for our first time today. And if Waterloo can win these next two matches as we head to the lowers for the for this stream before we get back to the top of the grand finals, we might have end up ended up being right in our early day prediction and expecting to see Waterloo up against St. Clair. Uh, they have a chance. They can they can like I said, if they can beat UBC, then they get U of A. And U of A is gonna have to sit here and watch. Maybe get a little bit cold. You never know. That's what the lowers are looking like. And that's coming up in, in, in just a bit here at the 7-Eleven Canadian Collegiate Rocket League Championships. Check out the uh, check out 7-Eleven's Coffee Bar 2.0. Every cup is made your way every time because you make it. You do it yourself. You get all the extras you want and none that you don't. They're not going to throw like weird sweetener at you if you don't ask for it or do it yourself. Variety of hot and cold coffees to choose from. We'll always get the perfect cup every time because again you make it yourself so if you don't get the perfect cup it's your fault coffee bar 2.0 is uh, available at select stores find a store near you at 711.ca uh, 7-11.ca taco coming up next we got that matchup ubc gold waterloo after the break just when you thought our crispy classic chicken couldn't get any better We created the new barbecue bacon chicken sandwich, a crave-worthy sandwich made fresh in select stores daily. Chicken worth crossing the road for. Visit 7-Eleven.ca to find a crispy classic chicken store near you.
50 50 on the scoreboard. Oh boy, it's almost. Uh, man, I try my best here to just try, man. Yeah, that is a thing of beauty right there. And that is the. That's marker of a team that's going to win a whole bunch if they just seem to be. But comp streaking in and trying to get a connection on that. They didn't get all of the ball. They got underneath it instead and just sent it in the same direction but way faster. And that's Welcome back to the 7-Eleven Canadian Collegiate Rocket League Championships. I'm Max. With me is Danger Taco. Taco, we got eight of the top universities from across the country in this tournament. A bunch of them are already done. We're down to our final four. We're into the uh, losers semis. UBC Gold up against Waterloo. Go Rocks Go. Sporting the RLCS Season 6 contender tag. And don't forget, don't forget. This tournament is not just sponsored by 7-Eleven. The game of Rocket League is, is, has, has a deep partnership with 7-Eleven. Scan and go to unlock exclusive in-game Rocket League content items with 7 Rewards. Join 7 Rewards at tgs.gg slash 7 Rewards. There's all sorts of items in the game, some of which you may even see in this series. Certainly something I would love to be using because I really do like the look of them and I don't like the look of that defense. Go Rocks Go is kind of just going to high step their way into an open net. And we, we mentioned, you know, kind of the way to hit that next level in Collegiate Rocket League is have somebody who's a pro level player on your team. That is who Go Rocks Go is for Waterloo. They've been able to uh, work their way through rival series contention and also being able to I think, fill a sub role or um, within a season five or season six, and so it's been a while, but still a very good player. And obviously, why Waterloo is always talked about. And we see these deeper runs into CRL qualifiers or a lot of these different tournaments. They were, in fact, my favorite to be able to take down the side of St. Clair uh, if there was a worthy warrior to represent the rest of Canada. But at least for right now, as we saw, they're here in the lower semis. And we're gonna have to pull out a victory here to even get a shot at that. Vervin at a decent look at goal, but shot left a lot to be desired. Winner of this will play the team that upset Waterloo in round one, University of Alberta, squad in Edmonton. We've seen, I don't know if I've seen St. Clair versus Waterloo, I'm sure I have, but just fresh in my mind was St. Clair against another team built like Waterloo, that's the LSU squad with Ajax, and they made quick work of them. I believe it was 4 0. It can, be, it can be a weird time when you're trying to go those cross-region uh, mm -hmm. example t games, and it can be very strange to adjust to it, but both teams uh, playing against each other fairly well. It might be 1-0, but very much so. UBC Gold knocking on the door. A lot of these shots, a lot of close drop-downs in front of net, and it seems like only a matter of time before they are able to break through. How about this one from Fervent over the top and under the bar? What a shot from Fervent. The one, the, the one touch... The one-touch counterattack, basically. You know, Frodo got that off the backboard, but Fervin was right there, touched it in his own defensive third, right into the net. And shout out to whatever this West server is, because it is the perfect server. You know, I was worried with some of these East-West matchups, Waterloo being in Ontario. Yeah. Um, and, and UBC, obviously, being in BC. Low 70s to, to high 50s for, uh, for Waterloo. Mid to high 50s for UBC. Nobody's going to be able to complain about this server, which is ideal for online Rocket League tournaments. And, and it's uh, something that sometimes players can be very particular about, but 
mm -hmm. for good reason, especially when you're playing for money, never mind when it's just for ranked. Nothing's worse than losing a game because suddenly the ball jiggles off of someone's car and you can't react to it, so making sure that does not happen is oh so important for that competitive integrity, and it's important to make sure you hit these shots with some venom. Virus, not able to get that one to go. Long clear back for Vanilla Rain to gather and keep on looking for that go-ahead as we cross half time, and looks like Frodo is not going to be able to provide that spark. Couple of classic feeler outer goals here to start this one. A full let, full field pinch or a clear goal for Fervent. And just an open net walked in by Go Rocks Go. We have not seen Waterloo on stream. His teammates, Taco mentioned, Virus and Vanilla Rain. Amazing name, Vanilla Rain. Ooh. That shot saved by Go Rocks. Frodo putting that one on, and it was uh, not a soft shot. Ski with the melted brain addendum to his name. Maybe a long day for Ski. Ski's also doing the grad program, I think. He's been a part of this UBC program for quite some time. Hopefully, hopefully he's graduated. Or I guess maybe I've met him when he was 18. I don't know. <laughs> Go Rocks with the control. We'll clear this one away, but a dunk by Go Rock sets up Virus, but everybody up! Fire drill for UBC. That might cost him. It does. Vanilla Rain makes it 2-1. I mean, credit to Mr. Melted Brain almost actually getting back to this, you know, being able to jump, miss, and then land and nearly get the contact, but it's only going to deflect in as that one certainly went by the wayside very, very quickly for UBC. Waterloo will be happy with that, slowly absorbing pressure, and then timing is right. Able to bust through the defense with some well-timed 50s. And now it's... This is much about clock management as it is trying to defend their net. Frodo is going to go for a bump. It's right into Fervent. It's, yeah, got to mark that guy. You know how deadly he can be. Fervent is just always there. Wherever there may be, that's where you can find Fervent. Just, just finds himself in the right place so often. Such a fast player into the air. That was just a straight-up drag race. Well, a dogfight, it was a race in the air. Fervent won it. I don't know if there's a name for that. What's that Red Bull event? What's that event where they do like plane racing? It's that. Whatever that is, that's what that was. Damn. Well, get on it. That's a new game mode. If we, <laughs> if we work hard enough at it, but that's for Unreal Engine 5. It's not for this series yeah. because I'm sure these guys would like to keep it somewhat on the ground, somewhat controlled, and see if they can build something more organic as a virus. It's into Vanilla Rain, no contact, but Roto is looking less than confident on this air dribble. They're going to get Reflected and Vanilla Rain in the middle. Ski gently out into the corner, and it seems like everyone has gone back to the corner and been able to try to figure out some different strategy on the way through. Rox will just win this 50 hard. Oh, rough touch. Vanilla Rain took it away from him, nearly made a scoring opportunity out of it himself. This ball still in a dangerous position. You guys couldn't see it, but I was on Vanilla Rain's cam, and there was a Classic, just missing the boost and missing the boost and missing the boost again and going back for the fourth time and got it. Just makes me feel good to see players of this caliber also have the same struggles that I do sometimes in Rocket League. <laughs> As we see overtime here in game one of this loser's semi. Both of these teams already securing top four to, to medal, so to speak. They're gonna make their way into the top three. They've got a U of A team coming off a, 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 a loss, but a game win against St. Clair, waiting for them in the losers' finals. I will, you know, I've said it a couple times, but this is the best I've seen U of A look, and this is with Specknon just banging it off the crossbar. It feels like 50 times today. Yeah, it's certainly a dangerous team to face off against, and I don't think either team is excited at the prospect, but it's going to be pumped at being able to get farther in this tournament and. Now with both these teams, you can feel that elimination is on their mind. You do not have any more lives. You're going to be kicked out of this bracket if you lose here. And oh. so and naturally, you're going to play cautious, but eventually someone's going to take that lunge. It's Go Rocks for the win. Call him Score Rocks. Score the way you played in this game. 3-2. Go Rocks with the first goal and the final goal for Waterloo. They go up 1-0. Oh, and the flex. The tag. You gotta flex the tag if you got it, but it feels particularly flexy in a uh, collegiate tournament. It's especially flexy, but I think there, it's a double-sided thing. I know a lot of 
my, my good friend, JG7, uh, coach for Rick's GG, has a blue tag for mm -hmm. helping RLCS coaching. And whenever you pop off, people are like, yeah, good job, blue tag, let's go. And the moment you struggle, everyone's like, you really, you have a blue tag? Yeah. So it, it is a little bit tough. But granted, when you're GoRocks, that's not often that you're going to underperform. They're, they're going to pop off and continue to be one of the top performers in that lobby, just like they were in that last one. So tough break for UBC, tie game all the way into overtime, but eventually something had to give. I queued into recently Mitz, I believe, is the coach of uh, Sandrock Gaming. Mm -hmm. And I it was in a, in a casual lobby. I came in, it was two bots at Mitz, and he was up 2-1, and the other team was still talking smack. <laughs> <laughs> Every time he missed the fall, so yeah. I mean, in a competitive lobby, you're not, you don't have to worry about that. Ski, we get underway here in, a, in game number two. Shot from Virus a little, a little slow, to really trouble UBC. Virus now dunked by Ski. We'll just put it on target. Miller Rain, not much of a touch there, but stays relevant behind that ball. Able to eventually clear it away all by his lonesome. There's no rock. Up for it. Probably wanted to double tap off the wall. It'll turn into a pass. Vanilla Rain. Near perfect shot. Yeah, near perfect. Near perfect. perfect. Yeah. This ain't horseshoes, and that's not a goal. Oh, I was about to say near perfect, but here comes Virus with the correction. But no, that was also off the post, just on the other side. Unfortunately, that is going to be the fourth uh, player rearing its ugly head yet again and rescuing UBC from falling behind, but Vanilla Rain gonna set up their teammate and then immediately half rotate. I don't think Ski recognized that. They're no longer Melted Brain on, on the their name tag, at least for me. So maybe the Brain has had time to recover, which is useful because they are very much on the back foot as they're taking laps left and right, trying to keep their goal line clear. He refroze his brain, he solidified it. Yeah, you're right, I don't. he changed his name. He's feeling better after game one. Irvin a little heavy on that first touch means Virus can win the race, and it just becomes a 50 instead of a serious scoring opportunity. That ball high off that pinch. Ski will should have won that race. Virus got there. It looked like Ski might have just misread it. Because he was first up. He was real quick. Through about a game and a half. Waterloo Taco didn't like the just the faster team in this matchup. And this is something that I was able to witness uh, watching some Nace Star League action. They were uh, one of the streamed matches. I was so uh, graciously uh, able to accept casting. And uh, honestly, they were impressing me with how fast they are, how consistent they are. Virus is actually a player that, of course, all the attention really goes to Gorox. But Virus has a pop-off potential. They are always getting quality touches with the tip of that Dominus. And Vanilla Rain is a quality stand-in as well. There are no weak spots. It is only strengths. It's just about making sure oh. they're consistent. And as we can see, UBC, they don't need much. They just need Fervin. Yeah, I mean, this has been the way UBC has, getting, has been getting their goals for the most part. Just win a couple challenges, find a 2v1, pass around that goalie. Fervin. I mean, the, when we saw UBC at their best earlier today, it was because Fervin was popping off. Frodo and Ski are incredibly consistent players. I would say Fervin's got the most variance to his game, and when Fervin's playing well, this UBC team, totally different animal. That ball 50, it's gonna come back to the center. Proto's gotta go, and now Ski needs a touch. Stuck on the draw on the bar there. That's the worst place to be in the corner of your own net on the goes where you can't jump or drive. Woof. Virus wanted a backflip shot. Didn't find the touch, but Go Rocks will just dunk it over, and Ski's touch not strong enough. It's 1-1. One, one. And something about these high-level players, they're so good at knowing exactly when to do this. Go Rocks cuts and then immediately bails. They know they can't beat that player, so they instead play the clear. And to be honest, everything went well for UBC. They did exactly what they needed to. They got in the way of the shot. They just didn't anticipate that Go Rocks had that sketched out from the beginning. And they, they right down to the to the goalie getting a touch on it, and you know, for the most part. That's kind of all you want in a desperation save situation is to just make a touch, but the momentum was not on their side. Ski was kind of going back into his net. Uh, 97 seconds left in this. Despite a very solid game from UBC Waterloo, right back into this tide. Villa Rain was looking to drop it down there to Virus. Couldn't find that last touch, and Ski will clear it away. 
going to be a brief 2v1. That's fervent. To Frodo. The shot is in. I think the server just exploded. That goal happened? I think in a literal okay. sense, yes. But maybe in the fantasy of them playing, I don't think it did because they feel very confused on what really transpired here. So that is incredibly unfortunate as the server's already repaired itself. Just every single person in the server got a spike of lag and I don't think the timing could have been worse than that. I, that was a wild goal for me. I don't know. I really couldn't tell you. I'm not going to analyze it. I have no idea what happened. I just saw the full explosion. Even I lag. I'm just spectating. That's, uh, yeah. Hmm. We're going to count it, I believe. No, uh, I've seen no comment from the match admin. This will be laid off the backboard up for Vanilla Rain, who's going to try to drop it to himself off the ceiling. But it doesn't end up making contact with the ceiling, so that lack of boost matters. Frodo gets it around one. As far as it goes, Vanilla Rain's shot has to be saved by Frodo. That turned into a scoring opportunity kind of out of nowhere. No rocks. Except that one before it come much. Frodo, is that in one bronze crown? There's an item. There's an item I have. Irvin, the fake. So hard to successfully fake your way into offense. Uh, in 3v3, though, the ski, hard dunk. Irvin needs to make the save, and he does. That one, stay up. Dangerous, zero seconds. Vanilla Rain gets one touch. He's only got five boost. That means UBC can get up for it. Iris will be center, looking for Gorok. He will need to make a touch. Gorok's will be able to control this. He'll opt for the pass. Ski is there. Vanilla Rain, this is a tough catch, and he's not going to make it. Fervent fakes it, all hits the ground, and it's 1-1. One, one. Honestly, last minute. Oh, that is a pain. That is a huge pain for them because this is especially weird because every single person experienced that lag, and then it immediately went away. So it's not a DC. It's not a, a anything strange. So at least for right now, Players looking like they're trying to petition mods for this, but I, I think that goal probably will stand. No one DC'd, the game did not end and or get glitched out. It's it's really just a temporary thing. I think that's just a very unfortunate event that tends to happen sometimes in online environments. Perfect with the all part of the game. I mean, it, it, yeah, it's an online tournament. I was actually talking about how good this server was ping-wise. It remains pretty even, but you can't uh, account for lag spikes, I guess. Um... I'm gonna, yeah. I mean, I don't see, I don't see a comment from a from a, from a moderator or a match admin. Um, <laughs> we go on. Is the word I'm getting? We're gonna count it. As a, it definitely does not seem like Waterloo is happy. One one on the series, but sometimes you play in these online tournaments. You gotta play on when stuff goes sideways. It is a tough thing. Uh, it's, it's hilarious that that didn't happen during the St. Clair lobby. For those of you who followed Jay on Twitter, a uh, historically hilarious ping <laughs> on their home PCs. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's many a clip of Jay getting a full clear and glitching through their car and going through. So uh, it felt like the, that play happened too late. That felt like that's deserved to happen to Jay, but instead it's going to unfortunately befall the side of Waterloo. And in such a close game, something like that making a difference, that's tough, but play on, you move on, and it's not the end of the series. You have a chance to fight back, and to be honest, the way that they're playing, I don't see there's any problem with them being able to shake that off and move on. Forget about fight back. It's a tied series. You're not, it's not like you're down. You're, you're very much still in this series. Uh, you don't even really need to fight. There's no comeback needed. You, know, you drop a game, it's a best of five. That's why we play series. Is, that specifically is why, especially in online, you can't, that's why best of ones are the worst. Apologies to the 12 Titans. Those tournaments were incredible, but the best of ones are rough. Go Rocks puts it on. What a shot from Go Rocks. Go playing with a little anger makes it one nothing. Yeah, I suppose a fight, a fight back, not necessarily the correct term to paint the picture I'm trying. Maybe bounce back, and I think that's the right way for Go Rocks <laughs> to start off the game. Putting that one with the booty, a hip check into the back post. That was, per that was a very well played shot. Second, second most perfectly placed shot in this tournament, I think. After that shot, we saw in the UBC, UBC U of A game, 
I believe. As close to the corner as possible without hitting post or crossbar. Think, Might have been Jay. Probably was Jay. I think it was Spoon. It's actually spike I think they spiked it into the ceiling and then the immediate fall mm -hmm. of their area yes. was just flawlessly placed. Yeah. And we've had some absolute clangers in this series in this tournament. Both in terms of power and precision. One nothing here for Waterloo. Double demo from Fervent. Momentary respite for UBC. Ski shot. Oh, what a save by Virus coming down out of an aerial. Who highlighted Virus as we started? Right. The attention's gonna obviously go to the player with the uh, with the blue blue tag, the name recognition, and go rocks go. But Virus playing on this Waterloo team has made a name for himself over the course of this collegiate cycle and uh, in this series as well. And some phenomenal defense. I like that pass from Mel Rain just lacked really the pace to bamboozle the defenders. And Mel Rain's gonna have to clean up from the backfield, but Frodo and company, they're getting the reads, they're not getting the touches, and Mel Rain will be able to try to escort this one down the line, but the continued pressure coming from UBC is making that incredibly difficult. They're still keeping that lead and trying to play patient for it. Go Rock setting up their own shot, and it's gonna meet the bar and out. We see. Can't really even afford to take a breath. A little bit of luck kept them at one at, at, at down one nothing. Luck on the part of Gorox Go just missing an open net. Fervent had a defender back there to meet his touch. What a play! What a play by Virus! Woo! Two nothing. Gorox the goal, but this was all Virus. And this touches I love getting underneath it, and then not only getting a touch, but having the aerial control on that. Really, that air roll in the midfield, and that's why you practice that. It's for improvisational plays like this to extend it and then knock around that last defender. They just were caught looking. They could do nothing about that infield. No rocks under the first challenge. 50's the second. Virus. We wisely turning away from that. It would have been a tough angle to score from. I can't get over that pass. Not only, not only the touch, but each of those touches beat a defender. One thing to get the touch is to get the touch when you need it to where you need it to go. Irvin's going to have to make a save going back towards his own net ski. Starting to feel like a lot of desperation for UBC. Waterloo's up 3 nothing. And this is that veteran experience from Gorox. Like this. They could have just front flipped this, but they know that's going to push it even closer to the defender. They know all they got to do is just say, hey, Virus, come get this in the back post. I don't think the defender's going to catch you. Yeah, that's what, that's what separates uh, players like you and I from players like Gorox. I 100% flip into that ball every time. Just give it away. That is a, a, a dunk by Virus, and your UBC you need a goal, and you need a goal now, or you got to start looking ahead to game four. Gorox feeling it in this game three, looking for the low double, can't find it. Rain. Control. The lack of our control there is will be fervent with the ball passing. Looking for Frodo, but turned into a shot. Fine line between a shot and a pass in the game sometimes. Just no rocks into the corner. Has pinched away by UBC. Big clears for UBC, but nobody on the other end of this. No counterattack really to speak of. They've been so good on the counterattack all tournament long. It's not the biggest gap, but it's got to feel huge when you are in the, uh, the uh, shape that UBC is right now. There's nine shots on the side of Waterloo and only two for UBC. That just shows how rarely they've made them break out of their half, and it's because of tenacious plays like that. Not leaving well enough alone, just the instant ego challenge, and for some reason, Vanilla Rain is lurking up field. Stump stay, stay dry, and others feel the pain. I'm glad you remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to, I tried not to like crack up on stream, but you got me with that one. <laughs> uh, you're, you're lucky. I'm in my 30s. I, you know, I think there's some. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there is. That is a reference that does not play to a wide demographic. <laughs> that is an, that is like an OG YouTube reference. That might even predate. Yeah. It's it's close. It's gotta be. That might have been an E bombs world video. <laughs> <laughs> As ski underdunked. 
Gorox, the lead man. What a Ooh. drop, Gorox, go! Oh my word! They did not take kindly to that server spike in game three, or in game two, rather. In this game three, they're leaving nothing to chance. Yeah, you know, it's a good goal when Ski's actually dropping a nice one. They appreciate quality when they see it, and they understand this game got out of hand if you are UBC. And to be honest, this feels, this feels almost karmic if you are University of Waterloo. You're really upset with how that goal goes through in the last game. And I said they wanted to bounce back. How about that? 5-0 as we're ticking down the seconds here in game number three, trying to put themselves on the best possible foot forward. Try to close the series out in the next five minutes and can't ask for better performance like this. Led by Gorox Go, but everyone getting involved with the goal and everyone playing a part and a dominant victory to put them on match point. At this point, you don't even want to give up a goal as they don't, as that is the final score at 5 nothing Taco. Sometimes you're like, ah, yeah, you guys can score a zero second. I don't care. This was a point of contention, this game. You could tell from the get-go how badly Waterloo wanted that. I have disconnected the server, so I'll be right back. <laughs> Sorry, that, that's why you heard me starting to stutter there a little bit. Um, I mean, the way that the way that they played in that game, sometimes you, there's not body language in Rocket League, but there's car language. You can tell the way somebody's moving around the pitch, oftentimes how they're feeling. People can play angry in this game, and you can tell. I can tell immediately in that game. It is it is interesting to see just the confidence of team that know that they are the ones that are dictating the pace of the play, that the other team is waiting for their go. They don't feel confident and challenge them immediately. And so you get in weird situations, and I think that's what I'm seeing from Waterloo. They look 100% on every single challenge. There's no hesitancy. And honestly, that can be the killer of so many teams. They try to overthink it, and you can fight against that instinct. The moment you do that tends to be a slower, less methodical game. And, so that's definitely something that I like to see from Waterloo. However, UBC, I mean, we've seen them bounce back from a lot of games that they have looked kind of ugly in, and they're a team that really likes to play with momentum, play with our hearts. So let's see if that's going to be another storyline opening up. I uh, didn't realize the game had already started when I clicked rejoin, so glad nobody scored during that weird lag spike that happens when somebody joins the lobby. We can keep it moving. Is this ball into the corner? It'll be... Fervent, no, it's Ferdo, sorry, with the ball. Everybody with the, with the F names. These two F names, I can, I, I gotta really see them to discern them. Go Rocks will clear this into the corner. Fervent pops it high. That's gonna be a goal. Virus is right there. Go Rocks off of that pop from Fervent. First person to the ball beats Ski. Frodo beats Fervent, or and Virus beats Fervent. I've disconnected from my brain when I. Up. One nothing the score here, water to the lead. It's a good job by Virus being able to hop right on it, but it is started by Gorox, and they're going for that ball, not necessarily to beat over the offensive player, but or defensive player rather. It's just to make sure that they're sweating on that read. They needed fervent up for it, and not gonna be able to follow suit. This one they are, and Gorox will then be able to collect on the loose ball. Vanilla Rain spiking it in. Virus on the follow through. It's gonna go wide. It did have the pace, bumps in the backfield, and fervent able to just focus up enough to allow Frodo to tee off from that touch, though their creative play off the ceiling is not going to pay dividends. one nothing the score here. Remaining for Waterloo, who can move on to the, to the uh, loser's finals here. Try to get revenge for that first round defeat against U of A. Both of these teams, in fact, dropped down to the loser's bracket after playing U of A. So somebody's going to have a chance at revenge. Ski will play it into the corner. Oh, oh and that's a shot on goal. That came out of nowhere. I wasn't even ready for it. Yeah, I don't, I don't think really anyone was ready for that one. That is, that is a <laughs> tough one to give up. And honestly, it's all about how you bounce back. So I'm kind of curious to hear, hear actually how they're bouncing back with a little wa a water to be listening. Mid dude. I got bumped. I can tell you. No, no foot, no foot. Okay. I'm back go. low. Yeah, I'll play this. He's got it. He's I got back right. Ah, uh, he's shot. Yeah. Off. Yeah. My bad. Actually, I'm ready. My bad. I, just, I was so useless this whole play. Dude, the shot was... Actually, I'm moving places. Was it? Yeah. I'll cheat. 
Let me lift. Try to put left. I'm there. I'll go left. Time again. Nice. Cool. Nice. One up. One up. Fake, fake. Okay. Nice. Oh, oh my god. Oh my yeah. god. You're the greatest player of all time. Did you even have boost? Was that a boost? Literally in their head. That was the last part of boost I had. That was actually funny. Correct. Oh my goodness. I love how confident they are. The greatest player in the world for that touch. And it's always good to hype up your team, especially because a well worked goal from UBC answered back with an equally nice one. Did he say. Did I hear Virus say that was the last fart of boost I had? That's what I heard, but we'll never really know. That's going to have to be something we're asked later. I'm, uh, I'm going to incorporate that into my Rocket League jargon either way. Because A, it makes sense, and B, that's just incredible. <laughs> as Virus will take control of this ball, and as you mentioned before the series started, Taco, Virus, the X factor in this one for Waterloo, UPC took a little bit of a brief lead there. On some uh, oh. surprising goals, some goals that materialize out of nothing as Virus misses the net. Which you hate to see. If you're uh, Waterloo, you don't love to see goals kind of coming in unexpected ways. I really see having to work too hard for him, but it was a briefly held lead as Ski will drop it down. Frodo, I believe Frodo and Fervent collided there. That would have been a shooting opportunity. For the young Hobbit, as this is almost an open net, Fervent respawns at the right time. Ooh, Frodo avoiding that demo, but gonna get met by Ella Rain. Virus into Frodo. Bit of interplay. It's a lot of awkward bounces, but no real reads yet. Fervent, I think they might have been looking for the pass for Ski, but either way, it's gonna go well over both our teammates. and. Touch is not going to help him either because Dorox is chasing it down. Good save, but only temporary. Vanilla Rain, they have a flip reset. They use it, but no contact. I'd like to see the mechanics busting out from the Waterloo third, but going to have to keep on searching for a way through. Still a tie game. This is where UBC lives. These, like, awkward, this just awkward space. But the, it, it, it's a tough place to live because it can, it can bite you as well as it can bite the other team. Vanilla Rain drops it. We're gonna get that second touch off the backboard and Frodo was there along with Fervent. Which means Fervent's gonna have to recover that. Nearly a shooting opportunity for Virus. Ski oh. could not get much on that shot. Just the early flip. Flip timing there. Austin Ski, probably a goal. Ski is lost in the sauce a little bit here. The final minute of play. Heading, trudging towards overtime. 2-2. Two -two. Virus still has control for Waterloo. Pinches at center, stopped by Ski. Short of the goal mouth. Oh, what a bounce. Really, really paid off there for UBC. Got, getting a lucky bounce off that the corner where the floor meets the wall. Good connect. Miller Rain as we get underway in OT. Shot. I just like that interplay, but you can almost see the caution starting to settle in from Waterloo. I think the reality is starting to dawn on them at times where this is not going to be an easy series. We're not really the ones pushing everything forward, well, so they got to be careful. But so too does UBC. <laughs> I thought that was wide, but that was much closer than I actually had anticipated. Fervent trying to serve up Frodo, Vanilla Ray, and quickly to his Gorox bailed out. It's not a true double commit. And all Ricochet right on down for Gorox, Virus, and Vanilla Rain to move up in symphony with each other. It's uh, going to be a very interesting prospect here into this overtime. We know how it ended last time we got here. Oh, nearly again, Virus. Just can't quite find the placement. It was near perfect, but near perfect in Rocket League. It's a miss. It's just as, it's just the same kind of miss as missing the net entirely as Vanilla Rain puts it in, and that's the series. It felt this overtime, it just felt like a matter of time. You said Waterloo wasn't just going to be the ones controlling the pace of play. They did in the overtime. One minute, five seconds of extra Rocket League. Waterloo has clinched their spot, which was final.
And that's going to be a huge confidence booster. I wasn't convinced at times from Waterloo. I, I think they could have been playing better, but then over time, it really won me over. The challenges were clean. They're looking for passes. They're going for bump plays. And I think that varied approach is exactly what you need when you want to move farther and farther into this tournament. And they will be able to do that, clenching in that victory. And to be honest, this could have actually been a sweep. Their one loss did come at the tail end of really just an unpredictable lag spike. So in a way, I almost want to count this as a sweep, but UBC, they did hold in there. Those are a couple one-goal games throughout the series. Waterloo will get a shot at redemption. They lost 3-2 in the opening round to the University of Alberta in a, in a match that we kind of assumed they were going to win, to be perfectly honest. They will get a chance here in the Losers' Finals to make good on that. The winner of that one go on to play St. Clair in the Grand Finals. Don't forget to deck your Rocket League car out with six exclusive 7-Eleven items in this game. Snag these custom in-game items by uh, completing snacking streaks uh, through your 7-Eleven, through your 7 Rewards app. Every time you scan a product in one of your streaks, you'll be one step closer to completion. You want more details? Go to the website, 7-11.ca. Taco, before we, hit, before we get, uh, I mean, we're getting ready for this, for this next series. We're not going to break in between. No rest for the wicked. No rest for Waterloo, as we see. I mean, that was th these goals from Go Rocks Go are. Uh, this is this is why we uh, why we highlighted Go Rocks. And here's the lag goal right there. That's the lag goal. That's the goal. That was the point of contention in this series. Waterloo versus U of A. We didn't get to see what the matchup looked like, but since we have some time, let's do some predictions. What do you got? Oof, putting me in hot seat there i gotta say well, I'll, I'll also predict don't worry i'll be in the hot oh, seat no 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 but like that's the thing is that this was something even before the tournament we were saying hey alberta waterloo i'm looking through and i'm saying you know i think st Clair has a great chance obviously of winning this the whole thing but honestly really impressed by waterloo and then they lost to the team they are now facing off you mentioned revenge and I think they get this. I'm going to stick with Waterloo, although I will say Alberta has been playing so well. I think regardless of what it is, we're in for a fantastic lower final to determine who's going to be going up to the grand. Do they, you know, keep that hot hand is the question. You know, U of A fully in hot hand mode going into the going, you know, going into that matchup with St. Clair. They took a game off St. Clair. Now they've been sitting. They sat for that whole series. And it's, you know... Who knows what they were doing? They probably, you, you can't really you can queue a couple games of ranks. You can't really start a full on scrim. How do you stay warm? You know, you just you get some water, you maybe eat a little bit of food, but it's really easy to, to un, unzone in Rocket League. To lose that flow state really doesn't take much. No, and that's the difficult part of trying to figure out the way through as uh, we're trying to make sure that everyone is available and make sure that everyone is able to contribute into these games. But then I think the main thing you need to focus on right here is just focusing on that this is only one step of two. You have to make sure yeah. you figure out what you're doing correctly, how what your strengths are, and how to really take advantage of the weaknesses of the other team. Some teams leave the backboard open a bit more often than they need to. Maybe they rotate too far back. It leaves the midfield open for infield passes. Whatever that is, you need to make sure you read it quickly because teams like St. Clair, you're going to have to perfect those uh, reads on the field. You're going to have to perfect those game plans before you take to the grand finals, and this is the final test before you're able to actually move on that gauntlet. These teams are uh, in the lobby, but not quite ready for our losers finals. I'm going to go U of A. Since I told you I'd make a prediction, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see this go five. And from there, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see it go either way at this point. Um, but the way, the way that U of A is looking today, I don't think that Waterloo played a particularly clean series against UBC, who we've talked about as just a tough team to play against. Um, it's hard to play like a perfect series when you just got Frodo all over you, or Fervent rather, all over you all the time. And it, it, it doesn't... Uh... Oh, Ski's still in this lobby. That's why. That's why. <laughs> you're, trying to, you're trying to get people in, but I, I was counting in my head. I was like, why? And this might be just a thing that Ski takes a loss and says, oh, I guess I'll go get food. And then they're just sitting there AFK in the server. So uh, hopefully that doesn't mean we have to restart everything, but uh, hopefully they're able to recognize their mistake and uh, amend for that. But 
Yeah, this is, uh, once we get everyone in, this is, in a way, is adding even more time on, because yes, these teams have been waiting for a bit to get in, and I think uh, that's actually one of the hidden difficulties of playing in tournaments. It's one thing to be in the upper side, and you're just playing, 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 yeah. you're constantly hot, but the moment you have to go to lowers and then adjust to waiting for your opponent is, it can be brutal, because you do have to cool down, so to speak. Uh, you don't want to be just grinding out ranked and keeping yourself warm for five, six hours. Sometimes, good to get a snack and good to refresh, whether or not it's going to hurt them on the warm-up game. I suppose we'll see in game one. <laughs> you see the Waterloo Warriors, the University of Alberta eSports, but that's, uh, what are they called? They're called the, no, Calgary's the Dinos. Alberta, the U of A Bears is their, like, official traditional sports team mascot, though. I would assume this is the U of A eSports club, so not an official, you know, U of A sponsored team the way the St. Clair is, I believe, the way Waterloo is, because the Warriors are the name of that team. Uh, a lot of these, a lot of these schools, as we talked about, you know, with the exception of St. Clair and, and the odd, the odd other CRL teams, it's club sports, right? It's you know, you do it yourself. I know Fervent and Ski kind of run the game for UBC Rocket League. It's just kind of self-organized, self-run. As we are ready to go, finally, Taco here. In the losers' finals, U of A, Waterloo. We just saw Waterloo. U of A has been sitting. We get the lightning. Maybe we're not ready. Who's not in here? What's going on? We're still waiting for one for University of Waterloo. I think we're just trying to make sure everyone can actually join up. Problem is, is uh, everyone is dancing because I think we keep thinking someone's in, and now they actually are. So uh, it was now everything, yeah, now everything is fine. Uh, I wasn't gonna name the Max. I don't want to name and well, blame. It them. wasn't his fault. It was Ski's <laughs> fault. It is true. Ski Everyone in chat blame Ski right now. Write angry letters. DM them. Actually, don't do that. Don't cyberbully Ski. They're a good no. guy. And their D job is done. DDoS Ski. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. As we are underway. Much ado about pretty much nothing. This was just lobby space. As Virus right off the bat makes it one nothing. Call it a kickoff goal five seconds in. No Rain doing a great job of faking out Jarl. They can only backflip in place because they're playing for a 50, but there's no 50. It's just going to be a tap right in the middle and a good goal five seconds in. And uh, I mean, we were talking about hot hands. How about that one? Starting off a brand new series, the same amount of efficiency. You know, one thing we can be for certain is Waterloo is going to be the more warm of these two teams coming off a very contested, about, about as close as you'll see a 3-1 series being. They pat the pass out to Virus. Virus, that been even bigger than his dominus hit uh, hitbox throughout these two series we've seen on stream. Get about Go Rocks Go. It's been the virus show. And when I say that, I mean Go Rocks. Virus is a revelation to me. I think this is the first time I've seen him play. I haven't. I don't think I've watched any of the any of the recent CCA stuff. No, I haven't. I've watched some CRL this year. But I don't know if I've seen Virus play, but boy. This is a serious squad. Yeah, Waterloo certainly knocks on the door when it comes to a lot of CRL qualifier events. They get pretty deep in the bracket. You can see why everybody on UAV anticipating a hard shot from a weird angle. What are they going to do about it? The tap down from Vanilla, the other follow through from Gorox and Virus immediately on it, nearly pre-jumping it with that much speed. You don't want to talk about Rocket League rules, rule one, the first rule. To me, rule two. I know there's an actual rule too, but to me, like the thing that I always say most often is the best pass, the missed shot off the near post. Go Rocks Go proving that with that assist. That's just going to find its way in. What is that goal? Specton makes it 2 1. Rule 3. That came out of nowhere. The best, go <laughs> the best shot sometimes are on open nets because somehow <laughs> these players are not touching that ball. Virus, I think honestly, I'm going to chalk that up to them getting the perfect read on the shot, but. Instead of going forward, it goes up. And so mm -hmm. instead, their read is just a whiff. Yeah, turn it into a lob shot. The best shot's not always the hardest shot. Sometimes you want to throw a change up. Rule four. <laughs> <laughs> They're all rules. We're writing commandments today, I think. That's what we're doing. <laughs> right on the stone tablet, yes. <laughs> Catch up. That's a tough pass. A tough touch, but luckily for him, Specton is there. Solid. All control here from U of A. You're not, if you're going to make a touch and it's going to be too heavy to get back to it, want it to be to your, uh, to your one of your teammates. That's the, the platonic ideal of Rocket League is just 
three, three players just touch the ball all up and down the field to each other, never letting the other team touch it. Spec on. They have to cycle back. Well, rain tough whiff into the corner. Challenge from Specton. One out. Clean, clean win by Go Rock. Specton touches it down. Oh my goodness. U of A starting to settle into this, settle into this series halfway through game one. A little bit of warm up, I think, needed after a little bit of a break. Waterloo coming in real hot, but now it's starting to feel the momentum start to even itself out. Iris, Iris just throwing stuff at the goal. It's a very, it's a very Connecticut league. Just treat it like hockey. Shoot for rebounds, throw it at the net, see what happens. When in doubt, why not? Well, I see it, it's it fitting you say that because this shows why Canadian teams can sometimes succeed in Rocket League at this strategic level is that people say, oh, it's car soccer. Honestly, the uh, movement is way more like hockey to me. <laughs> it's yeah. all very free flowing. There are static positions, but for the most part, you have to be in the flow, be where you're needed. and. That really captures rotations with Rocket League more than any other, I would say, uh, allegorical uh, sport that you want to compare it to. So going into this game, it is the teams who can capture that essence the best that tend to find the most success. And the teams that slot those chances when needed. Specknon, wrong footing Vanilla Rain. It looked easy to save, but I think they got switched up. Another just like not the hardest possible shot, just a change up and just over kind of over the shoulder, so to speak. Back bumpering Vanilla Rain there. The, the comparisons between hockey and Rocket League, yeah, that's that's apt to me. You look at the greatest hockey player of all time, Wayne Gretzky, not the biggest, not the fastest, doesn't have the hardest shot. The best skill in hockey and Rocket League is knowing where to be and when to be there. You look at, you know, the undisputed two greatest of all times in Rocket League and paid off and Turbo Bowl. So again, not the most mechanically talented players, not the fastest players. Just kind of generally the players that more often than not are where they need to be when they need to be there. And Specknon was where he needed to be at the right moment to tie this game up. It is certainly an important skill to have because it feels like something you can learn, but there's some players who just naturally have that sense, even with uh, so many hours or less than other players. It's just something that you pick up on, see what works, and sometimes the players have an act for it. And it gets what separates a lot of players from average Joes. And, Right there, it did not seem like Ketchup was in tune with that mm. sense. They cheated up a bit farther, but even I couldn't predict just how far this flip was going to go. Wrong place, wrong time for Ketchup as Virus. You're right. That was quite the flick. You got to always give a couple extra unreal units to a Dominus flick than you over what you would for a, for, a, for an Octane hitbox flick. It's just going to go a little bit higher, a little bit further for that extra gigantic hitbox. Three two. Like a... oh, oh, never mind. Forget that. Three three. I was gonna say it's very much like a paddle. It has a lot of power, but Yarl showing they have a lot of power in this one. Not only hitting it, but to be honest, I think the defenders were like me. I completely forgot Yarl was in that play because as soon as they went to the ceiling, I'm thinking, okay, you can't follow that. And instead, they're the only person who could get that. Incredibly quick recovery after that first touch, and it was a heavy. It was a heavy first touch. Too. You don't expect the player to get back to that, but. Bouncing down off that ceiling. It's already in the air. Might as well. It's got to land somewhere. Might as well land on the ball. Just like that. It looked like Waterloo had it all sewn up with that goal with 42 seconds left. And U of A, the quick answer. Specton is going to complete the comeback. Carried away by Vanilla Rain. Virus. Then the guy in this one. He's got a hat trick on six shots. This one. Tapped on, Specton can shoot. Cleared away, Vanilla Rain. That one. Whew, U of A lucky to see overtime there, or grateful to see overtime, because two more seconds on the clock, and Vanilla Rain's putting that one in. See overtime. Whew. And they're putting some work in on the midfield, but Vanilla Rain's definitely going to want to have that one back. That flick is not exactly what they're going for, so they can retreat back. With too much pressure. That is until Specknon flicks one to the moon. Yarl on the follow through is not going to beat Gorox. Virus equally up to the task, or so I thought. Might be a giveaway here. Specknon, let's see what they can do with it when given space. Virus assures his teammates there will be none given. 
to clear right back uh, down into the midfield. Jarl trying to chase, and we're seeing a nice back and forth. Not too passive, not too aggressive for both sides, and it's needed to be aggressive on these saves. It's a brilliant save. There is no follow through. It is a UAB coming away with the win. Vanilla Rain did everything he could there. Needed something, needed literally anything from Virus, which it's a tough read. Bouncing off the post and off the crossbar. Virus couldn't make it. There was Specknon, where he needed to be. Hat trick for Specknon over hat trick for Virus. It's 4 3, and it's 1 0 on the series. University of Alberta. Gonna take out Waterloo for the second time in as many matches. Here at the 7 Eleven Canadian Collegiate Championships. That was a close it, one. We are in for a series, is. like we said. It really is, and I still feel like I'm leading with Waterloo. I like how they play it. Even they barely survived that too. Jarl absolutely smacked that shot, and it gets saved. And then they had three players staring at it, but no one is in the correct position to be able to actually get that off the line. So that does hurt. It, it hurts to make a miracle save, and then you're still not able to do enough to get it through. But at least when we're moving into this next game, I think they can focus on is that they're still alive. This is not elimination and quite yet. They have a little bit farther to go, but you need to start getting W's because yes, U of A is heating up. They're playing incredibly well uh, to be able to hang in there against a team like Waterloo that has, has that pop off potential to really run away with a series as we've seen previously. But I think this one, I feel like this has to go the distance, but maybe that's just me hoping. I just want to see these two teams play. It's been such a treat so far. Game two underway, one nothing again for U of A. It's been, I mean, we highlighted Specknon at the beginning of the tournament and, and he has not let us down. Demo onto Vanilla Rain, Specknon's gonna steal some boosts and try to challenge this one. Oh my goodness, the aggression for U of A. I think the way that game ended has them feeling real good, and that goal will have them feeling real good too. 30 seconds in, Specton's got another his fourth goal of the series. One nothing. Look at the respect from Gorox too. They're on the backboard, they're ready to clear, but you can see them pause just because they're not sure if Specton has that read, but at this point, I think everyone knows Specton has those reads. <laughs> they're able to follow that mm -hmm. through and tuck it under the bar. Really way to open things up. Specton, when he goes up for that ball, I just hear, I score these. That's just, I can't imagine him thinking anything else, because you can't, you can't attempt shots like that without confidence that you're going to hit him. Virus, over to Gorox. Gorox, looking to play it back to Virus, has it cleared away. Specton, the banger, forces a touch out of Virus. Now, all of a sudden, Waterloo on the back foot, after coming into this series, hot. Put up the first goal of that first game. Was it 2-0? No, I think it was just 1-0. But either way, grab this, this series by the horns to start, but it's been mostly U of A since then. It has been mostly U of A, but uh, I think that's a natural thing to see from U of A. I think they do really heat up, and uh, I do like their ability to adapt to their teammate, uh, their team. If they need to hunker down and defend their goal, they can do that. But if they also want to send people forward, they can also do that as well. So it's crucial to get inside the mind of those players, but the best we can do is just listening into the comps. Taking their corner. Like, I don't have my comp boost. I'm not there. I can have this, too. Back to find you, Jarl. Nice ball. I got stuff to go. Let's try. Let's try. One free jump. Come back. I'm up. I'm up. Okay. Down. Yeah, he's awkward. He's awkward. He's jumping. Yeah. I'm up. Come back. He has a so no. I'm low boost. Pass, pass, pass. Low boost, low boost. Over, over. My bad. I got back right. Nice find you, Spock. I'm on the left side, behind you. Uh, I can't. Come back. Oh. Did you get him? No, I'm fine. Uh, trying to I follow, he's trying to follow. One out. Two, 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 two. Bang. Uh, I got that. Uh, oh, what? I got it, I got it. Nice. Free hit. I'm gonna demo, demo, demo. Just running back. Turn, back turn. Nice. nice. Oh, nice. <laughs> Let's go! <laughs>
Oh, that was kind of scary. I was trying to go for the Yeah, down. 50, good 50. I, I love to see the synchronized. Nice! Nice! <laughs> it's always, always my favorite part of listening to the cops. <laughs> it has somehow become the, the noise people make when they score. It's just nice! That's the competitive player personality test. I think I yeah. tweeted that out a while back. It, it, what do you say after you score? Do you uh, do you say nice or do you say let's go? <laughs> or does it depend on the situation? I feel like most people will stick with one or the other almost all the time. That's true. I tend to not talk, <laughs> even in calm. I will I will call out everything, and then once the goal goes in, it's like just nod, take a sip, <laughs> yeah, and then move on. Nice has become uh, synonymous with uh, with specifically with NRG. The constant nice is nice. Nice. That's how you know the goal went in. It's a longer nice. Honestly, that's the challenge. Can you calm with your teammates in a competitive match? Only saying <laughs> nice in different intonations. So nice? Nice. And nice. Nice? Nice. <laughs> Just that. Just that for five minutes straight. Catch up off the backboard, and U of A has continued to control this series. Maybe we had it wrong when this tournament started calling Waterloo the second best team here. U of A, been as close to St. Clair as we've seen anybody in Canada look in a long time. Fast though, Go Rocks somehow won the race, but probably wasn't expecting to. I wasn't expecting to. Rough touch, Virus looking for a second one. It's a bump in net. Specnon is there. Specnon always there. The best ability in Rocket League. Forget about flip resets. Forget about boost control. The best ability is availability. It's just being there when your team needs you in the right place. Right there, no one was where one is needed for Waterloo. <laughs> they were completely spread out, boost starved, as they have tried to set up camp in this a half and it has not worked but now with some space they try to break out that's what they'll off the crossbar and out catch up with a save go rocks to try their entry into the attack gentle flick and Jarl's gonna wait it out Specnon, what do you know is where you need him and another clear but doesn't much matter that was a two goal lead anyway that's a 2-0 lead in the series for ua and you know i still predicted uw but i cannot argue with the ua efficiency they're just looking so solid call me the anti-gibbs because <laughs> I called U of A. This series hardly even close to over. It wouldn't, again, like I said, I thought this series was going five. It would not blow my mind if it did still. Two nothing here for U of A, but we talked about earlier on the circle of suck and how matchups make games, right? Like one team, there's no transitive prop. The, the, the matchup between three players and three players is all that really matters. And maybe Waterloo is a better team if you were to boil them down to, like, NBA 2K-ish attributes. But from what I've seen in this tournament, U of A matches up really well with them. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree with that. I think, it, more importantly, it's a, the matches up but how you can be able to look at each other with speed, but also being able to take advantage of what makes your team really good. And I think what UAB is doing very well is that when they get up onto offense, they have a way of working in their first shot and then immediately having someone to cover the backup. And I think that's a crucial skill, staggering the defense and on the offense to make sure there's always someone to keep a play dangerous or to be, keep a play secure, kind of like that with a clear. It's an, Kind of a basic touch into an awkward read off the sidewall. What's the what, what do you think the adjustment Waterloo needs to make here? It, it, they really just seem to be playing both teams just kind of straight up, straightforward Rocket League. You know, it's not like it's not like U of A's breaking them down with passes. Is well, there's one. Just keep winning races to the ball. Virus makes it one nothing. I was a fan of this from Gorox, just uh, ignoring everything, understanding Virus probably has that read if it's a true waterfall, and understanding that if there's only one defender in the way, you can get them out of the way, throwing them into the corner. No demo, but unneeded. And the kickoff goal could be something else from Gorox. I don't know if that was a fake. I don't think they could reach it in general, but it doesn't really matter because here comes Vanilla Rain on the setup, an instant second goal, and UW rolling. Oh my, that just went wrong. As soon as the kickoff happened, it's not, it's not like U of A wasn't back on defense. Just each successive touch by U of A in their own third put them further and further 
into trouble. Lorraine, with a good flick, can score. Or with a bad flick, can set up virus. That's what happens. It is hectic. Hectic on the defensive end here for U of A. Some calm touches, but ultimately U of A, they're done with just waiting back. They're going to go on the offensive, and Carl, trying as they might, be able to get into that near post. Going to get that door shut on them. Quality challenge now, and Specknon right on it. Love that aggression to chase that down. But only going to be met with a 50. Now spike down. The redirect. Go Rocks, go. That is why you have staggered defense. First player miss. Second player is it needed to make sure that is kept clear. And saw UA take that two goal game in the previous match. And now, three and a half minutes remaining. It seems like it's a fairly comfortable position for Waterloo to be in, though. I don't think really anyone can mark out UA at this point. This is such a tough team to read in general, U of A, which I think is probably what makes them tough to play. It's really tough to get a handle on what they're doing right and wrong for, for me as a caster, but it, it's clearly tough on opposition players to get a handle on what they're trying to do. Is it, it even down to nothing? It doesn't feel like they're out of this game. That one put up on the backboard. Catch up, drop it for his teammate Specknon, who used all his boost to get a demo. Just over halfway, just under rather halfway through this game. And just gotta play it off his backboard. The win, the hard win by Specknon. Hill of Rain is there. Specknon played so much of this game of three on low boost, it feels like. And that is not a winning formula. No matter how good you are. Oh, yep. defensive head. This is a weird game, this particular game. Settle down into yeah. a very methodical midfield play where both teams are kind of just, it's almost like they're waiting for each other to take a risk. Like, please, can you just do something kind of weird so we can take advantage? The other team's like, no, you first. <laughs> so we're just kind of waiting around. It's, it's, it's almost calming, like zen-like in the midfield. But right? I think that is going to give way to some form of Tempest uh, play <laughs> from U of A because they need to make a comeback. And I think that was their first real attempt, catch up flying in. Bad out of hell to try to get this touch, but not going to work. How about try number two? That's a roller. Vanilla not going to be troubled, but play it somewhat close to the chest. and. Give it away again. How about try number three? Is it the charm? Yarl with the flip reset, leaving it to Specknot, and even that one gonna get rejected. U of A needs to find something here. They can't, you, you could feel that shift, as you mentioned, from being content to play it in the midfield to realizing, yeah, we gotta get going here. Two goals, minute 10 to go. They had the ball on the hood of the player you want. That's not what you want if you're U of A. Virus has locked it up at three nothing, game three. It's something from a catch up, but I will say hats off to Virus for reading that play. Some of the most effective ways of beating a defender is not hitting it downfield by hitting it around them using the sidewall. The thing is, they tried it too early. Virus read it and turned at a perfect time, taking advantage of that touch and able to get one more. And how about Specknon making it a two goal game right off the kickoff? That is why you practice these set pieces. Only set play in Rocket League is. Johnny Boy is always so so keen to point out. I do agree with the point that like not enough teams have have true plays off their kickoff, and maybe they do, and it's just like so easy to neutralize on a kickoff. But I'm just surprised we don't see everybody running set play all the time. You know, there's set spots you go to, but more stuff like the Spanish kickoff or like the traditional, I guess, flip side tactic era fake. Kickoff. There's really only like two of them that kind of have a name or that are practiced by. I want to see more of it. It's definitely a tough thing. I think part of it is just that the kickoffs have gotten to the point where most of the time when players meet, it's just ricocheting so wildly to the sideline that it doesn't even matter. And if they lose a kickoff, it might actually go into your net. So I think some teams are just foregoing the specialities and focusing more on the interplay, which is nice. However, it is always backbreaking when a team gets a very well worked goal and then off kickoff, they just get destroyed on the 50 and the follow through player spikes it in. So, uh, granted, if that's going to be you, 
That is something you're going to have to have to learn with to live with. But I do agree. I would like to see more of that, and I would like to see more of this from Waterloo because it's turned it into quite an interesting series. No sweep here. Going on to game four. You know, we were we talked before this uh, before the tournament. Weird when we were talking, getting ready for it. That wouldn't be surprised to see. Uh, like you know, we we both we both kind of agreed that we'd probably see all sweeps in the first round. There was one sweep. And I think with the exception of St. Clair, we haven't seen a single sweep in this tournament. It is turning out to be a dead even, I guess, two through five kind of level thing. Even in the St. Clair Saints case, they dropped the game. I mean, a 3-1 for them, that's basically a 3-2. More or less, yeah. That's that's as that's as close as you're gonna get, or, or at least as anyone has gotten. As you said, that uh, there was a comparison to saying sometimes these tournaments, it feels like it's just the St. Clair donation fund, where they're just <laughs> able to walk in here, take prize money, and then see you on your way, see you next time. But I would love to see these teams challenge, and these are the last two contenders, and by that logic, they are the best two contenders. So who's gonna be able to earn that much coveted spot of moving on, facing off against St. Clair in that grand final? Is really gonna come down who just executes better. And if Waterloo wants to be them, they're gonna have to engineer the turnaround here and completely a reverse sweep. I don't think anybody would uh, argue with you when you say these have been the next two best teams. It's been pretty clear to me. Uh, you know, no offense to the boys at UBC, but to me there's, you know, St. Clair has been, it's been a big gap between one and two and three. And then between three and four, there's a pretty solid gap in this tournament as well. As uh, U of A and Waterloo both beat UBC pretty pretty handily. Three ones, I think, in both of those cases. Catch up, we'll pinch it out. But it's going to be a back pass pinch. Waterloo looking to push us to game five. Catch up, eat that touch. Go Rocks was threatening. Double commit. Cleared away by Jarl. Go Rocks all by himself in defense, able to make two touches and alleviate some of that pressure. Ring gets bumped off that ball, but look at the ability of Waterloo to just stay in the play where, where, where I think lesser players would, you know, get, you know, the, he, go, Vanilla Ring getting bumped off that ball, staying on it to get the next touch. Go Rocks, two, three touches out of defense every time. Never just to clear. It's almost never just a shot. Always more this Waterloo team as they've sort of seized momentum in this one. It is something to certainly be wary of, and at least for right now, we're not seeing a lot of boost control from both teams. It's something that I've actually noticed. It's rare that we're going to get a situation in which a team is truly boost starved, and that shows the awareness and ability of all these teams to make sure they dissipate pressure quickly before they get into that scenario. However, these high lobs across that UA half are something that I've certainly had my eye on. It's something that I think Waterloo is confident in their ability to challenge quickly and keep the ball constrained. And it shows That's right wrong. there, Virus. They're just picking that one out. It's like I just spoke it into existence. The shooting of Virus, the accuracy. Look at this. Boom, right over Specnon. Specnon had no chance. Sometimes you jump for a ball thinking this is mine cleanly. And you look back at the replay and go, what was I thinking? I clearly was beaten. That feels like one of those Specknon jumping with the confidence of somebody who thought he was hitting that ball. This one's going to pop right to the center, and Virus is there. I feel like it's been the refrain of this tournament, Taco. Right place, right time. Perfectly placed for Virus's car there. Right in the middle, just waiting for that pinch. You could not have asked better for that pinch either, and it's uh, really on Gorox to not only recognize that they are probably not able to affect that ball by themselves, but they can get in the way, make that clear much more annoying, and if you're a the outside of those touches, sometimes you are able to just knock that into the perfect scenario right in the middle for your teammate to follow. Virus, they've been there time and time and time again. They have two goals in this game, and what a pivotal game it is turning into. Vanilla flicks it up and over one. What a first touch from Vanilla Rain, but he couldn't find the shot. The second scoring opportunity comes for Virus, and it's wide. Talked a lot about Virus and Go Rocks Go, but this is a three man game, and Miller Rain has been solid in his own right, and that was a near electrifying goal. I wouldn't even know what to call that first touch, but it was perfect. 
I was on those air dribbles, or you know, all these follow-up touches is one of the most important skills of high-level play. It's not necessarily how you start the play. Sometimes it's how you finish it, like Vanilla Rain going with a flip reset underneath Jarl, but Jarl's able to get just enough of the tires in or part of uh, the carriage of the car to knock that one to the side. Jarl, no one on the backboard, no one getting that read. Catch up all alone in Vanilla Rain, speaking of, showing up in a big way with the save. Ketchup just needed a bit of a harder shot there. He had the whole net to shoot at, and he placed it pretty well, but it wasn't hard enough. Jarl, it doesn't matter because there's no defender there. Two to one. What a flick. Middle rain, I think they were looking at that mid boost, thinking, ah, it's probably fine. I can rotate back, and as soon as they turn, their teammate gets flicked, and there is nobody back home minding the shop. Two one. Anyone's game to play for now in the final 80 seconds. and. Virus making sure it stays awkward. Another high lob, another open shot, though this time Specknot has something to say about it. I gotta always assume the opponent is better than your teammates. Not You don't want to actually literally assume that, but play to play. I always play like my teammates are going to miss and my opponents are going to hit it, because that's just those are the safest assumptions to make. That is not, that is not the way Vanilla, Vanilla Rain was expecting a challenge on that goal from, uh, from I believe, it was a virus, and it just didn't happen. Well, as a result, he was out of position. The shot from Gorox is in. It's three to one. Forty-two seconds left. Gorox might have cashed in that ticket to game five. That shot. And they are actually engineering a reverse sweep. If you think about it, they have to last forty-two more seconds, and the nerves have got to be high. So very curious to see what it's like in the water that comes. I'm behind. I'm gonna wait. Okay. Yep, pass. Yeah, I'm just gonna. Can you force force? Go. 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 I'm Just back up. I'm leaving. Catch up there. Force. Back low. I got it. Stay with. Tony's in possession. Yep. One minute. Yep. Okay. Okay. Drop. I'm gonna go for right. I got, no, I got the left corner. Oh, oh, yeah. I'm gonna go net. Yep. You can boom. Okay. One on. I'm here. 50 to corner. I'm gonna play this. Watch demos. Yep. He's chasing you. Nice. Play. He's without one. Right. One up. I'm trying to block. Block. Right. I'm trying I'm to put it down. Nice. Good shit. And that just shows how much they really just want to take it to game five. You can see the moment they get that first clear on the follow through from Ketchup, you just kill it, kill it, kill it, kill it, please put it down on the ground so that we can actually try to pull the series all the way back. Indeed. And what a comeback in this series from Waterloo. It kind of played out the opposite of how I expected with Waterloo playing in the last series. I thought we'd see them come out real strong. And, and U of A having to adjust, but is not what happened. U of A taking the first two games looking like the better squad and since then it has been all Waterloo. You know that was a 3-2 game that probably wasn't as close as the scoreline indicates. That, that's a great way to put it because it, at times you do see the scoreline you're saying well that was pretty close and like it was, but at the same time, there was a lot of pushes forward when you're looking at Virus, of course, leading the team again on goals. And I am glad you do bring up Vanilla Rain because I, I do tend to, I would say, focus on Virus for getting those goals. Of course, Gorox is getting their own contributions, but Vanilla Rain has been instrumental in a lot of these touches. I think they had one whiff in one of these series, but even that wasn't even punished. So none of these mistakes really matter because ultimately they're getting the job done, but the job is not fully finished. They still got to do one more five-minute match, and we know how close these games have been. I think UVA is going to make an absolute fight, and content-wise, I think the content deities have to give us a game 5 OT. They just gotta. I mean, at this point, they're just teasing us with it. I mean, this series has been so close all the way. Even when it felt like it was going to... Even when at the beginning, when it felt like it was going to be a U of A sweep, the games were close. The Rocket Gods Feeling it tonight, I think. We have to go. We have to go to open. Virus. Can't find a shot. It'll just be cleared away by Ketchup. Big clear. Spec not up. Quick misses it. Ketchup is going to follow. Wisely, I think, assuming Spec wouldn't have that touch. He 
Yarl. Off the wall. The Lorraine the Reed. And that's going to be a shot. Spectron has to make a tough save. Ended up in a little turtley spot there. Oh, pinched out. Look at my guy Spectron with the wall dashes. Chaining it together. Couldn't get back to the ball, but is able to stay in that play as a result. A little mechanical flex. The virus off the backboard. Cleared away by Ketchup. Winner of this again will have a chance. Play St. Clair Saint. Or the in the grand finals for the title of King of the North here at the 7 Eleven Canadian Collegiate Rocket League Championships. This was an invitation only tournament with eight squads. Top eight teams in the country. So I guess. Not even closed qualifiers, just a closed tournament. The other trying to make sure they're getting the most out of this invite. Is <laughs> these two teams is uh, <laughs> trying to duke it out, go all the way through, and uh, certainly I I don't know how the players do it mentally. Just it, it's exhausting sometimes to play at this high of a level, this much concentration, and still be able to you know get up and go about your day. I don't know. At least for me, when I used to uh, compete in these types of events, I feel like. I, I feel like I was. Really, I finished a workout after a three, four hours mm -hmm. just because the mental focus is so intense. So I wonder how much uh, fatigue really plays into tournaments like this. So far, it seems like everyone's still razor sharp and going to need to be because we've seen some scoring droughts in this tournament. But this one feels all the more, really more resonant oh, what a because pass. we're still waiting for that first real chance. And I didn't know about this one, but Vanilla Rain is able to make this pass count. How poetic! After we spotlighted him last game pointing out that most of that we hadn't been talking about him a lot that vanilla rain breaks the ice in this game five just doing all the little dirty weird things for for waterloo throughout this tournament the kind of stuff that doesn't necessarily get the headlines so to speak there's a big goal for vanilla rain i suppose it's only fitting i mentioned there's a scoring drought well better to break it than with vanilla rain so i'm glad ah. to see that that worked out as poetically as you had mentioned, but I think it's a far step from being all that they need. A one goal lead by far is definitely not something you can really hang your hat on. You need to make sure you close the series out as well. Jarl, not even going on the sidewall. I think they kind of got bumped by Virus instead. Ketchup, bit of a giveaway in Miller Rain. Nothing poetic or graceful about that. They're just slapping it as far as possible. Between talking to Danger Taco all day and saying Vanilla Rain over and over again, I'm thinking about hopping back on that 7-Eleven app and ordering something. I'm hungry. <laughs> I mean, it's a great <laughs> idea. You get, get a lot of stuff there. And you also, got their codes. You're yeah. able to get that discount when you get that $11 in order and up. So that is certainly something that everybody here in chat can take advantage of. And hopefully, as a touch that night bot, just feeding you deals all day. Yeah, long. 7 off 11, the code. And you can get tacos. And probably vanilla flavored stuff, I assume. This ball played into the corner. Final 96 seconds of play here in this series. Oh my, maybe never mind as Jarl ties it up. I didn't really see this coming. Virus touches this and Vanilla Rain oh, goes um, for boost. Cuts in front of Virus and they bump each other. That's the part I did not see. Jarl being opportunistic. They're not going to ask questions. They're not going to ask why that happened. They will just make sure that that goes in the back of the net. 80 seconds remaining. Everything to play for. Specknon, that's a sitter. Vanilla Rain, they take it immediately and they will slot it lower right. Vanilla Rain, what a time to come up with your first brace of the tournament on stream at least. 420 game score, 2-1 to one the lead. U of A after, like you said, how backbreaking it is to work for a goal and see it answered by a kickoff goal. I mean, that is that is that experience in a nutshell right there. And at the worst possible time, in a money match, in, the, in a tournament, in an elimination game, Specknot and the crew need an answer. So Vanilla Rain will slap that one again to the sideline. And what a game they're having. Even defensively, they're a wall here on this sidewall. They're going to keep on going, getting another 50. And got us at this point with a one-goal lead. It's just as important to get these lines clear as it is to waste all this time down. And is a great way to do it. Gorok's just going to throw a loft at target. Virus. And that again, Gorok's. They're not going to lurk on this one, but they will mark that side wall. 
It's really now U of A getting locked in their half and they're quickly running out of time to find a solution. 23 seconds to go. Specknon into the corner, cut off by Go Rocks Go. Is the reverse sweep in the offing? We'll find out in the next few moments of Rocket League here as Vanilla Rain gets another dunk. Vanilla Rain, talk about playing bigger than your hitbox in game five. He's got a savior medal, he's got two goals, and if he can put this ball on the ground, he's got a win. There it is, Go Rocks Go drops it down. Woo, Waterloo completes the reverse sweep, and they've got their revenge on U of A. Well, uh, we, we say sometimes, the team's gotta earn it. You gotta earn your wins. I don't think there's a, a better demonstration of earning your wins than a reverse sweep. Staying locked in, focused on what's ahead, and not getting tilted is such a difficult task. So many of them meet, uh, so many different teams in this competitive arena will meet their fate due to those challenges, but not Waterloo. they able to stay mentally strong, and they are certainly going to need it. They will be the rest of Canada's representative as they go up against the Titans St. Clair in that grand finals, and I'm sure we're in for quite the treat when that arrives. That's coming up next here at the 7-Eleven Canadian Collegiate Rocket League Championships. We're going to take a quick break to reset. Like Taco said, next up, St. Clair, Waterloo, Grand Finals on the way.
Welcome back, esports fans, to the 7-Eleven Canadian Collegiate Rocket League Championship. I'm Max. With me is Danger Taco. This is the final of a tournament featuring eight of the top universities across the country, all competing for a $4,500 prize pool and the chance to be crowned. Crown him, King of the North. There's your finals matchup, Taco. Waterloo, St. Clair. And in the end, in the end, we didn't get here the way we thought, but in the end, we're getting the matchup we thought we'd get. And, and it's uh, something kind of funny about that because certainly I was surprised by the upset, but yeah, in a way, we didn't get the matchup we expected. It is PW, it is St. Clair, de facto, the two teams that I suppose should be here based on predictions, but ultimately, it's only going to be one. It's going to stand alone in the end, one being a heavy favorite, so. Nothing more fun sometimes than coming in as the underdog. It's certainly, some of the chat is going to be behind you, but maybe not all. St. Clair's got a large fan base, and they like to show it off for good reason. Vanilla Rain could have had the opener, but the open net beckoned, and he did not answer the call. St. Clair will start this series with a game in hand, so they're playing a best of five. Their own little best of five, as Waterloo will be playing a best of seven, essentially, so they can get a dub here. Foods off the sidewall. The dunk on Vanilla Rain bumps him into Virus. Jay is up quickly, and we're going to see St. Clair in blue for the first time tonight. A little bit of adjustment. We're also on an East server for the first time tonight. Both these teams. I think St. Clair is in Ontario. I've actually never looked that up. I assume so. We're going to be having those bi-coastal matchups, which can be nice. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I believe it is a... Uh, very much uh, so an East Coast team. I would say Waterloo having a slightly off ping, but for the most part, everyone's practically identical. We're all sitting at 30, 40, so I don't think that will really be a factor, which is ideal when we're gonna be separating arguably the two best teams in this country. So trying to see how close these shaves are really gonna be with these teams' comparison is, let's say, uh, UW play with fire, allowing the St. Clair air dribble to get that close to net. I don't think if your ping is under 60, I think you got nothing to complain about. That's my personal <laughs> philosophy as a, as a West player, <laughs> where you'd be on a West server and all of a sudden you're like, why, is my, why am I a solid 120 ping on a West server from the West Coast? If you're under 60, all good. Go Rocks. Thought about a reset, then thought about a ground pinch, didn't get either one. Vanilla Rain, who had an incredible game five in the last action we saw in this tournament, Find a shot there, comp. Looking for the bump, got it. The pass ends up coming to Jay, who gets beat out by the defender. Virus quickly up for it, and they were needed. And comp gonna have plenty of time to work with, but opts for the sidewall touch. An interesting way to buy time with the rotation catch up. And now, that's a nice way to get Gorox on their horse. Set it in deep for him as Virus. It's gonna be out of their reach. Middle rain with a fake. They'll pay with their life. Virus touches a vibe. They'll also be sent to the graveyard. So comp, plenty of time to work with, and they're gonna opt for just the gentle flick. I would, I'm not too surprised by anything that St. Clair is busting out. They, they seem to play a very direct right now. Maybe that's what has worked for right now, but W has the answer for a lot of these. This is what St. Clair does until you kind of force them out of it. They're plenty happy to just play you straight up and Win races, win challenges, demo you where, where the opportunity presents itself and just take shots at you. Until you prove to them that they have to whip out the mechanics, they don't need to as Spoods makes it one nothing. It comes from Comp rushing this play and getting a 15, but then they're not even done. They're just going to dap up a Spoods into the open pass. Some might think a little risky, technically a back pass to your third man, but when you have the accuracy of Spoods, nothing's a risk. It really feels like St. Clair plays this game without considering the risks. You know, they ended up they ended up when they scored that goal with all three players in the six yard box as Comp makes it a quick two nothing. And you got to feel for this last defender. I, honestly, I think they were playing Jay's touch, which granted you that is a to. smart thing to do. The problem is the moment it's a miss, Comp is screaming in for the follow through. And sometimes that's all you need for a good offensive play, just an immediate follow up. Even if the angle doesn't look great, you can still make anything dangerous. Just, just, we talked about this in, I think, the last series they played in. St. Clair is so consistent, you have to respect the touch, and when the touch doesn't come, it's almost as if a perfect touch has come, because you're not there to respond. So it's really on 
W2, make sure they buckle down. I think I was happy with how they started the game, but now it's really gotten out of hand quickly, Miz is the nature of a lot of St. Clair plays. However, this could get out of hand very quickly. Comp is demoed. Problem is, Virus took a long time to get around to it, so that temporarily open goal can result in nothing much at all. And it's going to be just another series of long clears between these two sides in the mid. Laid up by Vanilla Rain, but Comp is right there. St. Clair, as usual, content to leave one player back. Commit two to pretty much every offensive rush. Comp, the delayed on the touch, nearly got the double tap off the inside of the post. A little tough to read there for the defense. Let's go, Rocks. Self pass. Oh, Vanilla Rain ended up being the shooter. Vanilla Rain gets the bump, but there's that last man back. It's Comp this time with the save. Ooh, Vanilla Rain, they slowed it down. They had a lead blocker, but I guess they don't need it because it's going to bounce around for Virus to put it in 11 seconds. There is hope yet. What a foot placement there. I mean, you, you see your Virus, you see the defender jump. It's easy decision. Just roll it. Can't, it's real difficult to get back down to the ground quickly in Rocket League once you've jumped. Shot saved. It's in a dangerous spot, though. Com had to come in. Second touch on defense. Awkward. Oh. Everybody up. The shot off the crossbar. No. Oh, Gorox had the tying goal. Hit the crossbar. Game one. Flash game two. St. Clair. Oh, I had my hand on my forehead after that one. That one hurt to watch, particularly because I know exactly what Virus was thinking. That ball went straight toward the crossbar, and I think Virus realized that if it goes bar down, they need to crash it. Instead, bounces out, and they just have to backflip and watch it sail over their head. So, a tough one, but that was very close. That read goes differently. We very well could have seen overtime. Even though he missed the read, Gorox was still there. They smartly did Waterloo commit to that. You're, you're not going to get many better scoring opportunities than, oh man, all three St. Clair players have jumped and the ball is not clear. We got to go for this. Game two, underway. Game three, I never know what to say with this game in hand format. The Lorraine will make it one nothing off the bat. Yeah, regardless of what game it is, it is a game time. You got to really focus up and a better way to do that than looking for those infield passes. And that's what I'm talking about. When you bring it in the last series, you need to recognize when there are opportunities. St. Clair's not going to give you many, but off kickoff, if that midfield's wide open, you got a player running into him. Make sure you put it in their path. We're going to take a listen in now to the Waterloo comms. Let's do it. One touch. Nice over to this back here. Look back, right? I'll chase, I'll chase. Yep. Who's up? Oh, I'm mid. I'm mid. Keep going. Zero. Yep. I'll be mid. Hi, hi. I'll be mid as well. I appreciate that. Bang. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I'll go. I'm gonna stay on. Yeah, yeah one more you. Uh, Behind. No I have over comp. I'm Behind zero. Behind you, Virus. I'm just down here. Oh. Yep. Just nice. touch. I'm zero. I'm being done with you. Can't yeah, follow. Okay. I just see have one, have one. Okay. I'll play that. Comp's there. Comp's there. Pass. Got one. Nice. I zero. I'm moving. Well, I told him me. I like it. Yeah, he fucking docked that shit up. <laughs> yeah, on my head. Was nasty. It was like on my head. You can hear exactly how frustrating it is to play against St. Clair in the voices of Waterloo. They got up 1 0 to start this one, but how many times have we seen St. Clair in this tournament? It's been at least three, with this being the third. Go down 1 0 early and then tie it up within before that first minute it's over. And it can be so annoying because those goals really do come out of nowhere. You can hear them laugh almost. I mean, probably out of frustration, but it's still just a laugh because that's all you can do. You're just watching Jay turn to this touch. You're thinking, what are you possibly doing there? And it's just the gentlest little tap to themselves for the goal. And it can be so frustrating because that play has, it looks like no path forward. And then suddenly St. Clair able to just stab their way right through. Nilla Rain takes a 50, wins two of them. Double commit. Double commit there by Waterloo. There's only so many of those you can get away with against a team of the caliber of the Saints. What a touch by Jay. What a read by Vanilla Ray, and that was a necessary read. Gorox can hook shot it, but Jay is there. 
No rocks. The only option to get around the defender there was a fake, but a fake gives too much time to the other defenders to get back. Smart play by Jay. Just challenge. Force a touch. So we're going to be seeing if this can be kept up from Waterloo. They're playing very well in the midfield. I love these challenges. They're keeping it close. They're keeping it competitive. And as long as these reads can keep up in the back end, it's going to be fine. Jay was able to find a way through the first, but not the second. Okay, with a demo virus. Now in Vanilla Rain, that's a double commit. Spoods, they're already upfield. It's a perfect pass up into the ceiling. Cobb for number two right at the stroke of halftime. That is one of, maybe it is my favorite kind of newish meta developments to just, why try to drop it down when it's so much easier to get right under the ball and drop it down by popping it up off the ceiling? And, and St. Clair has pulled that a number of times in this tournament. No better example than right there. I like that off the kickoff from Vanilla Rain. They just took it right to the hole, trying to get a demo mm -hmm. on their way through. Is not a bad a strategy, especially because they've had a lot of success off kickoffs. Jay somehow finds a way to get that save because that was wide open otherwise. Jay does stuff that like I don't I I don't even really understand. I've been watching professional rockets since before RLCS existed. So for the most part, even when these players are way better than me, I get what's going on. Jay does stuff that I don't understand. That that block, I don't understand how he was there, how he read it like that. Doesn't make sense. Thank God somebody finally signed Jay. <laughs> it's well deserved. Hopefully yeah. they can find as much success as they have in the collegiate space. RLCS, because at least right now, seems to be going well, but everything goes awry sometimes. Comp not able to read that ceiling bounce, and Virus, as always, a uh, capable striker, putting it in the open net. You cast your curse that before your sentence was over. That was a preemptive <laughs> caster's curse. As it's a tie ball game now, Waterloo 2-2. Two, two. This game two, game two boogaloo for, uh, for, uh, for St. Clair Saints. They just seem to struggle in this second game of every series, which means if they can get a dub here, we're gonna see like a five, six to one type of, type of game in, in game four slash game three, which has been the case in all three of their stream series. The, you know, a, a win in game one, a close game two, I guess except for the U of A getting the win in game three, that next game after game two for St. Clair has been absolutely stellar. 104 to go, Waterloo. At this point, all you need is one great play pretty much. For Waterloo, they need to make sure they watch this boost. Vanilla Rain has been searching for pads all throughout this, and they're just helpless to watch Jay double tap that in the middle. You don't want to give them too many of that. There's no angle too sharp for them to snipe. So Go Rocks, knowing that, is not going to take any chances. Keep clear down, and now a setup power shot. It's going to go well wide. Smooth's going to give up possession. Vanilla Rain off the corner. Virus into the middle. Go Rocks decides against that one, and Comp will therefore be able to walk into that space with a flip reset, but. That's really it. Another long hit. Spoods is required. Bounce straight down. Tough angle and the bounce shot. I think might have even got a ground pinch. Going to go well wide and St. Clair going to chase it back into the mid with 15 to go. Tom can double this. Oh, he put it a little wide left. Which means Jay is going to have to retreat big time. He's going to have to buy time for his teammates to get back. What a good job there by Jay as well. To do exactly that. Spoods. To the middle. No rocks. Wants to keep it going. Virus wants the double. That'll do it for regulation. Overtime in game two. St. Clair looking to put themselves on triple match point if they can get this next goal. Golden goal territory. Well, that was a brave turn by Virus and maybe a bit too brave, maybe foolhardy. They were a 1v1 with Jay turning around over the shoulder and they get it to go. Go Rocks. Just going to send that one deep and actually drawing both Spoods and Comp. Virus taking their time, sniping that corner, and a brilliant save yet again by Spoods to keep that clear. We mentioned how good St. Clair is, and the defense, again, is no exception. Starting to feel like Waterloo might be gripping the stick a little tight here. In overtime. This is a scoring opportunity. The shot's just not amazing from Vanilla Rain. Since we're crowning the uh, King of the North, German. I gotta quote my guy Ted Stark. He said, fine line between bravery and foolishness. When it comes to a play like that from Vanilla Rain, is this ball pops center? Go Rocks, can he get back to it? He does not have enough boost. 
boots as we are over a minute into overtime now. Clear into neutral play. No more, no more of this early overtime dirty kind of kickoff goal stuff. The middle. Jay is there off the pass. Tom had to make some kind of touch and another demo. And Claire, when they want to, they can just, it feels like they can just demo at will. Tom, can you hit the ankle? Not quite. Oh my goodness. It did scare me. Virus was creeping out in the near post. And I'm thinking if that doubles over your head, that is going to be an interesting in between play where two defenders both have a shot at it. Virus. Nice little battle oh. of aggression. That is wide open. Can Vanilla Rain put it home? It's very high, and Comp is even higher. Getting that touch to the side. Another there infield to Virus. It's a banger into the top shelf. What a find by Gorox. What a game from UW. Look at that pass. Virus just had to pretty much put it anywhere besides bottom left. He had about 75% of the goal to shoot at. Oops. I mean, gods can bleed, like you said. Seeing them now drop two games in this tournament for St. Clair, but that just speaks to how great the margin of error is for the Saints team. And we're like, oh my gosh, they dropped a game. We haven't <laughs> it's, it's, considered it's them the standard. dropping series. Oh yeah, it's well, it's the standard for which they're judged, and I think it's, they've deserved that time and time again. And it really just came down to. I wouldn't even say a mistake. That was just really incredibly well worked by Gorox to snipe their teammate in open space. But again, that comes from that Saints are not going to give you a lot of space in the midfield. So when you do have that, being able to make sure that pass gets your team in a position where they can smack one like that. I mean, good luck, goalkeeper. Saints have some of the best defense in all of Canada and all of the NA Rocket League. But it is uh, something that can't be foolproof, especially when the setup is as clean as that. So the game two bugaboo has come through again for St. Clair. What, is, what have they got in the third game? With a game in hand, it's already 2-0, but the results in this actual series, 1-1, one, one, or already 2-1, rather, sorry. Them pushing three players up into offense, as usual, just relying on their recoveries to get them back into the game defensively. Orox plays into the far corner. Spoods is there. Spoods looking for the pass. Jay. The shot's saved, but that's a wide open net. Comp makes it one nothing. It's anxiety that creeps in that you got to make sure the communications are tight. Look at the infield pass, and that's opportunistic, but can't be sending every single player at that. Otherwise, it's not going to be the easiest uh, thing to be able to put wide. So Comp putting that one through. First shot, first goal, and here we go. Trying to see if uh, come back can happen right off the kickoff. We've seen more than a couple, but this one apparently not going to be one of them. Orox is up. This, remember, Waterloo lost in their first game of the day, which means they have had the longest road. This is the longest road they could have taken to get here. And now they have to play St. Clair after all of that. It's like uh, running a marathon, the final couple of miles are uphill the whole time. It's not a fun time to be had. It's, certainly it's uh, going to be a, a bit of a struggle, of course, but honestly, they're handling it very well. You just got to make sure that they are razor sharp on these reads. How about that from Virus? The blind turnaround to block that shot. <laughs> Jay beats both of his teammates with that air dribble. Looking for maybe a ground pinch. Oh, the little double 50. And that means Spoods has a free reign on the ball. Nobody in net yet, but oh my goodness, never mind. I was just going to say, but they get back to this water loop with Spoods. With the solo play, look at this. Off the ceiling, dropped it down. The angle was barely even there. The goal materializes anyway. That's an interesting play. Vanilla Rain was pressing out to get that read. And then it hits to the corner. And I'm thinking, man, that's going to be a tough ball to pass. Pass? Why pass when you have the skill of Spoods? Just be able to set yourself up off the ceiling and then spike it into an open net. Spoods is thinking, this is going to be a tough ball to pass. So I'm just going to score instead. This is two, strategy. Yeah. Do nothing. Three minutes to go. Here's Spoods again. A lot of control. Off the backboard looking for the second touch. He got it, but didn't get enough of it to send it towards the net. Rock. That's a nice pass, but it's stopped by Spoods. This is your, uh, so far, been your requisite reminder that Spoods is really good, too. About once or twice a series. We talk a lot about Jay and Comp. 
Not once or twice a series, there's a game that Smooth absolutely steals on his own. Comps are brilliant. It's a brilliant player and a brilliant team play. They've all been over the car of. And yeah, sometimes you have stars shine, but ultimately that's kind of how it always happens. There's always one mm -hmm. player that kind of has to play the third man role. It kind of has to take a back seat. It's hard to balance that much star power, but I think St. Clair managed to do it well and keep everyone in the spotlight for the most part. They just got to make sure they too overzealous on some of these touches. Seen a couple of double commits. Very rarely they backfire, but that was one of them. I was thinking about a team like what, you know, the various the various banners they played under, but the first killer AJ Illusion team, you know, a lot of talk about how great first killer is, how mechanically gifted AJ is, but every now and again, now and again, Illusion would just win a game all by himself. That's why that team was so good. That's why I wish Illusion hadn't retired. I really liked the way that team was made up. That's how St. Clair on, on the collegiate level remind me of foods in that Illusion world. Just in where he needs to be with the ability to really pop off and win you a game kind of by himself. 120 to go here. That's really what you want to see. And same with Comp is still dishing it. Not necessarily any hard to save area, but something that's going to make the defense react quickly to it. Another high lob. Go Rocks. Well beaten into the ceiling. Smoods with a hit across. Vanilla Rain with a slap right on back. It's going to go wide. And kind of wonder how many more chances like that they're going to get under a minute now. And they got to get two. Maybe this is one virus. That's a tough angle right in the middle. And yet again, Comp is able to shut the door. Here's Jay up. Self pass off the ceiling. Looking for the double. No. Go Rocks is there. Now Spoods will have a chance in his own corner. He'll play it out. Spoods high off the backboard. Jay is there. The shot. No, it's a pass. Oh, Comp put it up the backboard. And look who's there. It's Jay, and it's 3 0. And you got to feel for Go Rocks here. They're stuck in the middle of a lot of different plays. The infield pass off the backboard, and they think they have the read. No way that Jay's going to stay there. And. Of course they're going to stay there, because it's Jay. That's something they've done in so many different games. I pointed it out in the first series of the day, actually, is that I would say Jay, among any player in this entire tournament, is one of the best at just lurking in front of the goal and being able to put back those close-range doubles. Right place, right time. Forget about all the other rules. That is the only rule of Rock. Right place, right time. Comp is there for nothing. St. Clair will, hit, will, will find themselves on match point after this one. And if that was not already GG go next. It's just starting to really fall apart in the backfield for UW. They're just trying to get that out to the sideline. St. Clair's already there and puts that straight into the middle for <laughs> really the real danger area. So if you are truly going to be able to come back, UW, you need to be able to find that magic from earlier on. These games are not close. They're starting to get blowouts. That is the St. Clair specialty. And as you mentioned, they're going to get on to match point despite Gorox Go getting one in a to-go bag. This is a classic St. Clair Saints um, by, up by a lot own goal right here. Oh, actually, no, I think he was trying to save that. Gorox <laughs> did get the last touch. I take that back. Never mind. Gorox Go, that's a real goal, not an own goal. Triple, double, triple match point? Yeah. 3-1 in the series. Which means St. Clair has three chances win one game in a tournament in which they've only lost two total games. I like their odds. Yeah, it's, it's looking pretty rough, but I mean, UW, they are one of those two teams to take a win, so they just gotta do it again, and again, and again, and again. <laughs> so that is a tough thing, admittedly. So hopefully they can dig deep for that, but I gotta say, this is really tough. When I say you gotta play perfect, again, it doesn't mean literal perfection, but as close as humanly possible, and sometimes we're only mere mortals. Oh, right off the bat, five seconds in, I think for the second time in, the se in this series, Comp has made it one nothing. Comp just being aware, and that's a good rush right there because they can see automatically, it's almost like, not the body language, the car language. Virus is slowing down because they don't have that read. They don't know if they want to catch it, if they dribble it, if they want to take it to the corner, and Comp knows in that moment of uncertainty, that is when you strike. Mm-hmm. Car language. Learn to read it. And you will be a grand champ no matter what your, uh, no matter what your mechanics are like. Pretty much as long as you know how to hit the ball hard. You can read the other players to be in good shape. Take it from me, 
I'm a grand champ. I have terrible mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> that is the way. <laughs> yeah. Just be, just, just be smart. That's all you need. Go rock. Gonna set up an air dribble, but he's got no boost, so he'll just take a shot. Spoods will save that away. Look at that. One touch and out. Comp puts it on target. Ease and quick. Which St. Clair at counterattacks when they need to. Is kind of mind blowing. Right, you can never really take your eye off of them as Comp. It looked like they just gave away the ball. And then, as you can see Waterloo flicking it out, Comp is again challenging you because they're just not leaving the ball alone. St. Clair so clean on everything, keeping the ball dangerous. They're always on the tail end of it. Jay with a brilliant rotation. And I think Virus decided why not? Why go around him when I could just bump him off it? They are the closest thing Canadian Collegiate Rocket League really has to those old school flip side tactics teams. Not in terms of the way they play, but just in terms of it just feels like a foregone conclusion sometimes with St. Clair. Even when you're up, even if you take a game off them, even if that game is the first game of the series, it just feels like it's St. Clair Saints in control all the time. Clear. Sometimes they can really lock you in the dungeon here, and this is a perfect example of why there is not enough boost in the world to get to Spoods before that Ooh. shot, but there is enough that Virus can ah. salvage it. The follow-through from Comp, though, how many iterations of a St. Clair attack can you survive? That's really the question. You can make one of the best saves you'll make today, and it doesn't matter, because there's always the next player up. There's always a demo coming through. St. Clair Saints, the boa constrictor, just tightening their grip on this tournament. So as we will be seeing potentially the final moments here of UW's run and really collectively of this tournament, it's really just to reflect down on how dangerous St. Clair are and how incredibly terrifying it is to see them play this confident. They are up by two. They know this is to close things out. And what do they do? Play safe? No. They're going off the backboard. They're picking each other out. And they're just continuing to press their advantage because they know if the team is going to try to turtle up and really absorb all that pressure, then that's when you screw around with them. Let's see how confident they really are. Let's take a listen to their comms. They're so mad at these demos, bro. Yeah, <laughs> you're just going on the hunt, as they say. <laughs> yeah, you know, you gotta get practice in. Yeah. I'm left. <laughs> but no, they oh, no, they man. saved it. No, it was opposite. Oh, <laughs> I'm not bad. <laughs> yeah, you gotta just stop water saving people, bro. Dude, I'm just a nice person. Oh no, but it looks toxic. Awesome. He's there. All good, all good. I'm That's kind of scary. Is that my <laughs> You own oh. gold, bro. Yeah, I went for the peak flick. It's all good. Alice, tell me thanks. That was scary. Oh, oh look, they all said thanks. I could take my time. Oh, no, he was there. Bro, like they're all saying, look at them go. You're down 3-1, okay. you're on elimination. Bro, so toxic for no reason. That's it. Way, way. Yeah, that's them right now, bro. So toxic for no reason. <laughs> it's always light in there. It's never serious. And I think say, that has a lot to do with it. I'd say pretty confident is how they're feeling, but it's 3-2 now. This is where I wish we were starting to listen to them. Dude, like, cause we, we, we hear them and they, it's always light, but I don't know if we've tuned into them, you know, when it's this close of a game before. <laughs> I, I mean, they laughed when they had got taken to game four uh, up true. against uh, UAB when they were just saying, oh, okay, game four. But I mean, they know that they've been getting a lot of demos. Of course, they make a mistake and they're getting a little chirped from UW. I don't know if that actually helped get in their head, but certainly allowing UW to claw their way back through and plenty of time to work with Spoods. They need a touch. They did not have it, luckily for them. There's no follow-through, or so I thought! Virus calls the bluff and gets the 100-0. Yeah, you said it. Not much of a challenge there from Comp. Just kind of drove at the ball. 97 seconds left. And it, it was 3 nothing when we jumped in on that call. And there was, uh, what, 235, 220 to go or something like that? So the rapid comeback from Waterloo, you do not want to give them confidence this late in the game. Now you're looking at a situation where probably the next goal win. Booth, backboard, misread by Virus, but that means he's there for the block. 
Vanilla Rain. Tornado spinning down into the offensive zone, cleared away. Ball will come to Jay, who pop it over. Foods couldn't get over it to make the shot. Tom gets a reset, free flips towards it. Couldn't find it. Now Jay wants a double virus, needs to get up there for it. Jay read it, got out of there quickly. A lot of space given. Comp's gonna try and fake, but only gonna bounce out. Who else? Jay, it's on target. It is saved by Gorox, but the play is not over. Vanilla Rain needs to clear this out. Comp, half rotation, straight pop up. Spoods, they're lurking in the middle, but Jay is back just in case. That clear did go through. 30 seconds, all Waterloo needs to survive. Bring this to OTE, bring them that much closer to taking yet another game. But even still, despite these goals, it still feels like St. Clair is fully in control. That shot under the crossbar, but saved by Go Rocks. Another ball centered. It's going to be Comp. He's got plenty of boost to follow. Comp inches it. It goes center. Jay is there off the ceiling. Saved with zero seconds. He'll pop it. Spoods back bar to himself. Oh, Vanilla Rain had to make a save. What a shot by Spoods and a better save by Rain. Jay to Comp. Spoods is there. Spoods can Roll it, Foods the flick on zero. He's won it. A zero second goal ends the tournament. It's 4-3. This one's over. St. Clair wins again. <laughs> the ball is not down until it hits the ground. What a play by St. Clair. I was going to say it's cocky, but I mean, when is it cocky for this good? The setup from player to player into Spoods and ice in the veins. Barry in that home. Congrats to this Lads on St. Clair getting it done, and they are your champions, despite taking a slightly more curvy and less direct path to that goal. A great final series for Spoods, as you said, bordering on cocky on that catch, but just like there's a fine line between brave and foolish, there is a fine line between cocky and confident. I would call that confidence. You could tell from the car language, Taco. I have this catch. I'm going to flick it. I'm going to score. He knew. It just, I love to see that. And honestly, it says something about just the confidence I have in their ability that the moment that that landed on Spoon's hood and I saw him keep it up on, for the first second, I'm thinking, that has to be it. There's no one pressuring him. It's a one-on-one -on -one with an open flick. It's, it's not good, but I gotta say, credit to UW. That is a fantastic effort you put in. And to be able to bring this many games into nearly overtime or into overtime or within one goal is, is a very impressive feat. Granted, you're going to get another shot of him in a future tournament, but for now, Kings of the North will remain St. Clair. You said it. That is that St. Clair, the Kings in the North, the Kings of the North, the Prime Ministers of Canada, the Premiers of Ontario, all the titles. Give them all their flowers. That'll do it here at the 7-Eleven Canadian Collegiate Rocket League Champions. Thank you so much to our friends at 7-Eleven Canada. Don't forget to download the 7Now app. I think that code 7 off 11 is still active. I think it's tied to the broadcast. We, I, what's, what's the what's the, what's the hurt? Can't hurt. Use it as long as it'll let you use it. And of course, thanks to the gaming stadium. Thanks to Jordan, our lead producer on the day as well. Taco, it's been a pleasure. Yep, it's been wonderful. And uh, luckily, uh, actually, Rocket League and 7 Eleven are actually returning in a nice way because April 30th through May 1st, actually, there's going to be the 7 Eleven Rocket League Open. It's an eight thousand dollar prize pool so of course if you want to sign up before it is too late there is the signups at tgs.gg slash 7-11 rl open which you can follow through to be able to join in but until then it has been an absolute pleasure to be in the booth with you max and this has been uh quite the story despite st Clair kind of not following a script to make it dramatic they're still able to come out on top it was still an interesting ro roller coaster from start to finish but they dropped a game in fact they dropped two games but no series as St. Clair Saints remains clean in Canadian Collegiate Rocket League play. Thanks to everybody in chat for watching. Thanks for participating on the stream. Until next time, love you guys. Bye-bye.
Just when you thought our crispy classic chicken couldn't get any better. We created the new barbecue bacon chicken sandwich. A crave-worthy sandwich made fresh in select stores daily. Chicken worth crossing the road for. Visit 7-Eleven.ca to find a crispy classic chicken store near you.